Hey guys, welcome to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto has wood and lava release. Part 2. Thanks for great response on part 1. If you guys enjoy this, what if? Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. So let's start the video. Chapter 12. Of Respect and Explosions. Well that went better than expected. Naruto chuckled, the black eye where Sakura had brained him throbbing mercilessly. Your own damn fault Sasu grunted having witnessed the ass kicking firsthand, he hadn't laughed that hard in years, hell Sakura had actually stopped punching Naruto to stare at the laughing Ichiha. Pushing those thoughts away the two genin made their way to the bridge to guard Tazuna, sure Zabuza wasn't much of a threat anymore, but you could never count out the random thugs that Gatan could send. The old man. Naruto hailed him. Tazuna turned to face the two. Ah oh, Naruto perfect timing, could you give me a hand here? He pointed to a girder laying next to a pile of the things that had been singled out. A couple of my workers chickened out and I'm a bit undermanned. Sure. He walked over and was about to help him pick up the piece of metal, but then the thought hit him when he noticed only a few people around. Hey old man, how many of your workers quit? The Zuna sighed. Is it that noticeable? Naruto nodded over half my team quit, ten of them in all. Tazuna ran a hand through his hair. I don't know what I'm gonna do, sure I'm not being hunted by an A-class ninja anymore, but what good is that gonna be if I can't finish this bridge? Hey hey hey, no old man I got this shit. Naruto brought his hands up in a familiar hand seal, and where once was one now stood 50 Naruto clones. So what do you need to move? The clones all asked in unison. Now Tazuna was expecting the blonde to help him since from the very moment he met the kid he always felt that helpful energy that he exuded in buckets, it was one of the reasons he wasn't scared of the kid, despite the fear he had felt when Naruto had blown up in Inari's face. But this. This was just ridiculous, he had seen the technique before during the fight with Zabuza, but using them to do manual labor. It was a ridiculous plan, but despite hearing the boys talk in stereo, I just couldn't stop a smile forming on the man's face. I have several things you kids can do. Sakura followed along behind Tsunami as they made their way to the market to buy groceries for dinner tonight, preparing themselves for the meeting with Zabuza tomorrow. But so sat around here. Sakura sighed, looking around at all of the people around her, most were sleeping in wooden lean twos or in broken down shacks. Tsunami, who had been quiet for most of the walk, looked over her shoulder at the young Kinoichi. It's why my father is so driven to finish the bridge, it's the only thing that will break Gatan's grasp on our country. Sakura and Tsunami walked in silence for a little bit longer, as the streets started to come closer together, it was slightly intimidating how the buildings funneled like that, the number of homeless people dropped off, and several unsavory looking thugs took their place. This is the way to the market. Seems a bit dangerous don't you think Sakura hissed at Tsunami. It's not usually this bad. She admitted. Normally it's just one or two of them and there's more people walking around, I wonder why it's changed. Concern laced her voice as the thugs around them eyed the two women with various looks of lust or greed. Just keep going, we'll reach the market road in just a second. She whispered. Sakura nodded and the two sped up slightly, making their way to the end of the street, several of the thugs fell into place behind them, prompting the two speed up a bit, they were only a dozen yards from the end of the road, when a big burly man stepped out from one of the alleyways along the road. Well what do we have here? The thugs slurred, he was clearly intoxicated if the smell of alcohol on his breath was anything to go by. The man grinned showing off many missing teeth as he stalked a bit closer, causing both women to look up at the man. He literally towered over the two ladies at about a head or two taller than Tsunami, with the muscles to back up his mass, he formed an imposing wall between the thugs behind them and the safety of the main road. Now what are two ladies doing out here? You get hurt. The man flashed a lecherous grin at the two girls who narrowed their eyes at the man, if it was one thing they despised equally, it was a lecherous pervert who wouldn't think twice about raping someone. Sakura's mind was racing as she tried to figure a way out of this mess, she glanced past the main thug and noticed that they weren't, but maybe a 10 second run from the main road, a plan formed quickly in the Kinoichi's mind. Tsunami-san, when I tell you to, run for the main road and escape into the crowd, alright. Tsunami nodded fearfully. The two women inched closer to the main road, eyeing the thugs warily. Apparently the big thug didn't like that and scowled at them, where the hell do you think you're going? He growled and approached the women. Now Sakura yelled using chakra in her legs to propel herself forward to land a chakra enhanced punch to the tough stomach, it wasn't anything close to what Tsune could pull off, but it got the job done as the man bent over and the waist in pain. A blur to Sakura's right told her that Tsunami had made a run for it. Don't. Just stand there. After the big man yelled at his cronies, gasping for air a bit. The thugs rushed off after the Tsunami, but Sakura was having none of that. She grabbed five shuriken from her pouch and launched them at the retreating men. 
with a cry of pain both men hit the ground as the razor-sharp metal bit into tender flesh, two in one banded and three in the other, all of them biting into the back of their legs or ass. With a sigh Sakura turned back to the big man just in time to catch a meaty fist to the face. A gout of blood flew from her nose as she landed in a heap against a crate. You bitch, you'll pay for that the man straightened back up cracking his knuckles angrily. Sakura spat a glob of blood from her mouth. Her lip was busted and clearly her nose was broken as it bent to the side slightly. However, she fought through the tears to rise back to her feet, quickly rolling to the side to dodge the punch that broke the crate she landed against. Grabbing a kunai during the roll, she flicked the weapon towards the thug, however unlike the other two, the big one seemed to know how to fight, albeit rather poorly as he knocked the weapon out of the air with his fist. Hehe <laughs> nanatha now you ear. He chuckled darkly, approaching the injured girl. Sakura was still reeling from the punch when the thug landed a punch to her stomach, she could feel her bones creak under the force of that blow, whoever the bastard was he clearly had a decent grasp on brawling, coupled with his massive size the blows he threw had some weight behind them. He struck her in the jaw next, loosening several teeth. Yeah, I feel girly now. He grinned evilly, picking her up by her throat. Sakura shocked as the meat hook of a hand cut off her air, one of her eyes was closed shut from a punch, and the other was black and blue, but she could see the man's face clearly, and what she saw scared her more than anything, the man had a hungry look in his eyes, and a wicked smile that could peel paint if he so much as glanced at it. She knew what the man planned and at that moment she felt more scared than she had ever felt in her life, desperately she struggled against his grip, but he held her hands away without much effort. Go ahead and squeal, ain't no one gonna save ya he breathed huskily in her ear, Sakura's one good eye widened in fear. Knowing something and hearing it firsthand sent a new shiver of horror through her body. The thug slammed her into the ground roughly, he let go of throat but kept her hands pinned to the side with one hand, he began fumbling with the button of his pants. Sakura let out a whimper as he grumbled shoo it, I'll get ya in a sec, he lowered his head to get a better look at why the button wasn't coming undone. That would be his undoing. Reacting on fear and instinct Sakura began gathering chakra to her throat, molding it into water element chakra. When the thug finally got the button undone, he looked back up all right time for some foo his sentence was cut off as a bullet of condensed water hit him right in the eye. With a shower of blood the man screamed out, letting go of Sakura and rearing back on his haunches. Sakura reacted quickly, adrenaline pumping wildly through her fear-filled mind as she quickly got to her feet. With a roar of anger, she launched out the most powerful kick she could in her condition right to the man's jewels. Despite the loss of his eye, the man could only double over in agony as he felt his nuts crush under the vicious assault, as he bent forward to grab himself, he caught Sakura's chakra-enhanced knee right to the nose. A sharp crack filled the air as the man hit the ground, Sakura panting and shivering over him as the adrenaline slowly left her. She looked at her hands quietly, wondering if she had just killed the man. That thought made her hands shake slightly, almost imperceptibly. The man twitched suddenly and groaned in pain bringing Sakura back to the present as she flinched at the noise and looked around desperately for something to defend herself, there only a few feet away was the kunai the man had swatted away. Shaking fingers closed around cold metal as she approached her assaulter staring down with a look of indifference at the helpless man. No, not helpless. He was still a threat, both physically and mentally. She looked from the blade to the man several times, her breath coming in short gasps. She closed her eyes. Sakura stumbled out onto the main road, walking as quickly as she could back to Tazuna's house, a bloody kunai in her hand. Bakashi sat quietly reading his book with that same look of boredom he wore for everything short of a fight. It wasn't that he was actually bored, no. That was simply a way to throw people off, make people relax or not take him seriously, the itcha itcha just made that task easier. Most people would look at him funny, in a how dare you kind of way, but again, it was unexpected for someone like that to be a trained assassin. And that was exactly how Kakashi preferred it, unexpected. But that's not important, what was important, at least to the cycloptic jonin was the shrimp on the roof, who was doing his best to imitate Sasuke when he was in one of his moods. Naruto's mental ass beating of Inari's views on life weren't taken too well by the boy. He had spent most of the past few days just staring out at the sea, in fact it was beginning to creep the masked man out a bit, and that's saying something. Kakashi snapped his book closed and sighed, it wouldn't do to let the boy stew over things for too much longer. So, with a determined sigh the man made his way to the roof of the house where the boy sat alone. You know. In my personal experience, it's not good to dwell on things like this. Inari ignored the greeting and continued to stare off into space. Well aren't you a ray of sunshine the deadpan, taking a seat next to the boy. The two sat quietly just watching the sparkles out on the water, watching the seagulls fly lazily around and every so often dive bombing after a fish or some other marine animal. Does it ever get better? Kakashi raised an eyebrow glancing over at the boy, whose question was barely heard even by Kakashi's sensitive ears. After a moment to see if he would ask anything else, Kakashi sighed well. 
He began, looking up at the clouds above a calm expression on his face. Yes and no, I guess would be the correct answer to that. Inari tilted his head slightly in Jonin's direction, eyebrows furrowed questioningly. Yes, over time, the pain will subside. It doesn't matter how bad it hurts, the old proverb time heals all wounds is quite accurate. The Jonin sighed again and no, that despite being healed, there will always remain a scar. How deep that scar is depends on how bad the wound is, but know this Inari and take it from someone who has lost loved ones not just once, but multiple times. Scars, no matter how deep, are there to remind us about our mistakes, he lifted his headband up to show the young boy the scar over his left eye, then lowered it once the boy got a good look at it. I got that scar from an enemy ninja during the war, it was a foolish mistake on my part that ended up taking the life of one of my comrades. He was a dear friend to me, and even now I dwell on his death. Inari was about to ask something, but Kakashi cut him off dwelling on the death of someone and paying your respects to the person who saved your life at the cost of their own is not the same as dwelling on someone's death and letting that death rule you, letting it rule the way you think, act or treat others. Hell I'm guilty of all three at times, but I still try to get past it, I don't allow it to rule me. Inari lowered his head in thought. He however flinched slightly when Kakashi's hand landed on his head to ruffle his hair a bit. Facing your problems is a big part of growing up. Adults can be guilty of running away, but it's a mark of maturity when you man up and deal with things head on. Naruto is a good example, for most of his young life he cried. Inari looked up in shock, Kakashi nodded. Yes, for the first five years of his life he was quite the crybaby, it wasn't until Naruto found himself lost in the village festival celebrating one of our village's greatest heroes that he started to change. It wasn't a gradual change, I can tell you that much. W what happened? Inari asked. Kakashi looked at him for a moment. Well, he had hid himself in a building across the street from a reenactment of the many battles of our fourth Hokage, a man as much myth and legend as flesh and blood. Naruto watched for hours taking in everything that those performers said and did like it was scripture to him. It changed him, he decided then and there to live his life like the fourth Hokage, to live by the will of fire and his, his ninja way. You could see a small smirk under the man's mask. And as far as I know he's never cried after that, not one time. The two sat in a comfortable silence as they watched the ocean. A few minutes went by when Inari stood up, eyes filled with determination. Fine then. Inari growled, if that blonde idiot can do it, so can I. The Kashi beamed at the boy, he really was quite like Naruto in some ways, all he needed was a push in the right direction. Hey is that mom? Inari asked, suddenly turning to point towards the road that led to town. What's she doing at home so early? It's usually two hours before she gets back. The Kashi didn't answer, he leapt off the roof and landed in a crouch, concern on his face. Sakura wasn't with her and she was running back here. A dozen thoughts ran through his mind at that moment, none of them good. Help. Tsunami screamed when she was close enough to the jonin. Tsunami-san, what happened? He was dead serious as the woman came up to him, breathing heavily and trying to catch her breath. She quickly described what happened to the man whose one eye widened. Get inside and lock the doors. I'll be back as soon as I can. Before he took off to find his student, praying that she was alright. It was a few minutes later when he came across Sakura, limping her way down the road, using a stick she had found as a crutch. Sakura. Kakashi yelled, landing in front of the girl who upon seeing the jonin, collapsed in his arms. Kakashi used what little medical chakra he knew to run a scan over her body, two cracked ribs, a broken nose and several contusions on the chest and face. Whoever did this is going to die, painfully. The jonin was seething in anger, so much so he almost missed the slight whimper, looking down at Sakura he saw that she was crying. He sat there soothing the girl by stroking her hair gently, waiting for her to calm down. When she had stopped shaking he asked gently. What happened? They sat like that for several minutes as Sakura cried, trying her best to tell him what happened. Akashi's blood boiled when she said the thug had tried to rape her, but that quickly turned cold when he noticed the bloody kunai grip tightly in her fist, the knuckles of her hand bone white, holding onto that weapon like a lifeline. Sakura, he asked quietly, did you kill him? The way the girl froze in his grasp spoke volumes, her spine was arrow straight under his hand. Don't worry he soothed. I'm here, just let it out. He ran his hand along her back as fresh tears sprang to the girl's eyes. She buried her face into his chest and soaked the thin material there in seconds. It was almost ten minutes later when Kakashi realized that she had cried herself to sleep, the injuries she had sustained and exhaustion taking its toll. Slowly so as not to aggravate her wounds, he picked the girl up and brought her back to the house, where he could patch her up with what little medical knowledge he had. Bakashi sensei we're back. Naruto yelled loudly as the two Genin and Tazuna walked in the door. Let the whole country know we're here next time, idiot. Sasuke scoffed. Shut up duckhead. HN. Nice comeback, real original. Sasuke rolled his eyes as they sat down at the living room table. Why is it so quiet? And where is everyone? 
Naruto looked around, seeing that no one was around, and the house was surprisingly quiet. Hey, they're probably just out shopping or something. Tazuna grumbled, taking a sip from his sake bottle. That's hardly the case I'm afraid a voice said from the stairs. The three turned to see Kakashi coming down the stairs. What do you mean by that Kakashi? Naruto asked, raising an eyebrow at how tense the man seemed. The eerie feeling that filled the room set them on edge. What happened? He asked quietly. Kakashi sighed, this wasn't going to go over very well with the blonde. Sakura. Naruto tensed at his teammate's name being spoken in such a broken way, like something awful had befallen her, and truth be told it did. She was attacked earlier and was nearly raped and killed. Kakashi knew that was a bad thing to say, but saying it any other way would have just pissed the blonde off more. He suddenly felt the temperature of the room plummet and watched in slight fear as the genin's eyes turned icy. Naruto's voice at that moment seemed to match his eyes in their coldness. Who was it? It wasn't a question from a student to a teacher. It was a demand and the way the blonde said it sent an unconscious shiver up the jonin's spine. I don't know, he said honestly. Some random thug off the streets is what she told me. Naruto just nodded once before he stood up and walked to the door. Naruto, where are you going? He voiced quickly, turning the blonde from his warpath of destruction. What's it look like I'm doing? I have scum to find and deal with. He growled in barely controlled rage as a slight bit of Kyubi's chakra leaked into his voice, he turned once again to walk away. Wait Naruto. Kakashi yelled after him, Naruto stopped but didn't turn around this time. What is Kakashi? Naruto's voice was calm and even, but the air around him was charged with negative emotions, as several cracks of chakra discharged in the air. You can't kill the man that attacked Sakura. Naruto spun on his heels to give Kakashi a glare that could melt steel. Why? He demanded. Because. He's. Already dead. Naruto's eyes widened, the slight red tinge to his eyes disappearing instantly, and the air began to warm. Did you? He asked. No. Kakashi sighed. A look of understanding crossed the boy's face. Where is she? Upstairs in her room he replied quickly, she hasn't moved since I put her there. She was a bit beat up, but I dealt with most of it with the meager medical knowledge I have. A slight nod was the only confirmation the jonin received. Hum on Sasuke. The blonde growled. Why? Sasuke looked at Naruto curiously. Because, Sakura just made her first kill. It seemed like the most obvious thing in the world. Atsuo? Was the only response. Suo, what do you think she's feeling right now, huh? I felt like scum after I killed someone, and I know for a fact you haven't killed anyone yet, but you have experienced something as traumatic, or don't you remember? Naruto looked back at him with the same expression. Sasuke paled slightly as suppressed memories of the massacre started creeping their way to the front of his mind. Eh fine, let's go. He grumbled, pushing past the other genin roughly, muttering to himself. Naruto glanced over his shoulder at Kakashi who nodded slightly to him, taking that as approval he walked upstairs to join his two teammates. The two boys stood in front of Sakura's door warily. They couldn't hear anything at all which is what was putting them on edge. Naruto was the first one to the door handle, with a twist and a push they were in the room, which they almost immediately regretted. Even to Sasuke's senses you could tell something was wrong. To Naruto's senses it was much, much worse. Sadness, regret, anger, helplessness were just some of the few emotions he could pick up. But that wasn't all. On top of all that were tears, a small bit of vomit and sweat which assaulted his nose. All in all it looked, felt and smelled like someone had just gone through a shocking and damaging experience, which to be perfectly honest was exactly what happened. Sakura was curled up in the corner of the room, a trash can next to her as she stared blankly at the wall beside her, she was so out of it she didn't even realize someone had entered the room. Naruto and Sasuke shared a glance, Naruto's was an I told you look, while Sasuke's was more along the lines of shut up, I get it already. The two crept up on the girl making a bit of noise so as not to startle her too much. Sakura tensed when she felt a hand on her shoulder, she turned slightly to stare right into Naruto's deep cerulean eyes. Without a word Sakura launched herself into Naruto, knocking the air out of him as she sobbed into his shirt. Naruto rubbed the girl's back gently, letting her cry, letting her vent all her frustrations and fears. Naruto looked over Sakura's shoulders at Sasuke who was standing there impassively, not quite sure what to do at that moment. Naruto solved that problem however, with a slight glare and nod toward Sakura. But the sigh the last Ichi had joined in the hug and tried with his limited empathy to impart some positivity to the girl. They sat like that for the entire evening and long into the night, Kakashi had brought the three of them food, and with a warm meal in their stomach, the three turned in for the night. Normally he would have separated them. Boys and girls separate simply for propriety's sake, but seeing the three huddled together like that. Naruto with an intense expression on his face even in sleep, Sasuke with a peaceful for once expression instead of his broody scowl and Sakura's small smile, which filled the jonin with hope.
Normally a first kill like what happened to Sakura was an immensely traumatic experience, but seeing those expressions on each of their faces left little doubt in his mind that his team had just taken a huge step forward in their bond. It wasn't just camaraderie or a friendship of convenience, this was a bond that would prove to be much deeper than that. God at least he hoped so. Naruto, Sasuke and Kakashi walked towards the bridge, bodies slightly tense due to the situation. After all, today was the planned meeting and they'd be lying if they said they weren't at least a little bit on edge. Sakura had stayed back at the house with Tsunami and Inari, Naruto in a stroke of brilliance, at least by his canon self-standards, left a small army of clones to guard the house and keep Sakura company, she was still a little shaken up by the attempted rape and her first kill, but after sleeping with the comfort of both her teammates next to her, she was at least able to have small conversations with people. The two genin and one jonin arrived at the bridge to find it covered in mist. Glad to see you finally showed up, we've been waiting an hour. Zabuza growled as he walked from the mist, arms crossed with a small twitch to his eyebrows, Haku following just slightly behind him. Naruto-kun. Haku nodded to the blonde. Haku-chan, he nodded back. Zabuza looked between the two of them. Well aren't you two a pair? Akashi held up his hand to get the other women's attention. Let's cut to the chase Zabuza, what is your decision? Are you joining Kanoha or not? Zabuza turned to the man and flashed an irritated glare, before that softened into a sigh. Before I answer that I need to talk with the brat over there. He nudged his head towards the blonde in question. Bakashi eyed the man warily a little tense at the whole situation, but agreed to the man's wishes. Go ahead Naruto. What is it? He asked the taller man, which was an understatement to be honest, even with Naruto's height upgrade, he still stood several heads shorter than the giant of a man. I'll just put this bluntly. I don't trust you kid, not you or your team. He raised a hand to calm Naruto's teammates. Haku however trusts you more than I find healthy in my line of work, therefore I'm willing to give you the benefit of a doubt, but the Miss Jonin trailed off almost like he didn't want to be here. And in some ways he didn't. Mingling with people was never really his style, he was more the stabby cutty dead kind of person, and that kind of behavior usually didn't make for good conversation. Naruto stared at the hesitation curiously. But. He drawled. But, I have one solution, Haku trusts you, I don't. The reason I don't is because I'm basically putting my life in your hands Zabuza eyed him dangerously. Not your team's hands either. Hack no. You extended the invitation, you're the one responsible for us. So what is the solution then? Naruto asked. Simple. You validate Haku's trust in your capable care. Zabuza pointed to Haku who nodded as well, both understanding the meaning, since they had discussed the idea between them for the last two days. Meaning. Naruto pressed, clearly in the dark about the whole situation. Zabuza snorted. You fight, what else? Naruto's sweat dropped slightly at the sarcastic response. Oh. Okay. And how does that make you trust me? Simple, that mask she wears isn't just for show, she took it off a Kiri hunter that she defeated in one of her first tastes of combat. You beat her and you can beat anything from Anbu down. That's enough power in my book to keep just about any asshole off your back, and it's one of the things I can truly respect and trust, power. How? Shallow of you. Naruto chuckled nervously as the man gave him a death glare. I said one of the things I respect and trust and doubting my sincerity is one of the things I hate. He gave the boy a look that said don't piss me off anymore or I'll stab you. Naruto gulped slightly and nodded as so, how are we doing this? The duel nothing more, nothing less. Almost as an afterthought she spoke airily though this will be full contact. At Naruto's questioning look he explained, she may trust you, but she trusts me more, she won't be pulling any punches, so try and take this seriously. Or you'll die. Naruto nodded slightly, still not too happy about how things were going. He was doing all of this so he didn't have to fight his cousin, but a, such was life. He sighed once more, but suddenly Naruto grabbed his head for a moment. What is it done? Sasuke asked, noticing his teammate's strained faces. Oh nothing he replied, releasing his head just a couple of Gato's thugs at Izuna's house, don't worry my clones took care of them. Sasuke nodded as Naruto walked toward Haku. Naruto, you don't have to do this. Kakashi tried to say, but Naruto brushed him off. Yeah I do. He sighed, taking his place across from Haku near the center of the uncompleted bridge. The two teams stared each other down, one calmly accepting of the situation the other slightly annoyed. Naruto-kun, I'm sorry about all this. The young ice mistress began, her tone calm and even despite her apology. Don't worry about it he waved it off. Let's just do this thing. He turned back to Zabuza for a second. No kid gloves right. We use everything we got. At the nod he reached into his pocket and retrieved a single coin. Well then, let's dance. He flicked the coin into the air and stared directly into Haku's eyes. The staring contest continued as the shiny piece of metal spun in the air. Spinning. Not once did they blink. Spinning. Hands inching towards their respective weapons. Spinning. The two smiled. 
Jink. Naruto rushed forward drawing a kunai and throwing it in one fluid motion, in response Haku threw several, knocking the kunai off target. One of them flew past the metallic exchange and nearly skewered Naruto in the forehead, but a slight tilt of the head let the fly white, only slightly nicking him on the cheek, which healed almost immediately due to his tenant's meddling. Aku ducked the first punch Naruto launched as he reached her, going into a sweep kick to try and knock the blonde off his feet. Naruto jumped to avoid the attack and launched a foot forward which was blocked by crossed arms, sending the ice mistress flying back a few feet to land in a crouch, one hand in front of her acting as a balance as she threw more his way. Naruto hopped back from the barrage as the thin slivers of metal stuck into the concrete where he last had been, demonstrating their sharpness and the reason it was a bad idea to get hit with one. How the hell it stuck into solid concrete was beyond him, but he clearly didn't want to find out, glancing up Naruto's eyes widened as he bent backward, ducking the kick aimed for his throat, flipping backwards, he put some distance between the two of them. The two were slightly out of breath from the exchange, but the grin on Naruto's face and a small smile on Haku's betrayed the fact at just how much the both of them were actually enjoying the duel. You got some nice moves Haku-chan. He chuckled, as do you Naruto-kun she giggled into the hem of her robe, the sensual laugh sending a shiver through the blonde's body. Where the hell did that come from? The genin wondered. Dodging another brought him back to his senses, fight now, laxy later. He pulled another kunai, and the two met in a clash of metal, one holding said kunai the other blocking with a single, how it was doing that without bending he didn't know, but chakra had to be involved. Well now this is an interesting place to be in Naruto-kun. Naruto raised an eyebrow. And just what do you mean by that, we're both evenly matched. Ah, but you only have the use of one hand she raised her hand in a single hand sign. Well I only need one hand. She started flipping through one-handed seals. Shit Naruto mentally moaned, I hate one-handed seals. Oh, well. He threw a little grin at his opponent before going into one-handed seals as well, which made Haku's eyes widen. Now it was simply a race to see who finished their seals first. Haku finished slightly ahead of Naruto as she slammed a foot into a puddle of water that had formed from all the mist around them, the droplets flying through the air formed into deadly-looking needles. Hidden, 1,000 needles of death. The ice user leapt back as the slivers of water descended towards their target. Naruto finished his last seal a moment after Haku. What a release. Water encampment wall as he breathed out a torrent of water that surrounded him in a thick shell of liquid. Needles met walls in a clash of water, the two of equal power fraught for dominance, before they simply cancelled each other out, the needles dispersing into mist as the wall collapsed into a puddle at the genin's feet. Impressive. Haku observed as the water from the two spread out along the ground. Heh, one of the few beer rank I know of right now, so it better damn well be. Naruto chuckled at that before he went back into his tojutsu stance, Haku did the same. The two clashed again, this time Naruto drew his ninja too to try and get some reach on the woman who seemed to love to an insane degree. Something tells me Haku and Tenten are going to get along great together. Naruto chuckled to himself, Haku saw how the added foot and a half of blade was affecting her, as the blonde blade nicked her arm several times during the exchange. I guess I have to use that after all. I just hope I don't hurt him too much flying through several hand signs again, she slammed her hands down into a puddle of water and shouted. Ice release. Shattering ice spear. Naruto's eyes widened as the water around him shot up, almost instantly freezing into jagged spears, and were it not for his training with Anko, particularly the exploding kunai dodging practice, he most likely would have been skewered right then and there. Thankfully he was able to dodge most of them, however one of them ripped a tear in the back of his pants, revealing the bushy tail he had stuffed inside. Watching from the sidelines, Zabuza choked out incredulously, he has a tail. Yes Zabuza, he dozes Kakashi replied, though he is a bit sensitive about it, so I wouldn't bring it up unless it's something positive, because sometimes he even scares me with some of the crap he does. Zabuza gave his fellow Jonin a funny look. I'm not joking. During the Genin test he and his teammates captured and knocked me unconscious, it may have just been a test, but most of the initial planning and trap work was all Naruto, he may be a Genin, but he's got the balls of I can tell you that much. Zabuza snorted in amusement I knew I like that kid for a reason, he's making it awfully tempting to just join you guys, but I don't go back on things like this, it just isn't my style, plus these two are really enjoying themselves, wouldn't you say? Bakashi nodded a little smile on his lips yeah, I've never seen Naruto go all out on someone, and while this isn't nearly his limit, Haku-sen is definitely pushing him. Haku meanwhile was unceremoniously fangirling up a storm he has a tail. So cute. She couldn't keep the blush off her face as she noticed the furry appendage twitch slightly as the two cousins stared each other down. Naruto on the other hand was a bit pissed off. Those were my good shorts, damn it. Oh well cat's out of the bag I guess. He noticed the reddened cheeks of his opponent and couldn't help the grin that graced his lips. Apparently she has the same thing for my tail as Hinata does. She has good taste then Kaiubi nodded sagely. 
You humans always forget how wonderful a tail can be, so soft and fuzzy. A little perverse giggle echoed in his mind, why do I get the feeling that you have the same thing for tails as? You know what, never mind. Don't ask, don't tell. There, you know you want some of the sweet. Don't ask, don't tell he cut the connection just to make sure he wasn't distracted any more than he already was, he really didn't want to catch one of those eye spear things in the jewels, that would be unpleasant. Despite what she was feeling, Haku knew she had to bring out the big guns if she was to get Zabuza to acknowledge her cousin as a competent caretaker. I'm sorry Naruto-kun, but this is probably going to hurt. A lot. Flashing through several hand signs she brought her hands together in a strange seal that Naruto had never seen before, almost immediately the air around him began to cool ice release. Demonic ice mirrors, a chill went up Naruto's spine as his vision became distorted. He quickly looked around and noticed the same thing all around him, it didn't cover completely, but the dome of rectangle-like objects had effectively sealed him inside. Looking back to Haku he could see the woman on the other side of the ice. He could only guess. Haku walked forward and stepped inside the ice mirror, seemingly becoming part of it, the clearness of the walls around him turned opaque, allowing him to see the extent of what surrounded him. It wasn't good. Haku's image flickered into being around him, reflected between the mirrors. I hope you are ready for this Naruto-kun, this is my ultimate technique. A single twitch was the only warning Naruto had, with a blinding speed a dozen lodged their way into the cement mirror centimeters from his foot. He raised his eyebrows, damn that was fast, I couldn't even keep track of it. Let's try this then. A quick flurry of hand signs and a sharp inhale and exhale later. Fire release. Great fireball technique. The abnormally large ball of flames ate at the mirrors in front of him, their wickedly hot tendrils powered by Naruto's massive chakra reserves. When the flames cleared the ice had melted somewhat, but Naruto's eyes widened when the ice started reforming, it wasn't supposed to do that. He had never gotten his ice to do that before. Fire doesn't work on my ice no matter how hot it gets Naruto-kun. She giggled slightly at the blank look on Naruto's face. Does my technique impress you that much Naruto-kun? The hell it does, I've never been able to repair my ice abilities once they were set in motion like this, truly you are a master of your element Haku-chan. He threw her a little salute which gave the blonde-haired Jen in the satisfaction of seeing her cheeks turn a wonderful shade of rosy red. Flattery won't help you Naruto-kun. Perhaps not, but this might. Taking in a quick breath he flew through several seals again and exhaled, this time the flames were much hotter. Lava release. Molten spray. And unlike last time the molten chunks of lava stuck to the ice, which hissed in protest, melting much quicker. Haku's eyes widened another bloodline, just how many can he use. She adjusted the chakra flow to her mirrors to boost the strength and regeneration of them, but it wasn't without effort, she had to finish this soon, or else she'd run out of chakra. Sorry Naruto-kun, but this is going to hurt you. A small glint of steel reflected in the mirrors as Haku let loose a barrage of pointy doom at Naruto, he cut the chakra to his technique and leapt back. Ah he cried out as several still managed to strike him in his left leg. He stared down at the metal spikes lodged in the limb. They weren't hitting anywhere important, but the slightly numb feeling he had told a different story. Damn it she nicked one of my pressure points. This isn't good, I can barely move my leg alarms of warning blared in his head as he leapt back, a half dozen stabbing into the ground where he had been. Not slowing down, are we Naruto-kun? You could hear the gentle goading in her voice. The tick mark appeared on Naruto's head, the hell is she getting cocky for? That does it, I need an out. He flew through several hand seals and slapped the ground quickly earth release. Earth dome twin half circles of concrete rose up from the bridge, slamming closed over Naruto's body, stopping the barrage that he could hear slamming into the dome's side. That won't stop me Naruto-kun. And true to her words, several senbin broke through the dome to strike the ground next to him, the points of the needles glowing a bright green color. Hack, wind chakra. Naruto slammed his hands to the rock and pushed as much fire chakra as was acceptable into the dome, superheating it, but keeping the rock solid. The next volley bounced off the sides of the dome, to the chagrin of the thrower. He breathed a sigh of relief, he could hear Haku let out a huff of annoyance, as she saw her weapons fail to penetrate. That still doesn't fix my problem of being stuck in here, and just waiting her chakra out is such a bitch way out of the fight, outlasting an opponent is not the ninja way. Got a strike with deception and. Oh, hack. He yanked his hand back as he had been unconsciously channeling more fire chakra through his hands into the stone, the rock beginning to get hot, even for him. I'm lucky this shit doesn't melt or shatter on me, it would suck if Haku used some ice on this thing just to blow it up. Wait. Now there's an idea. Naruto held out one of his hands and channeled a minuscule amount of chakra into a small point in the ground below him. Using a half-tiger sign he activated the chakra in the cement floor, and a small pop answered, looking down, he noticed the pock mark in the cement, where his chakra had blown a hole in the ground. Haha, <laughs> success. Wait. What? What the hell did you do? Kaiubi poked in, noticing the strange flux of power from her container. 
Oh not much, just coming up with a bitchin' plan to defeat Haku. How so? She questioned, a genuine interest tinting her voice. Well he started dot I noticed back when the old man let me look at the Ichiha library that there was this special Keke Genkai nature unique to Iwa, called Explosion Release. This Keke Genkai allows the user to channel their chakra into an object and or send their chakra out in an explosive release dot. So what? That still doesn't mean anything as long as you're stuck inside this. Oh. You devious little bastard, how the hell did you ever figure that out? You never learned explosion release. Yep that's the plan, and honestly. I just went through several combinations of nature chakra until it felt right, mixing it just so, then infusing it into the stone. It's not an explosion release per se, more like a bastardized version until I can get the mixture of natures right, now watch and learn Kai. Watch. And. Learn, you ha ha ha. Placing a hand on the dome for a moment he cut all elemental chakra flow from it, cancelling the fire chakra that was keeping the wind from coming through, and in its place, he poured in an obscene amount of explosion release chakra here's hoping I don't blow us all to hell, he took his palms off the stone, the very matter humming with power as he slapped the ground, once more raising a dome within the first, however this one was far, far thicker and nearly three times as dense as the first. It took a lot out of him, but he'd never admit to it, giving one last prayer to Kami and sending Chakra to all of his senses to dampen them, a little trick he'd picked up from Anko, before lowering his head between his knees and kissing his ass goodbye, using a single hand seal to activate the explosion before the world turned white. Outside the domes and oblivious to everything was Haku, who stared intently at the rocky formation with interest. That is until the stone began to hum with barely controlled power, which then turned to outright fear, before that fear was replaced by pain, as the world turned white. Oom, said the giant ass explosion that probably would even impress Dadara. Speaking of which, somewhere in the land of Earth, Achu Dadara wiped his nose with his Akatsuki robes. Someone must have made a great work of art, and I missed it damn it. He held a single finger to his chin and thought. I wonder if we can share ideas, yeah. We don't have time for this, whoever this person is we can find them later. The low, smooth voice of Sasori called from the shadows. Let's go, we need to find our contact. Alright. Dadara nodded following behind the hunched Sasori. But whoever it is just blasted someone straight to hell I can guarantee that, yeah. Back with Naruto. Ground zero. Smoke, that was all anyone could see after the brilliant flash of light and sound, then when the smoke cleared only a crater was visible, with a smoking and still sizzling Naruto sprawled out with little Shirley's in his eyes. He coughed once and a ring of smoke floated lazily from his mouth. Remind me not to do that again, ever. He groaned. Thought for once the fox was speechless, she looked over the damages to the boy's body, and aside from the minor burns and a few minor busted blood vessels from the shockwave, he was in relatively good shape. You're so hacking lucky, I can't even begin to describe it. Tell me about it, I think I might have packed a bit too much juice into that he looked around, surveying the damage. It wasn't pretty, all around him and the circle was a crater and the bridge about twice as wide as the dome was, a few places the blast had blown through the concrete and left holes in the thing. Tazuna is going to kill me. He sighed. Dust use an earth or two on it, it'll be fine. From inside Naruto Kaiubi expanded her senses trying to find where Haku was, judging by the bits and pieces of broken ice mirror she was probably outside the blast radius, in various degrees of pain. Speaking of fine, your fine ass cousin is currently smoldering in a crater about 100 feet away next to that crane, you might want to help her. Naruto's eyes widened as he rushed over to the machine to find a clearly smoking, clearly naked Haku. But that wasn't what made Naruto and Kaiubi jaw drop. What did surprise them were the large, soft breasts that splayed out from Haku's chest. Haku's a D-cup Naruto gasped. Where the hell did she hide them? She must wrap her breasts or something, it's a common Kinoichi practice if I remember correctly. Your mom was a DD, and she wrapped her breasts to look more like a C cup. Do things. 1. Did not want to know that. 2. Actually hack 2, did not want to know that. You humans and your views on incest. Animals in the wild mate with their family all the time, why should this be any differ? He made a show of mentally plugging his ears despite the fact that her voice was in his head. You do realize that if Haku has the hots for you and if you two do get together that you'd be hacking your cousin, right? It's distant relation, sure, but the fact remains she's still your family. And that's why you don't argue with a several millennia old giant demon fox. Also your girlfriend is still baking there, you might as well not do something about that. Naruto blinked, then looked back down to Haku, sure she was naked, but he could definitely see the reddened skin along her body and the tiny flecks of rock that had lodged in her skin, with little trickles of blood flowing out of the wounds. Quickly thinking he condensed some water from the air and cooled the water down with his Heimton, then slowly rubbed the ice along the inflamed flesh, using what little medical knowledge he knew from teaching Sakura to heal the wounds. 
it wasn't much, but by the time he was through her breathing had returned to normal, and her skin was the pale milky color it was before, though there were still several blood spots where rock chips had gone too deeply to heal, so he had wrapped them in a piece of his torn shirt. After tending to her wounds he pulled out his storage scroll which luckily had survived, along with most of his wardrobe, intact. He pulled a blanket out and laid Haku on it before wrapping her in it, trying to make it as comfortable as possible. He straightened when he heard the sound of footsteps behind him. Well kids Abusa chuckled, a not so hidden smirk on his face, Kakashi and Sasuke not far behind him. Seems like you beat Haku in a fairly impressive fight, I do love it when they go out with a bang like that. He nodded once. I guess it's a deal. Me and Haku are in your care, but if you go back on this little bargain of yours his smirk changed to a scowl your head is mine. He would have said more, but a loud tapping was heard from the beginning of the bridge. Well well well, it seems I've been betrayed. And here I thought you ninja respected the honor of your clients, I guess I was wrong, A's Abusa Gato tapped his cane once more, as the ninja on the bridge turned to see the billionaire himself had graced them with his presence, along with a veritable army of goons standing behind him. Zabuza growled yeah right, you were planning to double cross me first you swine. That bastard squad of cheap liquor and bad steel behind you is proof enough of that. Let loose low, dark chuckle, maybe so, but I did put a lot of effort into guaranteeing your demise, I can see you're not as tired as I'd hoped you'd be, but I paid good money to hire the very best mercenaries, still not as much as I would have paid you. You missing nin are also very expensive to maintain after all. Bakashi scanned the crowd of mercenaries quickly guessing their numbers and skills. This isn't good Zabuza he whispered to him, Naruto catching most of what he said. He wasn't kidding, there's close to 250 of them, and at least 30 of them are samurai, from their weapons and armor, they look to be deserters from the land of iron, the military there is nothing but samurai, and those samurai are taught how to handle and manipulate chakra to power their blades. He glanced at the polished and well-kept blades the men carried. They are masters of and taught the tactics of and how to deal with shinobi, with that many of them on Gato's peril, even I would have trouble fighting them. Beto chuckled again. I can see you eyeing my little squad of samurai. Yes, these guys were a bit more expensive than your standard merc fare, but they make up for the lack of destructive quality from most ninjas with a nice destructive quantity. Gato stared at each ninja in turn before his gaze finally landed on Haku and let a creepy, disgusting grin cross his face. He turned his head to address a slightly more well-dressed mercenary among the group. Kill the men and bring me that girl. He said loudly, not really caring who heard him. After I have a little fun with that bitch, we go to kill Tazuna. His smirk turned predatory. Who knows, if you goons do a good enough job I may let you have some fun with the bastard's daughter and the little pink-haired ninja over there. Oh he did not just threaten to rape Haku, Tsunami, and your teammate, you're not gonna just let him say that shit, right Naruto? Naruto. After a second or two of no reply, Kaiubi looked back at the mental representation of her container's emotions and gasped. The small and normally pure white orb was glowing a deep crimson red with flames licking at the air above it. Oh shit. He's beyond pissed. Outside his mindscape Naruto's eyes were shadowed by his bangs, slowly a single thread of chakra rose around him, the deep crimson energy swirling around his body, picking up bits of dirt or rock and flicking them off to the side. The Kashi froze as a shiver of fear went up his spine. He knew that feeling and it could only mean one thing. Kayubi. Zabuza also felt the energy, it was oppressive, stifling even. In all his years of being a shinobi he had never felt a chakra like this, it was spreading a killing intent over the entire bridge like a mist, much like his own hidden mist, but far, far more malevolent. Sasuke stared at Naruto's back, his breath coming out in gasps. The last Ichiha fell to his knees and started sweating heavily. He couldn't breathe, it felt like sitting at the bottom of the ocean, the pressure forcing you down, suffocating you. Killing you. During all this he didn't even notice his eyes flicker for a moment from the deep black which was his normal color, to a rich crimson red, only interrupted by his pupil and a single tomo. His final thought before he passed out was is this Naruto. Before all went black. Bakashi heard Sasuke's gasp and turned back to see him just before he collapsed, catching a single glimpse of red in Sasuke's eyes. Well that was unexpected. Can't say I'm not happy for him, but this is serious, Naruto is using the Kyubi's chakra. Is the seal weakening? Is Kyubi breaking free? Beto and his thugs on the other hand were all damn near pissing themselves, in Gato's case. Well the wet stain running down his leg tipped off anyone who bothered to look. Hell even the stoic samurai had a grimace on their face, beads of sweat rolling down their forehead and their breath deepening, despite their training against such things, the killing intent focused on them was far beyond anything they had trained for. Naruto noticed none of this, his gaze was dead set on Gato, more specifically his eyes, not once did either of them blink. Scared, fear-filled eyes met red, slitted bestial eyes. Gato knew that it was dead set on his death, he could see it, feel it, damn near tasted. Naruto let out a throaty growl, a scowl clear on his face. 
I was going to be merciful and give you to the villagers to let them decide your fate, but no, not now. No one threatens the people I care about Gato, your ass is mine. Beto pointed one finger at the blonde and stuttered out wh what are you hackers w waiting for, it's just one boy. Kill him. The group of mercenaries let out a roar and charged the lone genin. They didn't make it halfway to him. Flying through dozens of hand seals at speeds even Kakashi was surprised by, the boy finished his chain of seals with hands clasped together. What a release. Raging torrent. Water from both sides of the bridge sloshed up from the ocean and swirled around Naruto for a moment before meeting the charging band of mercenaries head on, in moments they were up to the thighs in the rising brackish liquid. Naruto's scowl never left as he flashed through several more hand seals, slapping his hands onto the river of water that had formed on the bridge. Ice release. Frozen wave the water flash froze, the lucky ones were caught in the ice around their waist, the unlucky ones were those that hadn't been hit with the water yet, as they caught the rapidly freezing liquid coming towards them, the leading wave forming deadly spears. Several cries rang out, as blood stained the ice. Funnily enough Gato had survived the attack, both the initial wave and the freezing of said wave, and was backed up against a wall, staring at the bloodied corpses of the back line of his men, as the rest of the living ones struggled in waist-deep ice. Then as if to signify their last moments on this earth the sound of Naruto's ninja too sliding from its sheath was heard, Naruto held the blade in front of his face at the edge, glowing an eerie green, wind release. Wind cutter. He cried and with a single swipe of his sword Naruto released an immense blade of wind. The results were. Messy. Tabuza watched the attack tear into the helpless fools that dared to attack Naruto. Hey Kakashi. Yes Abusa. Did I ever mention that I like that kid? Yes Abusa, several times already. Good, because he's just been upgraded to don't hack with. Status. Akakashi stared blankly at the man who had this look of utter joy at the way the kid just destroyed his enemies and a decent amount of respect for him protecting the honor of his adopted daughter, though the hard-headed man would never admit it. Akashi just shook his head and looked back at the destruction, just in time to see Naruto picking up the little leech that had caused this country so much trouble. WW wait, please don't kill me Gato begged miserably, holding his hands up in front of him, trying to appease the demon of anger and vengeance that had manifested itself in the young blonde boy holding him several feet off the ground. If it's money you want I'll give you whatever you want. Land. Women. Power. I'll give you all of it, just please spare me. The perpetual scowl on Naruto's face deepened I don't want your dirty money Gato, or your crooked land holdings, or the whores you've broken to satisfy your own twisted needs, and as you can see I have all the power I need to kill you. Naruto raised a hand preparing to end the wretched man's life and free the people of Wave, but something stopped him, it was Abusa's hand. Remember I need the information this prick has if I'm going to be joining Konoha, that was the whole point of me following this asshole from the beginning. Naruto nodded and lowered the man. Beto let out a sigh of relief, glad that his feet were touching the ground, only for that sigh to turn into a gurgle as he quickly changed hands. From Naruto's grasp on the collar of his business suit to Zabuza's ironclad grip on his neck. Now about that information Gato. Zabuza prodded menacingly. I it's at my head headquarters and my office, tt top right drawer, far right aside. Zabuza dropped the short man and rushed off to grab the documents he wanted, not even bothering to look back. Beto sighed again, tensing just to get ready in case he became someone else's ragdoll for that evening. He looked up into the hate-filled eyes of Naruto, shivering slightly as they changed from blue to red and back again, from what? He could only guess. Naruto growled a deep throaty growl. Well Gato, what do we do with you now? Be please, I'll give all the money I've taken and more back to wave, J just, please don't hurt me. Actually got on his knees and bowed to the blonde who could only look on in disgust at the man, but in a show of restraint, he humored him. If and I do mean if you tell me where you keep your money, I will promise you that neither I nor my associates will harm you. It's in a safe at my headquarters here, it's right next to the filing cabinet that Zabuza is most likely looking through right now. Combination is 5871. Naruto nodded. Very well Gato, you kept your end of the bargain, I shall keep mine, neither I nor my associates will harm you in any way. Beto kept his head bowed, a dark evil grin spread across his face that's right, take my bribe you son of a bitch. I don't need the money from this hellhole, I built my company from nothing, this is only a minor setback. He was imagining all the things he'd do to the blonde when he finally got his resources back together from this hackup, when he felt his knees and hands leave the ground. Looking up he saw the most terrifying thing he'd ever seen in his life. The glowing red eyes of the boy who'd promised to spare his life and his grinning fanged mouth crooked in a wicked smirk. BB but, why why you said. He started, only to be turned around to face the large gathering of people behind him, the citizens of the wave it seemed had developed a backbone while his army was getting torn apart. Gato paled drastically. I said I and my associates, that means me, my team, Zabuza and Haku-chan, I didn't say anything about the people of wave. 
Ada let out a whimper, then a scream as he was tossed towards the angry citizens of Wave, he landed in a heap, leaving bits of skin on the concrete of the bridge. He's all yours. Naruto waved at the civilians and their shocked faces, at having their tyrant delivered to them in a nice bloody basket. Naruto turned away from them as Gato's screams grew, the people of Wave it seemed, neither forget nor forgive his treatment of them, and they would make sure he felt every agonizing second of it. Minus four days later, with the help of Naruto, Kakashi and Zabuza clones the bridge was built in record time, a few earth jutsus here, a fire there and many of the jobs requiring dozens of man-hours to minutes. Now the Kanoha team, Haku, Zabuza and the entire population of Wave, was standing on the bridge waiting for Tazuna to christen the new bridge in a ceremony due to their heroes, their saviors. We can't thank you enough. Tazuna smiled, dressed in a moderate business suit and tie, at least trying to be well dressed for the occasion. He reached out a hand to the young man in front of him, with his help, the country of Wave would prosper, and with it the lives of everyone whose hope had been restored by the young blonde. Naruto grinned and shook the offered hand. Don't you worry about it old man, just call any time you need me to bust some heads, I'll come. Uh huh, I don't think we'll need someone like that for quite some time, me boy. The blonde laughed. Well, whatever the future holds I guess. If you're ever in the neighborhood, stop by and pay me a visit, I'll do the same. The kid's grin was infectious as most of the people around him along with Tazuna, Tsunami and Inari, shared the simple smile. The people of Wave waved goodbye as the five ninja made their way across the bridge, back to the land of fire and Kanoha. Hey Gramps. Yeah Inari. Tazuna turned to the young boy who was staring after the ninja, still thinking on what Naruto, or at least his clone had told him, when he had tried to save his mother from Gato's goons. Have you got a name for the bridge yet? He turned his gaze to the older man questioningly. Can't say that I have, why? Do you have a name for it? Inari smiled. How about the hero's bridge? Azuna couldn't help but laugh. That's a wonderful name Inari he turned to watch the ninja, who were nothing but specks by now. A bridge on which a hero once stood. Yes, that is a great name for the place where Naruto Uzumaki became our hero. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Zabuza turned to Naruto behind him, hand twitching towards his Zambitu. Kid. Stop that now, before I hurt you. Naruto only chuckled in response. Too late before he fell flat on his face, a single sticking out of his ass. Zabuza turned to Haku, an eyebrow raised questioningly. Haku nodded. Pressure points, temporary, induce a mild dream state. Bacon Raymond Crystal Fireplace Poker Fetish. Make that hallucinogenic fever dream state. Bakashi just shrugged. Don't worry about him, he'll be fine here in a little while. Someone grabs him so he doesn't get left behind. And yes you can drag him if you want. Sasuke perked up at that. And no, not by his feet. His expressions fell. You can however grab him by the hair. You couldn't run fast enough to keep up with the black and blue blur, along with the black and yellow blur being dragged quickly behind it. Kanoha Gates, you guys are assholes. Naruto rubbed the top of his head gently, wincing a couple times as he felt the small patches of his hair that were torn out regenerate slowly. Next time learn to shut up. Sasuke smirked, getting in his own way, a measure of revenge on Naruto for putting him through that hell, he called chakra nature training. Naruto snorted I wouldn't laugh if I were you, there's still two more levels of chakra nature training, I've yet to teach you or Sakura. That shut him up, Sasuke paled slightly and turned away from him, walking slightly faster than the rest of them. Naruto could only grin at the payback he'd brought down on Ichiha's head. However that grin turned into a frown when he noticed Sakura was oblivious to the threat he'd not so subtly hinted at. It was going to be quite a while before the girl truly opened back up to anyone, it had taken him some time getting over killing those villagers when he had obtained his powers, he had mostly just drowned it all in training, but Sakura didn't have that luxury. He could tell by the far off look in her face that the life she took was still weighing heavy on her mind. A few minutes passed in silence as they signed in at the gate and walked into Kanoha, the two gate guards Katetsu and Izumo eyeing Zabuza warily. Don't worry guys Naruto waved to them, Zabuza here is going to be joining the village. Both sets of eyebrows rose at this. Just how the hell did you manage that? Izumo asked. Yeah doesn't seem right if you ask me. Katetsu nodded. The FFT well I kicked his apprentice's ass for one. He pointed over his shoulder at Haku. And I impressed him enough to convince him to join, that's about it honestly. Wait. That little shrimp is his Katetsu's words were cut off by striking the wooden beam of the check-in box next to his head. Iya don't do that, she's about as bad as Anko. The two paled and stared at the young girl who raised an eyebrow, daring them to say anything more. This was when Zabuza broke into the conversation. Wait. Anko. The Anko Midarashi. There was clear interest in his voice. Yeah. Naruto laughed. She was my sensei for a little over five years. Zabuza gawked, then let out a loud laugh. Ha ha ha, no hacking wonder I like you kid. And slammed a meat hook of a hand on the blonde's back, you think she'd go on a date with me? 
Naruto's face went blank for a moment before he turned a small glare on Zabuza, a bit of Kai filling the air. Zabuza looked down curiously. Naruto leaned in close so the others couldn't hear and whispered evenly, I like you Zabuza, I really do, but that's not something you say to the husband of the woman you just mentioned. Zabuza's eyes widened even wider than the last time. What? You heard me Naruto glared. Zabuza stood there for a moment just staring in awe at the young genin. A cough broke the staring contest as he looked over at Kakashi. Anything wrong? The silver-haired asked. Kakashi? Zabuza asked quietly. Kakashi nodded for him to continue. You remember when the kid reached don't hack with status? Kakashi nodded again, this time to agree with the mist nin. Well he's just gone up another level. Ah Kakashi looked from Zabuza to Naruto and back again. Do I want to know? Zabuza just shook his head and walked off, walking towards the Hokage building, Haku not far behind him. What did you tell him about Naruto? Kakashi sighed, a slight headache starting to build. Oh just that Anko's status as single has been changed for quite some time now. He let out a little perverted grin at the Jonin, and had it been any other time he'd have felt. Proud for some odd reason, but now he could only stare blankly at the youth. Heh, well I guess we should go to see the old man now. Naruto glanced at his teammates for a moment, noting that Sasuke had walked off a while ago to go do. Whatever the hell he did in his off time, while Sakura just stood there staring off into space. Naruto frowned at that and held up a hand seal creating a shadow clone. On second thought. Here Kakashi, take this shadow clone with you. I gotta do something. The clone walked over to Kakashi while the real Naruto approached Sakura. Kakashi watched Naruto talk with Sakura for a moment, the way the girl brightened a bit during their little chat, sent a bit of hope through the jonin, who'd noticed the way the girl was staring off into space. Shaking his head a couple times, he sighed and rushed to catch up to Zabuza, mumbling something along the lines of lucky son of a bitch. Naruto's clone chuckling along behind him. Naruto noticed Kakashi and his clone leave as he turned back to Sakura so meet me at the Akamichi restaurant tonight at 6, okay? He let out a little smile when Sakura brightened a bit, nodded and told him she'd see him then. As she walked off he couldn't help but notice the little bit of spring in her step again. Naruto's smile turned south into a frown though as he went over their conversation. Sakura was in a deep funk, despite how she felt about the date he had sprung on her, hell that alone had tipped him off at how much that kill had affected her. He'd asked her on a date before, sure, it was just a simple lunch date to get to know each of his classmates, but Sakura had brushed him off pretty easily. Seeing her like this now just made him feel sick. He had to help her get over this, and if he had to go on a date with her or something even further. Then he'd suck it up and do it. Uzumaki-sama. A voice asked respectfully. Ugh what now? Naruto glanced over his shoulder to see a pair of pale lavender eyes staring at him. I take it Hiyashi-san wants to see me. As the branch members nod, Naruto sighed and followed along behind the man as he made his way towards the Hyuga compound. But the Naruto clone. Ah there you are Kakashi, the mission went well I take it. It went rather well, Hokage-sama Kakashi nodded, then went through the arduous task of debriefing the Hokage of all the events that transpired in waves, the Naruto clone breaking in and giving his point of view when it was needed. Hmm, I see. That is quite a little adventure. You and your team went on Kakashi-san. Now that the boring part is over let us get down to business, shall we? At the agreeing murmurs from the room's occupants Saratobi's face hardened a bit. Zabuza Mamachi, Haku Mamachi. You wish to join the Leaf Village, is that correct? The two nodded. Saratobi sighed you do realize the shitstorm that's going to come from Mizu over this right? Not likely. Zabuza grumbled. How so? Why wouldn't want back one of its seven swordsmen? If not for the warrior or his weapon, then simply to collect the bounty on the man's head, Saratobi glared at the man making it clear that the coup d'etat that he had planned was common knowledge. Ugh, that's going to follow me everywhere isn't it? Zabuza groaned. The only reason I did that was because of the bastard Mizukage, the bastard started the bloodline civil war and had to be stopped, it's only my shame that follows me now, since I couldn't kill the hacker myself. Aku looked up at her adoptive father in shock. What do you mean Zabuza-sama? Zabuza turned to regard his apprentice and daughter in all but blood. The intel from Gato's manifest coming from Mizu painted a pretty picture on the current state of the country. The Mizukage was killed almost a year ago by the resistance cells in the country, a woman named Mei Terumi runs the place now. But Zabuza sama, she's. Haku began. He sighed, yeah, I know. Saratobi took a puff of his pipe, oh, just what do you know about that woman Zabuza san? Zabuza didn't say anything for a while, you could tell he was mulling things over, debating on whether or not he should say anything, but he just resolved himself, since he'd have to say this eventually anyway. She. He started slowly. Was. My teammate. Along with Yugura. You know him as the fourth Mizukage. Those who didn't know that fact were surprised by that statement. Zabuza had fought alongside the 4th and now 5th Mizukage. An interesting development for sure. 
So your coup d'etat wasn't a grab for power, but a liberation of your friend's tyranny? Kakashi mused. Yeah. And I thought my time as a shinobi was hacked up. Yes, yes we can all talk about our mental scarring due to our profession later, right now we have business to attend to. Saratobi pulled out several papers. Now that I have the full story on this and seeing as there is a minimal chance of Mizu getting involved, I think it's safe to call you both Leaf Shinobi. He pulled two headbands from his desk and tossed them to the two Mist Nin. I will however have Anbu keep an eye on you two for the next three months, strictly protocol. I'm sure you understand. The two nodded. Hey old man. Yes, Naruto. I'd just like to point out that Zabuza and Haku are under my clan's protection, since Zabuza has a treasure weapon and Haku has a bloodline, it would be a safe bet that the council will start sticking their noses in my friend's business. Saratobi readily agreed to that, the council, at least the civilian portion was still as snooty as ever, though they had become less of an annoyance as of late, they still could cause trouble now and again. Naruto's eyes narrowed dangerously. If the council starts raising hell to tell them they're under my protection, that should sway the shinobi council and shut the civilians up. But it will. I must say Naruto, I'm starting to feel my age when I see how much you've grown. Saratobi grinned at the blushing blonde whose face colored just slightly at the praise. Hey you used to be so childish Naruto, it's times like these I wonder where the hell the years went. Wait wait wait, back up, you used to be childish. Zabuza stared incredulously at the blonde, breaking out into a bark of laughter at the thought. That I'd have paid to see. Yes, he was quite the loud mud little brat, but that's just his mother's mean streak showing through honestly. Saratobi chuckled when Naruto let out a little huff of annoyance, apparently he wasn't quite grown up yet, that brought a little grin to the wise in Cage's face. Who was his mother? Zabuza asked. Saratobi glanced over at Naruto for a moment, seemingly getting his permission. Seeing the slight nod the man continued. Ah she was a fiery woman, even her husband was scared of her, and I can tell you now he was whipped beyond all manner and reason. He took the pipe from his mouth, eyes glazed a bit, remembering the woman in her prime her name was Kashina Yuzumaki. Zabzua choked and spun so quickly it almost didn't seem like he'd moved. He grabbed the blonde by his black shinobi shirt, almost tearing the material, and lifted him off the ground, so they were eye to eye. Your mother was the bloody red death his voice was frantic and strained. Saratobi rubbed his chin thoughtfully. Ah, I had almost forgotten that was her name outside the village, fitting I guess for someone nicknamed the red-hot-blooded habanero. Zabuza's eyes bugged as he dropped Naruto. His head snapped towards Kakashi. Kakashi he, yeah yeah, I know. Another level. But the original Naruto, now Naruto Uzumaki Namikas was many things, a coward was not one of them, but staring up at the impressive gate of the Hyuga compound and the dozen armed Hyuga branch members lining the walls put him on edge. The Hyuga compound was never this guarded, he should know. He had pranked the hell out of the place, not counting Hinata, after that one time that Hyuga Anbu. Yeah best not to say anything. They're probably still sore over that incident. Actually that may be why they're so guarded right now. Naruto sweat dropped heavily wondering for a moment if he was the cause for so many guards. After he had passed the gates he still felt the oppressive feel of a dozen sets of eyes boring into his back, glancing out of the corner of his eye, he noticed they hadn't turned around to look, yeah, they're still pissed at me. Damn Byakugan an unconscious little shiver went up his spine, it wasn't the Byakugan that was bothering him. Hell, he'd be the first to admit that those eyes looked laxy as hell on Hinata, but when anyone else looked at him with those eyes, they were. Cold, like ice. He choked it up to their personalities as a whole being the same way and left it at that. They passed through the clan gardens and several training grounds before they reached the compound proper. The main house, in all its imposing glory. A traditional Japanese-style mansion would be an appropriate description for the place. But he wasn't there to see the sights, he was there for business, and the man he was meeting held the leash, so to speak on the woman who he had come to respect and even to some degree love in the short time they had been together. The two entered the main building, going room by room until they reached a simple wooden door, unlike the sliding paper doors that adorned the outside. Opening it revealed a study with bookshelves lining every wall and a single Japanese-style table in the center, the branch member bowed respectfully and left, closing the door behind him. Welcome Naruto-san. A voice evenly greeted him. Naruto turned to see the Hyuga head sitting at the table which moments before had been empty. Hello Hiyashi-san, it's good to see you again. The niceties were given in this situation, and he sure as hell didn't want to piss off Hinata's dad. Come, sit. We have much to discuss. The man waved him over gently but firmly. As soon as Naruto sat down he felt a wave of. It wasn't killing intent, he could tell that much, but looking up he did notice Hiyashi sporting a hard gaze, and like all Byakugan users, it was only magnified by said bloodline. What are your plans for my daughter? Naruto could only blink. Straight and to the point I see. Well I guess I could answer the same. He looked directly into Hyuga's eyes, I plan on marrying her Hiyashi-san. 
The Ashi's eyebrows rose into his hairline, a significant show of emotion for the normally emotionless Hyuga, which spoke volumes how much that statement had surprised him. Well. I, I didn't think you would be so forward with such information. You asked for a straight answer and I gave it to you. I try not to beat around the bush when someone wants an answer like that from me. The Ashi nodded a good trait to have, and it served you well now. The Ashi let out a breath that Naruto hadn't realized he'd been holding. I can honestly say. That I consent to the union. Naruto nearly fell over at that. W what? He expected anger, perhaps yelling and threats, not calm acceptance and certainly not his blessing. You know as well as I do about Hinata's. Problems. Naruto let out a little growl at the tone Hiashi took when he said that word which surprised Hiashi quite a bit. He's already that protective of her. Hmm, interesting. Hiashi coughed to cover himself. What I mean is that many of the elders have, for a long time now, viewed Hinata as an incapable clan heir. And I for one agree with them. The spike of killing intent followed that statement, and Hiashi made quick work of covering his ass. I didn't mean it like Naruto said the killing intent lessened a bit. Hinata has always been exceedingly good. Kind. She's always put her friends first among her priorities, and while that is a noble practice, it's quite contrary to how we run the Hyuga clan, where we place clan affairs above all else. The Hyuga clan head folded his hands together in front of him. I'm afraid she'd be a poor leader of the Hyuga clan, but she is a good person as a whole. Hiashi sighed. She merely doesn't have the conviction to do the things I would, the hard choices as it were. Naruto looked pensive, all ill will gone at the moment trying to figure what game Hiashi was playing at. Getting tired of racking his brain he just asked him. So what's the catch for all this, you've called me here and actually approve of me and Hinata being together. Don't you have anything to say at all? Anything. The Ashi was beginning to get a headache from all this. Succumbing to simple human weakness, he let his shoulders relax and sent a hand northward to rub the spot between his eyes, trying in vain to quell the ache this was causing him. Look Naruto the Hyuga said, dropping all forms of decorum and speaking plainly for once. For years now I've tried my best to raise my daughter. I know I've done a piss poor job of it and Hinata has all the right to hate me for the way I've treated her, but I've always tried my hardest to push her to be better, to grow. Hyuga sighed once more, if only my wife Hitomi was still alive today. Then maybe. Naruto chuckled slightly Hitomi. A name given to those with beautiful eyes. Fitting in a way I guess. The Ashi smiled. Yes, even among the Hyuga, Hitomi's eyes shone brightly, not holding the cold glaze that is present in the others of the clan. A trait my daughter shares with her mother. The Hyuga leaned back in a more relaxed position. The elders heard of your dating and have expressed their want for Hinata to be married to you. Most of them still see you as the demon, but they can't deny your bloodlines or that Hinata is a lost cause as they called it. So they're trying to make the most of the situation and marry her off to you. They aren't forcing you. But all things considered they might as well be. Naruto frowned, he hated being used and he hated his friends being used even more than that. This little power play was as devious and underhanded as you could be, selling out your own family for political power. It was sickening. And why are you agreeing with them, you could just as well tell them to hack off, you're a clan head, they're just advisors and elders, do what the Hokage did and put your foot down. It's not gonna change the fact that Hinata and I are going to get married, but it sure as hell will show them you are the leader of this place, not those annoying old fossils. The Ashi was already shaking his head. No Naruto, this is one of those things that no one man can change. This clan is run differently than most, the branch family is just the tip of the iceberg, and the elders may just be my arms and hands, but that doesn't mean they can't choke the head if given enough incentive. He waved a hand around a bit to accentuate the metaphorical scenario, just know that I consent to the marriage along with most of the elders. I may not like it, but I have to look at it this way, she would have been married off anyway at some point. Might as well have it be the son of a man who I greatly respect in you, who I now respect in your own right. He nodded his head respectfully at the blonde you would walk into the home of a disgruntled father and tell him you plan to marry his daughter, not even flinching when I layered on a fair dose of Hyuga brand killing intent on you. You might not know it, but that takes guts and balls of a size I don't care to measure. He reached out a hand to shake, Naruto grasped it firmly, the two holding the shake for a time before he ashy spoke again. But if you hurt her I will put you in a place that even the Kayubi can't heal, you understand. Naruto paled slightly along with Kayubi in his mindscape, the two nodded, one visibly the other not so much. Good. Minus two hours later, Akamichi family restaurant, Naruto stood in front of the restaurant, waiting for Sakura, he had gone back to Anko's place to wash and slip into something more comfortable, switching out his armor and ninja gear for a mixture of shinobi and civilian clothing. A plain orange button-up t-shirt and dark gray anbu pants which his tail was still stuffed into, since he really didn't like showing the thing off. His fox ears were pinned under one of his homemade hats. 
He had found he liked the dapper look with the beret-esque piece of headwear. This particular one was black with a bit of aesthetic flair, a small red Yuzumaki swirl sewn into the front of it. Of course just because he was dressed casually didn't mean he wasn't armed to the teeth. A pair of small and intricate seals were tattooed to the boy's arms, a triumph in the boy's mind at how his sealing abilities were progressing. Within the seals lied a full assortment of kunai and shuriken, as well as one seal on the back of his neck that contained a standard anbu ninjato. Standard weaponry, sure but undeniably effective. A slight tap of footsteps alerted him to his date's arrival. He turned to greet Sakura, but froze as his jaw hit the floor. He had said to dress casual, and that's how he usually preferred it, but Sakura. She. Just. Damn. In front of him was a goddess in human form, sure she didn't have the figure of someone like Anko or even Hinata for that matter, but her outfit more than made up for it. Slitted blue eyes roved over her for a moment taking in every jaw-dropping detail. Her pink shirt was cut along the midriff to show off surprisingly defined abs and a somewhat curvy waist. The plunging neckline of the shirt was tastefully accented by a small cherry blossom-shaped pendant, now normally he'd have objected to how risque the V in her shirt would have been, but he noticed that in lieu of a bra she had chosen to wrap her chest with bandages, the soft white of the bandages, accenting the pale red cloth of the shirt. His gaze went south for a moment to take in the side of her shorts. Which, despite the provocative nature of her shirt, were rather plain in comparison. Just a casual pair of denim jeans cut off at just above the knees, and a pair of tennis shoes finished off the ensemble. After a moment of staring he noticed she had several earrings in each of her ears as well, each stud accented with a pale green gem that matched her eyes wonderfully. Not that you could really see the earrings he realized, as she had removed her headband which let her hair fall into a cascade of pink. In the process of rolling up his jaw he made a vow to do this kind of thing again, if all women dressed up like this when going out on a date. He'd definitely have to do this again. Naruto smiled at Sakura opening the door to the restaurant and gesturing inside. Ladies first he chuckled. Well shouldn't you be going in before me then? She joked, a small smile on her face. Oh you wound me fair princess Naruto Mach grabbed his chest in pain before joining her in a chuckle, a tension neither knew had been there disappearing as the two walked into the restaurant. The first thing to hit was the smell, being run by the Akamichi gave the place a pedigree unmatched anywhere in fire country. The food was rich, yet affordable, and the service was courteous and friendly, with waiters and waitresses often spending time talking with the guests helping them feel at home. The second thing they noticed was that the place was nearly empty, having come between lunch and dinner they just missed break time for the ninja teams and hadn't quite made it to the end of a hard day's training meal. That didn't mean there wasn't anyone there, in fact there were several people that both Naruto and Sakura recognized, one such group was Team 10, Ino, Shikamaru and Choji, along with Asuma their sensei, Naruto, Sakura. Ino yelled merrily, her hair flipping around in her haste to get up to greet them. Okami, Ino. Naruto groaned mentally. One of the few people, girls of his age group in particular, had caught Naruto's interest when it came to other potential wives. When they had first met that wouldn't have even been considered given her crush on Sasuke, but Naruto had found out in short order that after he had landed Sasuke on his ass during their first meeting, he had left an impression on quite a few of the girls in his class, Ino being one of his fans. His fans. He didn't even know he had fans until a group of a dozen or more girls flocked around him during break one day. That incident had almost turned deadly. Good thing he kept a spare change of clothing on him at all times, he really needed to invest in some tougher clothing, he really couldn't afford to have them ripping his clothes off at every given chance. But that was then, this was now, and Ino had that fangirl look in her eyes again. Although she hadn't tried to declive him, she had flashed quite a few sets of bedroom eyes his way, not to mention her constant come-ons she seemed to throw his way. If she wasn't such a fangirl he might have considered it, but as of right now she was still a fangirl, and that was a bad mindset to be in. Oh, but don't think that made her weak, due to finding out her crush like self-sufficient women she had taken to upping her training to try and get his attention. The results being, her body was as fit if not more so than Sakura's, and he had been personally training Sakura for the past month and a half. Asuma waved at the two, flagging them towards the table. Hey why don't you two join us, we just sat down for some barbecue. Naruto looked over at Sakura for a moment, an unasked question on his face. Sakura just smiled and nodded slightly, taking a seat next to Shikamaru, leaving a space for Naruto to sit next to her, which he gladly took. The group chatted idly until Choji brought up the fact that the two of them were together outside of a mission and asked if they were dating. Well yeah, it is kind of a date. Naruto laughed uncomfortably as he noticed Ino's frown, but it's just a friendly date between teammates, kinda like what you guys are doing. Oh, that's good Ino smiled as their waiter brought them several servings of meat so that they could cook on the little grill in the center of the table, the waiter also laid a basket of bread down next to Naruto. Ino perked up at that mischievous smile on her face. Hey Naruto, could you pass me a roll? Uh. Sure, Ino. You want butter on it? 
At the affirmative nod he grabbed one of the rolls and spread a small bit of butter on it, handing it over to the other blonde. Now normally that would have been it, but Eno saw fit to throw another one of her dirty one-liners into the mix. MMM, a good man always knows how to butter a woman's muffin she giggled, taking a bite out of the bread. Naruto groaned and smacked his head into the table, hard. Asuma and Choji choked. One on his cigarette, the other on a piece of meat he had been eating. Troublesome. Shikamaru sighed, beating on the back of his friend to dislodge the offending chunk of food. Sakura. She just turned away from everyone, a pained look on her face. Naruto noticed the look on Sakura's face immediately. Scowling, he turned to Ino and glared Ino, a word please. He stood up and walked towards the front of the restaurant, forcing Ino to follow quickly or get left behind. Once the two were outside Ino huffed just what the hell is your problem Naruto. It was just a joke. My problem Ino is that Sakura took offense to it and right now anything that affects Sakura affects me. Oh? So you are dating then? Ino leveled a glare at the man, a twinge of jealousy touching her voice. No Ino, we're not. He sighed again, he'd have to tell her sooner or later, rather now and be done with it than later, and have her beat his ass for not telling her what happened to her friend. Sakura was very nearly raped and killed on our last mission Ino. Ino's eyes flew wide. W what? She gasped in disbelief. Yes, it's true, she spent the last week nearly mute, barely saying anything to anyone, I've only just recently gotten her talking. Your little comment may have only sought to get a rise out of me, but it also was a little too lax well for Sakura, the last time someone even mentioned anything close to lax, she actually flinched and wouldn't talk to anyone for the rest of the day. Right about then Ino was feeling terrible about herself, the fact that she had hurt her best friend, even indirectly, hurt her more than she thought it would. I'm sorry. She whimpered. I didn't know. Knowing something and doing it are two different things Ino, you knew it would make me and everyone around you uncomfortable, and yet you did it anyway. And it's not me you have to be sorry to. He gave her a pointed glance. Ino sniffled a few times before nodding, the two of them walking back inside. Surprisingly Ino took Naruto's spot at the table, burying her head into her friend's chest and hugging her tight. It was one of the worst fears of a Kanoichi to be raped on a mission, Sakura had experienced that fear firsthand, and Ino had just reminded her of it. She whispered I'm sorry insistently into the girl's chest wraps, soaking the material with what tears the girl was shedding. Sakura was uncomfortable with how close the woman was to her, she looked Naruto across from her and noticed that he wouldn't look her in the eye as he mouthed just let her. Sakura nodded and wrapped the girl in a hug, a few tears of her own, working their way into Yamanaka's hair. Needless to say the three other men at the table were confused at this sudden change in Ino, but when they noticed the glare that Naruto was leveling their way, they thought it best to leave the matter to the girls, who were handling it rather well considering. After the tearful moment between the girls the meal was eaten in relative silence, afterwards Ino and Sakura said goodbye to everyone, Naruto watched the two leave and saw Sakura glance over her shoulder at him, a small smile spread across her face as she mouthed to thank you. Naruto smiled back and nodded. What was that about? Asuma asked, walking out of the restaurant with Shikamaru and Choji next to him. It's not my place to say Asuma-san, the only reason I told Ino was because she was friends with Sakura. He let out a weary sigh I will say this though, this world is dangerous for a shinobi, Kinoichi even more so, and there are times where close calls require a last resort. Without another word he turned and walked away. Shikamaru and Asuma grimaced and looked back to the two distant girls, they could guess where he was going with that, a Kinoichi's worst fear, and the last resort to take care of it. Yeah they could imagine. The three men said goodnight to each other and walked back to their homes, respecting Sakura's privacy over the matter. What do you mean they're staying here? Anko growled, none too pleased by the fact that a certain pair of Miss Nin were crashing at her tower. Naruto sighed. It's exactly as I said, until they have enough money to buy themselves a place there under our care. Anko rubbed her head in irritation, a headache beginning to form. And just why are we doing this again? Because Haku is my cousin Anko. Anko raised an eyebrow in surprise, looked from Haku to Naruto and back again on whose side. And how close a cousin are we talking about? Mother's side and I'm pretty sure it's distant, the Yuzumaki and Yuki clans are cousin clans to begin with, and even if I'm related to Haku, it's maybe fourth or fifth cousin, possibly a couple times removed as well. So it would be okay if you two hacked then. Anko mused, tapping her chin idly with a finger. Naruto let out a choke sound halfway between a gasp and a gag, Haku blushing up a storm next to him, and Zabuza laughing his ass off, oh how he enjoyed people like Anko. Why the hell are you asking me that? Naruto griped, pointing an accusing finger at Anko. Well, even I can tell the girl has the hots for you, have you popped her the question yet? Naruto's jaw dropped, finger going slack along with his jaw. Haku blushed an even deeper shade of red, while Zabuza actually stopped laughing and stared, shocked at the woman's gal. Anko had to stifle a giggle, but continued her line of questioning. I know you've thought about it, and Hinata didn't complain when you asked her to be your wife as well. 
Tabuza's eyes widened at the implications, this brat was not only married to the snake Mr. Sanko, but someone else as well. Wait, wait, wait. How the hell are you married to two women? He asked, shocked. Anko cast a glance his way, Naruto still in too much shock to answer. He's a crop participant, since he's the last of two separate clans and a wielder of several powerful bloodline traits, and considering I own this tower and the land around it, he's now a man of considerable land holdings through me, so he is more than capable of marrying more than one woman to revive his clans. Odzabuza was actually speechless at this, he had never heard of that before, and said as such to the snake woman. You haven't heard of it because the last time it was used was after the first shinobi world war to shore up the members lost to the major clans of Konoha. Anko rubbed her chin and thought hell I think it was the old man Hokage who actually started the damn thing after a good 40% of the village's ninja were killed off. I think the current heads of the Aburam, Inuzuka and Yamanaka clan were born from that sort of arrangement. Zabuza turned to Naruto who was just coming out of his days. Kid, you're one of the luckiest bastards I know of. Suo Anko began, leaning over slightly to look at the girl eye to eye, a small smirk on her face. If Naruto did ask you to marry him, would you? Aku's face turned a deep shade of crimson as she pondered the question, averting her eyes from the seductive snake Kinoichi. Who, she noticed, didn't wear a bra under her mesh shirt. I, I don't know, maybe. Anko, don't try forcing her into something, you know my policy on this, I gave Hinata a choice, and she took it. Haku has that same choice, but it's up to her if she wants to. He turned to address Haku, and that choice will always be open to you, it's not like there's a time limit to this sort of thing. So take some time to get to know me and decide for yourself. Haku nodded, grateful to the blonde as Anko backed off with a huff. You're no fun Naruto, you never let me screw with people anymore. She turned her nose up at the blonde in question who just gave her a resigned sigh. Anko, if I didn't stop you from doing half the crap you do, most of the people in Konoha would be physically and mentally scarred by now. And for good reason. She growled. You and I both know most of the people in this village deserve a bit of payback for the way they treated you. Naruto in a bit of tactful genius changed the subject, pointing to Haku and Zabuza. So it's alright for them to stay, right? Anko frowned, he always did that sort of thing when she tried getting a bit of vengeance back for all the times the people of this village treated him like crap, but he'd have none of it and usually scolded her. Actually scolded her for pulling the crap she used to do. Alright. She sighed, she knew when to accept defeat when he was being stubborn, else they would just argue about it for the rest of the night. They can stay. But you owe me. She leveled a glare his way. Naruto shivered unconsciously at the look. What do you want Anko? He was getting a bad feeling about this. I think it's about time we finalized a few things. She wiggled her eyebrow suggestively as Naruto gulped. He knew that look and the way she licked her lips definitely tipped him off on what she was after. You too. She snapped, barking an order at Haku and Zabuza who snapped to attention. You can take any of the rooms on the third or fourth floor. The fifth floor is mine and Naruto's and we're going to be busy for a few hours. So don't bother us. She giggled maniacally. Or you regret it. She left that final thread in the air as she dragged a mumbling Naruto behind her to their bedroom. Chapter 14. Buckling down and troublesome women. Anko was having a wonderful day. Why, you may ask. Well, after their little lovemaking session last night. Naruto and Anko woke in each other's arms, feeling. Beyond wonderful is the only way they could describe it, and now she was standing before the most greasy, foul-mouthed, and most importantly, tight-lipped prisoner she'd had in a while. Grinning widely she got to work. It only took her ten minutes to break him. Meanwhile, Naruto was having a wonderful day. For obvious reasons. He walked into his training ground with a shit-eating grin on his face, not even caring that he was late or that Kakashi was arriving at the same time. You're late. Both of you. What the hell is Naruto? Sasuke grunted from his meditative position next to a tree trunk. I got lost on the road of life the two men answered simultaneously, the two turning to stare at each other curiously for a moment. Enko? Kakashi asked. Enko? The boy nodded. Academy broom closet. He asked back. Academy broom closet. The Jonin nodded, the two stared at each other a moment before they bumped fists, nodding respectfully to each other, before turning to the rest of their team, who were looking at them like they were hacked up in the head. What? They answered simultaneously again, to the chagrin of the rest of their team. Okay enough screwing around Kakashi said seriously, the three genin in front of him tensing at his tone of voice. I know we just got back from Wave, but I called you here today to hand these out. He pulled three sheets of paper from his pack and handed it to his team. Junin exams entrance form? Naruto asked, scanning over the document in his hand. Yes, I feel that the three of you are ready to take the exams, you have the teamwork necessary, and your abilities are coming along nicely. He held up both his hands, fingers extended you have 10 days until the exams start, that means a week for training and 2 days for relaxation before the test. 
he leveled a calculative eye on each of them in that week you three are going to buckle down on teamwork, he turned his attention solely on Naruto. And you are going to teach them the second stage of their element training while I will supervise. Naruto frowned. I know that I was able to teach them the first step in their element training in the first month, but that doesn't mean they can learn the second or third stages of training in the next week. He rubbed his forehead in frustration. Hell, it normally takes six months for someone to even finish the first step much less the others, the only reason I was able to finish the training in all my elements was due to my affinities and massive rape of Cage Bunshin. He leveled a flat stare at his sensei who was casually waiting for him to finish. And I sure as hell ain't teaching these idiots the Cage Bunshin, they'd be dead by the end of the day. Akashi nodded his agreement despite the other two huffing in annoyance. You're right, and I don't expect them to finish by then, but training more in their element gives them more options to work with, and in a week you could have them up to par with a couple of small ones to get them prepared. Kakashi and Naruto stared at each other for a moment before the blonde sighed. Alright let's just get this over with. He formed a hand sign and created a hundred clones, the large cloud of smoke filling the clearing. Kakashi coughed a couple times, swatting the offending gas away. Dot you know. I don't think I'll ever get used to seeing that. Kakashi deadpanned, pulling out his Icha Icha book and flipping to a certain page. Naruto ignored the open display of perversity and focused on his teammates. Alright, first off. He yelled, Sakura and Sasuke jumping to attention to pay close attention to him. After all, when Naruto made that many clones he tended to put people through hell if they were ignoring him. Since this is the second stage of chakra nature training he continued. You two are going to have to put some effort into this if we're going to get anywhere in a week. Hell, the first stage that you two completed in a month normally takes six, this step here takes upwards of two years, and the final step is even more than that. He walked between his two protégés and placed a single hand on their shoulders. I don't expect either of you to complete the second stage of your element by the time the exams roll around. He squeezed Sakura's shoulder encouragingly while at the same time slapping a hand on the Ichiha's back. I do, however, think that learning a bit more control over your element along with the news that I'm going to show you will help make things a tad bit easier. Bakashi watched on as Naruto's words made their way through to his teammates, Sasuke looked excited. Well as much as he could express anyway. About the fact he was going to learn more techniques. Sakura just had a small smile on her face and the tiniest glint of amusement in her eyes. Whatever the hell the blonde had done yesterday had returned some of the fire to his teammate, something Kakashi was grateful for, since he had never had to deal with this situation before. He was either in command of hardened ninja who were cautious enough to not fall to the fate or was a loner, and he sure as hell hadn't been almost raped yet. Though that had been the basis of a few of his fantasies. A little perverse giggle filled the air as Naruto went over the process of learning the second step of their chakra nature training. Okay, Sakura, since you're our medic nin, this is actually a pretty important thing to learn. Naruto had her full attention. He smiled when he noticed that her eye held a bit more warmth to them than yesterday, clearly her time with Ino after dinner had left a bit of a more positive feeling in her. Alright, watch closely. He pulled out a bit of moisture from the air and held it in his hand. Alright, most medic nins use water to draw out poisons, that means that those with water affinities tend to be poison removal experts. Naruto held up his hand and the water started swirling around in his palm. The first step was to teach you how to move water around, free-flowing and uncontrolled, this is the first step and allows you to move water to attack and defend, but it doesn't allow you to create things out of water, like a water-style Suyuidin for example. He held up two fingers. That requires learning steps 1 and 2 and combining them together to make step 3. Naruto walked back to his original spot in front of them, turning as he gestured with his left hand to his right, which was holding the water. Step 2 is simple really. The water in his hands suddenly found itself in a sphere in his hands. Control, or forming the water into a usable shape, usually a ball since that is the simplest geometrical shape, but. He trailed off as the water, more slowly mind you, took the form of a pyramid, then a cube, then further and further, until sweat started beating Naruto's brow. Finally after he'd created a wonderful rendition of the Hokage Tower in water, he dropped the liquid to the ground as he gasped for breath. Sakura and Sasuke stared at him strangely, they had never seen Naruto that out of breath before, which could only demonstrate how hard this step really was. Naruto laughed when he noticed the looks he was getting. Yeah huff it's kinda difficult huff to control water huff, it's one of the most difficult base elements to control, it requires near perfect chakra control to really be good at it. What do you mean? Sasuke asked curiously. Well. Naruto thought for a moment. Water is all based on how to move and control a free-flowing element. Fire is not often controlled, it's just blown from the mouth in jets, not much control for it. Earth is ridiculously easy to learn since the matter you are using is solid, it's mostly just moving it. Lightning is mostly just control rather than movement, since lightning's nature is to move to the nearest object to ground itself. The only thing more difficult than water is wind. 
Wind is the most difficult chakra nature to learn, that's why there's so few wind users even when they have the affinity. Since wind isn't solid or even physical, it requires a lot of concentration to form anything from it, it also takes a lot of effort to control it and keep it in that shape while it's moving. However, even though it's the hardest to control, it is also the most flexible of all the elements. So what's lightning's second stage? Naruto held up both hands apart from each other, in between both a small charge of electricity arsed and sustained itself, making it look like a chain of electricity was connecting his hands together. It's simple Sasuke, the first step was control over lightning at pinpoints, and only for an instant, like normal lightning. Releasing the energy Naruto flipped through several hand seals and held his hand out, allowing a long beam of electricity to extend out of his hand. Lightning release. Thunder lance. See this. He held up the beam of energy that he held in the center like a javelin. For something harder like this, you require a constant of lightning chakra flowing externally. This exercise allows you to do that by teaching you how to create a circuit in your body, which allows you to store the chakra and the control necessary to release the energy in a controlled way. For lightning that requires the lighting to become a semi-solid weapon this exercise is crucial. Sakura raised a questioning hand up. But if that were the case couldn't you just practice something like that lightning lance and learn how to do that anyway, why all the trouble going through this change in chakra nature when it doesn't seem that difficult to just learn a technique that would teach you that regardless just from use. Naruto smiled. Ah, now there's a good question. To be perfectly honest, you don't really need a change in nature training to get results in that nature, every time you practice of that element, you become more aligned with the element you are using. So you could say that using ninja techniques is natural training. Then why go through all the trouble of learning how to do this? Naruto grinned. Ah, but that's the most important part, Sakura. For most people, they have no clue how to use their chakra natures to full effect, even techniques like this one here, he gestured to the thunder lance, which he then threw to pin it to a tree nearby. Require time and energy to learn without prior knowledge. So in essence, change in chakra nature training is a primer, a first step into learning how to fully control your element, along with giving you helpful tips on how to control your of that element later. He held up three fingers the three steps in nature training are about 90% of the rules for each element, so if you learn this, you can be assured that you can quickly learn the majority of the techniques of your element or elements. So it's a shortcut then? Sasuke mused. Actually. Naruto laughed. It's more like the right way of learning your element, everybody else is just doing it the hard way. And with that Naruto started their training, with Sakura he had her forming a small sphere of water between her hands, coaching her and focusing the water as perfectly as possible for the desired shape. For Sasuke he forced the broody bastard into creating a link of lightning between his hands with several inches between his palms and fingers. The results were. Negligible. Sakura could barely control the water in her hands, unlike just moving the water, actually trying to give it shape took far more concentration than the previous step. As it stood, the ball she held looked more like an undulating party balloon stretched thin and lanky. Sasuke wasn't much better. His first step had been based entirely on holding the charge internally to his body, only coming out of a single in the tips of his fingers, which allowed him to use the lightning release. Taser. Which in a way was just the culmination and application of the first step of lightning nature training that Naruto had adapted for his own personal use. This. This was on a whole nother level of difficulty, the strain of keeping a several inch long supercharged piece of lightning chakra active externally caused sweat to bead the last itch of his brow. Naruto had been sitting there watching the pair's progress while his clones were doing their own training, with ten or so each going off to mess around with his base elements, ten focusing on learning his katas which gained a bit more lethality, thanks to a couple of lessons Abusa had given him on the way back from Wave, so far the lessons were paying off. Another ten had taken up to jutsu practice on the other side of the field which Kakashi had taken a fair interest in, which didn't bother the blonde-haired genin much, since his style was just an amalgam of the academy to jutsu and the snake style, good for quick strikes and getting back out more than anything. The good twenty of them had skulked off to practice his seals which were coming along nicely. He had reached a proficiency in them to create a few seals on his own, thankfully the old man had lent him some books on the subject after he had burned through all the ones he had bought from Tenten's dad. Soon. As for the last 20 he had been playing with the idea his teammates had given him before his mission to wave, that of using his tail in combat. So far the results had looked promising. No, he couldn't swing a sword with his tail or throw fireballs around from them, but he could channel chakra through the appendage and with a little work do specific things with it, like touching the ground to send a small earth like a earth release. Earth dome to raise a small wall around him in case of an emergency. That freed up his hands for something else. Which, in the ninja world, was a lifesaver. And no. He couldn't use the tail to add a third element to his Genkai, thus making a Keke Tota, he had thought to emulate the dust release technique of the second and third Tsuchikage. The results were. 
explosive at best, and not the good kind either. The crater his clones had found him in half bleeding to death didn't bode well for any triple element. At least for now, he'd leave that avenue of thought open for future testing, but for right now he liked being in one piece and still breathing. Thank you very much. Unaware of their teammates' thoughts, Sakura and Sasuke were having different thoughts about both their difficult training and their surprisingly skilled teammate. Sakura was peeking glances at Naruto every so often when she felt she had a good grasp on the water sphere in her hand, for as soon as she took her concentration off the thing for a moment or two the ball of water would start losing its shape entirely, however thoughts were running through her head that she just couldn't shake. She had spent all of last night talking with Hino about her teammate. No, not Sasuke, surprisingly. No, it had been Naruto that had dominated the girl's thoughts. After her close call with that thug, Naruto had spent almost every moment as close as possible to her for the entire trip back from Wave, and in some strange way her affections for her teammates had inverted. Somewhere along the line her crush had shifted to Naruto, while her beginning feelings of some sibling love had shifted to Sasuke. It was odd how her feelings had been flipped on their head like that, but watching how intently Naruto was watching the both of them, she couldn't help but shiver under that gaze. She hadn't noticed before but his eyes held such power behind them. The cerulean orbs were as deep as the ocean and filled with as much vibrancy and the headstrong tendencies of a determined tidal wave, flowing forward, not stopping until it had bulldozed everything in its path. It was humbling to be looked at like that by someone she was beginning to hold feelings for, it wasn't like her crush for Sasuke. No, it was nothing like that with Naruto. Sasuke had always held her affection, but Naruto. Naruto just exudes this calm that made her feel all tingly inside, even now when they were presented with the stressful news that in a week's time they would be possibly fighting to the death to gain the title of Chunin. It hadn't phased the blonde one bit, if anything he looked eager, almost as eager to be training them even, which was odd. For some strange reason Naruto is delighted in helping people become stronger. She had seen him push Sasuke in class, using his abilities to move Sasuke along and actually get the Ichiha to open up to him, which up until that point no one had been able to do. Even now Sasuke looked up to Naruto, he would never admit it, but Sakura had spent enough time around the broody boy to know the tells of his posture and mood, to know what he was thinking. Right now, he respects Naruto's strength and drive. And now. Now she was beginning to feel the same, Ino pushing her and rubbing some of her fangirl off on her last night, hadn't helped any. Although to be perfectly honest Ino was a lot better off than Sakura was, she might not have had a month of Naruto's tour training. But she did take her training far more seriously since the beginning of the academy, thus becoming stronger than Sakura by a wide margin, and in her mind wasn't as much of a fangirl as she had been. A small glow of determination fired up in her eyes as she focused more intently on the roughly sphere-like object in her hand, if Ino had a better chance at Naruto, then she just needed to even the playing field, maybe then she could make heads or tails of these feelings for him. Just maybe. Sasuke on the other hand was starting to feel the burn. In the sizzling meat kind of way. Holding large amperes of electricity in and around your body tends to do that to you. But that wasn't the only thing on Ichiha's mind. What really dominated his thoughts was how powerful Naruto was. An orphan gifted with an unforeseen bloodline, or in this case, cursed with one. Sasuke wasn't ignorant or self-absorbed like many people thought he was, he was just quiet and had a vengeful streak like the worst of them, but that came with the whole getting your whole family killed and being mind-raped by a that made you relive your parents' death for 72 hours thing. But that wasn't important, at least right now it wasn't. As he said, he wasn't ignorant, nor was he ignorant of other people around him, especially the blonde mystery he had come to admire. No he wasn't gay, though many of their fangirls had come to that conclusion several times. He really needed to talk with Naruto about that. But again he was rambling. As he stated before he wasn't stupid or self-absorbed or ignorant. He had walked around town enough with Naruto to notice the glares people gave him when he passed by civilians, he had also heard and seen the whisperings and the rude gestures they had made as well, it was an eye-opening experience for the boy who was only a year into the academy at the time. Here he was, practically worshipped as Kami by the populace, had everything he wanted but still felt empty inside, and here was a child who had the combined weight of the entire civilian populace's hatred, pegged squarely on his shoulders, and yet he stood up to it, braving their anger and all with a wide, dumb-as-hell grin on his face. Hell, even in private when he'd seen a bit of that smile slip he still looked happy, regardless of how badly he was treated. Just how did he do it? Regardless, Sasu could say without a doubt that Naruto was one of the first and best friends he'd ever had. He pushed him to better himself, kicked his ass when he was being emo, and all around understood what the Ichiha was going through, and Naruto had only cemented that when he had made a vow of friendship, when the blonde had knocked his arrogant ass on the ground back when they first met. And so far he had kept the damn promise to the bloody letter. It left him feeling. Strange. 
all warm and tingly inside, made him feel not so alone, that maybe he didn't have to live his life or take his revenge by himself. Just maybe. The three genin felt the weight of their thoughts fill the clearing, as a calm silence echoed hollowly around them, even though Kakashi had stopped reading his book to fix them with an almost. Sad. No, more like a solemn gaze. The rest of the training passed by fairly quickly. By the time anyone realized, it was almost nightfall. Saying their goodbyes for the day the four members of Team 7 left for home. Each having their thoughts weigh heavily on their mind. The next morning, the long line of thumps echoed across the clearing, each dull thud punctuated by a gleaming metal kunai, burying itself several inches deep into a wooden practice dummy at the end of the field. For Tenten Higurashi this was her relaxation time. The soft, subtle, musical bass of kunai on wood created a wonderful symphony for the girl and her throwing weapons. She had a fascination for all things sharp and pointy, if it could be used as a weapon it was her prerogative, and she spent countless hours learning how to throw everything but the kitchen sink, and sometimes she even threw that to get an edge on her enemies. Life was good for the mouse bun girl. It was a quiet morning, the birds were chirping, the bugs were buzzing, nothing could dampen her mood. That was until one Naruto Uzumaki and Haku Mamachi made themselves known. That's the path to training ground 6, and this is the training ground. Oh, Tenten. Naruto blinked a couple times as he walked into the clearing, his mind registering the girl in front of him. Tenten smirked at the blank look he was giving her. Take a picture, it'll last longer. She giggled. Naruto facipumped which only made her giggle harder. Okay, so what the hell are you doing on this end of town Naruto? And at this hour? It's only what? 6 a.m.? Naruto shook his head a few times uh, I was just showing Haku here around town, she's new and is going to be a ninja for Konoha, so I was showing her around the training grounds. Also I'm out early because. Well. Kakashi. He shrugged his shoulders as if that explained everything, it did. Tenta nodded, shaking her head at the one-eyed Jonin's bad habits, before she turned a curious gaze on the woman next to him. She was older, maybe by a few years, not as tall, but she had an ethereal beauty to her, it couldn't help but leave the young weapons mistress feeling a tad bit jealous. So how you been Naruto, it's been, what? Almost a month since we seen each other. She pouted a little bit and is Haku your girlfriend? I remember you telling me you had a girlfriend, but you never went into details. Ahaha. <laughs> Naruto suddenly looked a bit nervous at that. Haku is. Well. He looked questioningly at the girl who only nodded. Yeah you could say she's my girlfriend. Denton's pout grew larger. Oh well, I just wanted to know since me and Niji haven't been working out. She lowered her head, sounding almost miserable. Naruto slapped his face again, you're not still on about that are you? He let out an annoyed sigh. Denton looked up sharply. And what the hell is that supposed to mean? You know as well as I do that if you'd have been single I'd have dated you. Out of everyone in the village my age you're the closest thing to perfect that I'm looking for. She held up her hand going through each finger in rapid succession. Smart, strong, kind, willing to help others and damn well handsome to boot. She put her hands on her hips and glared at the blonde. So you tell me. Naruto was speechless for a moment before a coughing haku diverted his attention from the fuming Tenten. You didn't tell her, did you? It was more of a statement than a question. Tell me what? Tenton demanded, her voice still holding a sharp edge, but now tinged with a small bit of curiosity. Despite Naruto shaking his head at her to stop, Haku continued. Dingus here. She pointed to Naruto. As a participant of the Kra, he can bloody well have as many women as he pleases. The council knows he has several bloodline traits, and they've given him the green light to pursue as many women as he can. The tense silence filled the confined area, and slowly a dark miasma of energy seemed to radiate from Tenton. Naruto. She growled. Just when were you going to tell me this, and why in all the hells you can name did you hide it from me in the first place? You could hear a bit of hurt in her voice, but her anger overrode it. I like you a lot you dweeb, and I know for a fact you've checked out my ass at least a dozen times, so I know you're at least interested. Hell the only reason I dated Niji was because you said you were taken. So why haven't you told me yet, huh? The last bit she yelled in his face and, him being whipped a bit by Anko, back down under her fury. Look Tenten I know you like me, I really do know that. It's just. He tried to mumble a bit more, but Tenten had pressed her face into his. Just what? She hissed, sounding quite a bit like the snake mistress at that moment do you think it won't work? No response. That you're not worthy of me or vice versa. Again nothing. Or is it because you think I won't like you after you spill your guts about that damn furball in your stomach? Naruto's eyes widened slightly unaware of the fact she had already been told by her father about the Kaiubi early on. He flinched away from her slightly, averting his eyes. That's it isn't it? It wasn't a question. She grabbed him by his shirt and hefted him off the ground, in that moment, showing how damn good a physical instructor my guy was. You think I give a damn about what others think? I could care less about what any civilian or some bumpkin ninja thinks. And you know damn well I'm your friend. 
we've been friends for damn near six years now. Do you honestly think I'd hate you over something as trivial as that? Do you think I'm that shallow? Naruto hung there by his lapels just taking the brunt of the girl's anger, truly he didn't think she would hate him, but even now, even with Anko and Hinata being a guiding positive force in his life, he still had trouble trusting people. But that was just it, he did trust Denton. So why did he keep that information from her? Was he scared of commitment? The FFT no, he was already married to someone and going to be married to another not much longer from now, he'd already popped his cherry both physically and matrimonially. So what was the problem? Taking a moment to actually think about it hit him like a ton of bricks, thought there wasn't one. He had just been indecisive and hadn't thought about her feelings at all. With a fair amount of guilt heaped on his shoulders, he looked the angered woman dead in the eyes and did the only thing he could do. Tenton, you're right. I didn't take into account your feelings, I was just caught up in my own problems and didn't want to have to deal with anything else until I had graduated and by then I had completely forgotten to tell you. I'm sorry. Denton stared at him for a moment before dropping him like a sack of potatoes turning away from him as she did so. With a curse and a thud the blonde hit the ground. It was quiet for a moment after that. Denton turned back to address him, fire in her eyes alright, I believe you. She finally said at length. But next time if it's something as important as that, tell me. Naruto nodded, rubbing his injured rear and getting to his feet. And for hiding that little tidbit of info from me, I think you owe me. She let out a little cat-like grin at the blonde. Naruto raised an eyebrow at that. And just what did you have in mind? Denton was about to say something when Haku leaned in and started whispering in her ear. A minute or so passed by the only sound Naruto could hear, even with his enhanced hearing, muffled as it was under his hat, was the whispering and a few giggles the girls made, the grins on their faces growing wider and wider with each passing second. Alright we've decided. Tenton declared. To make it up to me, you'll be taking the both of us out for a date, then we'll both be discussing this marriage thing with you. The predatory grins they flashed would have made Kissam proud. Naruto's mouth went slack for a moment as he stared at them, then slowly but surely face met palm. Oh great now they're ganging up on me he muttered. First they're fainting and falling off cliffs now they're guilt tripping me. Fine. He crouched walking over to the two women and offering them each an arm. Let's get on with it, I still have like three hours until Kakashi gets his ass in gear. He began muttering about troublesome women as the two girls dragged him from the training field. Now he knew how Shikamaru felt. A few hours later, the Onar what the hell happened to you Sasu choked out. Naruto stumbled into the training grounds looking like he'd gotten into a fight with a tornado in a lipstick factory. Good things. The blonde giggled incoherently, a wide smile on his face. Maybe Shikamaru was wrong after all. Chapter 15. Tune and exam start. Anko's eye twitched ever so slightly as Naruto explained why Haku and Tenten were wrapped around the blonde's arms, both of them looking quite pleased with themselves. So they're marrying you too then? Anko deadpanned. A slight tingle went down Naruto's spine because even though she said that as a question he got the distinct feeling it was more of a statement. Uh. Yeah Naruto laughed slightly as the two women continued to hang off of his body like laxy Christmas ornaments. Anko started the blonde down, who was beginning to sweat under the snake woman's awful gaze. A gaze which turned mischievous a few seconds later. Alright, but I get to have a talk with them. Not okay. Naruto nearly jumped when the pair grabbing him eeped as the snake woman yanked them off him and dragged the two off to Kami, knows where to do. Things. To them. Naruto shivered and said a quick prayer for the two doomed women. Minus two days later, okay. Naruto coughed into his hand. Let's see how far you two have gotten with your training. Sakura held up her hand, a small somewhat squashed sphere sat gently in her palm. Naruto nodded. Good, as soon as that's perfectly round, make it twice as big. Sakura nodded, focusing on the opal of water in her hand to try and solidify the shape. Sasuke held his hands together about an inch and a half apart, a thin but powerful charge of electricity arcing between his palms. Excellent. Naruto clapped his hands together. Now, make the arc bigger and continue to spread your palms apart. Right. Sasuke mumbled, sitting down next to a tree to do exactly that. Hey Naruto. Kakashi spoke up, glancing from his preferred reading material to lay a questioning frown on the genin. Yeah Kakashi-sensei. Just how far in are they with their training? Naruto hummed in thought for a moment, staring at the level of progress his two teammates had achieved and compared it to his. I'd say they're about a fifth through their second stage training. They were able to finish the first stage of their training before we left for the waves. Naruto let out an evil little chuckle as he thought back to the tour training they'd gone through. Is there any chance for them to finish before the exams start? Naruto frowned in concentration as he again compared his teammate's growth with himself. No. He spoke at length. They just have too much on their plate to completely finish the second step. That doesn't mean they won't go in with a fairly good knowledge of the material. I also plan to teach and have them master both offensive and defensive before the exams start. 
Well that's good to know, at least they'll have something before they go into the meat grinder. Naruto's ears perked up. Are the exams really that bad? Bakashi just laughed. Kid, the exams are on par with Anbu level difficulty, at least comparatively. Naruto paled slightly at why would the exams be that difficult? Well. Kakashi tapped his chin idly with his book. Special Jonin are assigned that rank by the Hokage and Jonin are either promoted through a written and practical exam by a one-on-one -on -one battle or through a field promotion. Anbu however are the village's black ops, the first and last line of defense. So it's only proper for them to have grueling training. And the Chunin? Junin make up for the vast majority of a village's militia. One of our spies did a count on the five major villages and found an interesting parallel between most of the major villages' military size. It's usually 30% active Jonin with an equal number both retired and in reserve, 40% Junin, 20% special Jonin and 10%. So they make the tests for the Junin as relatively hard as a suitably comparable Anbu test so that they can weed out the hopeless cases and pass on the ones who can continue to rise in the ranks. Correct. Naruto shrugged. Makes sense I guess. I know I wouldn't want an annoying emo and a useless fangirl watching my back. Oh he's so dead. Sakura and Sasuke thought at the same time. As if reading their minds the blonde maverick clapped his hands together loudly, breaking his two teammates' concentration. Alright. He yelled happily, spinning in place to show his two teammates the absolutely predatory grin on his face. Hands on practice time. An audible pair of gulps could be heard in the clearing, followed by an equally audible pair of girlish screams, only one of them being a girl. Inada skipped happily towards Ichirakus. Naruto had just invited her to the Raymond stand to tell her something important. Hinata for her part could only hope that her father had agreed to the marriage that they were going to have. If he didn't then Hinata was going to have a few words with him. She had finally got Naruto to look at her like she was somebody and not just a nobody, and she would be damned before he Ashi could hack that up for her. The fact that she had to share with Anko didn't bother her in the least, since she saw the other woman as like a big sister more than anything. Other women however. With an uncharacteristic and possessive growl for the young Hyuga girl, she stomped her way up to the stand to find her future husband. And find him she did, sitting next to and talking with two other women to either side of him. One she recognized as Tenten but the other she couldn't quite place. She couldn't have known of Haku seeing as she'd been busy with her team for the past few days, so the fact that Haku was now living with Naruto, along with the fact that she along with Tenten were now her future sibling wives, had not been explained to her. So Hinata took things entirely the wrong way. Naruto. Hinata spoke quietly, too quiet for most people, but with his superior senses the young Kayubi container could hear every syllable. And he shivered hard, his entire spine going ramrod straight. That was Hinata's voice, but laced with a threatening undertone. Hinata wasn't threatening, so if she did have that tone of voice. She was beyond pissed. Naruto turned around quickly to greet the angry woman. H hey H Hinata. He stood up, walking robotically over to her. Who are they? Hinata pointed a slightly twitching finger Haku and Tenten's way, clearly wanting an explanation as to why the blonde had been sitting between the two women and chatting so. Familiarly. Naruto in a rare moment of tact saw the oncoming shitstorm and decided to cut as much damage as possible from the confrontation as possible. Before I answer that, I have good news Hinata-chan. He quickly wrapped the girl in a hug, hoping that the good news would blunt her anger at having been engaged with two other women on top of the two he already had. Your dad said that he agreed and gave his blessing towards our wedding. He whispered happily into her ear. Anada's eyes flew wide at that, almost all of her anger gone. She grabbed hold of the blonde and in a display that would have surprised anyone who had known the timid Hayuga before, she brought her lips to Naruto's in a hard and passionate kiss, which lasted the better part of a minute, Naruto even felt the not-so-shy anymore Hayuga add a bit of tongue to the mix. Breaking the kiss with a triumphant smile on her face, Hinata dragged the boy to the Raymond stand and sat him in a chair just to one side of the two girls that Naruto had been sitting next to moments ago. Naruto finally snapping out of the daze he'd been put under, he sent a concerned glance to the two other women in the stand. Hinata. Naruto spoke slowly. I have some more news, depending on how you react to it. It could be good or bad. Hinata's glow seemed to dim a bit as she glanced curiously at the blonde. These two women here. He pointed to Haku and Tenten. You know Tenten. This. He nodded to Haku. Is Haku Yuki Mamachi. Now for the hard part. And they're both going to be marrying me. Naruto gulped when he saw Hinata's face go blank for a moment. He really needed to divert her anger right now. As you know Tenten is my best friend and had she known I was available, she would have dated me long before I saved you Hinata. That seemed to douse the beginning fires behind Hinata's eyes as she stared at Tenten with a look that was almost sad. And Haku over there is my cousin on my mother's side, she's been on the run for most of her life, and she's finally moved here to Kanoha to try and get her life back in order. 
Naruto was pleased to see the look of sadness in Hinata's eyes change to one of shock and then to what looked like a protective and motherly, if a little possessive look. Hinata quietly stood up and walked over to Haku, who was slowly leaning back in her seat, wary of the possibly volatile woman. She shouldn't have worried, Hinata grabbed the girl's face and in a daring move that stopped all movement in that tiny stand. Naruto, Tenten, even A.M. and her dad who had just come out of the back to serve Hinata, openly gaped in shock as Hinata locked lips with the mistress of ice. The full minute passed by where only the sounds of licking and sucking could be heard before the kiss broke. Seeing that Haku was now blushing heavily and in a daze the young Hayuga turned to her other target and like Haku before her Tenten fell to Hinata's oral skills. Naruto on the other hand was having trouble not passing out from a possible nosebleed, his brain telling him that this was something magical, while his could only concur. One of the rare times the two ever actually agreed. Hinata broke the kiss with Tenten and sat down next to Naruto, grabbing the blonde's tea and taking a slow sip, her eyes closed. After setting the cup down, she fixed Naruto with a blank stare, her lip twitching ever so slightly upward into a grin. Aku tasted like you, and Tenten has a distinctly earthy and woody taste just like you Naruto-kun. She turned back to her cup of tea and sipped it again. I accept them. At those words Naruto let go of a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding and turned to AM's father Tuchi. Gimme Raymond old man. Actually make that a double. Humming right up Naruto. The old man replied, wiping a small trail of blood from his nose as he disappeared back behind the flap of the kitchen. Tsu Aum broke in, strangely aroused at the sight of two women kissing in her Raymond stand and decided a little change in subject matter was in order. Naruto is marrying all of you? Aum asked curiously. She was one of the few people Naruto had trusted with the knowledge that he a crop participant, mainly it was to let Anko have someone to talk to about it, seeing as her best friend Kurinai and the better part of Kanoha's civilian and ninja population was unaware of this fact. Seeing a way to play a prank on Naruto when she noticed the four gen and nod, a devious little question came to the forefront, one that had been bugging her since Anko had told her about it the other day. Suo she began again, this time a mischievous smirk twitched on her lips. I heard from Anko that you're a demon in bed, is that true? A loud thump signified Naruto smashing his head into the countertop. So it's true then. A.M. looked between the three younger women at the table who could only blush and nod, having heard the story from Anko herself the moment she got any of them alone. A.M. could only grin hungrily at that. Hey, is there any more room in this relationship of yours? Another thump joined the first one, this time coming out as a loud harmony, and it signified that Naruto had raised his head and again bashed it into the table. The second thump however was of Tucci passing out in the kitchen, his body twitching violently, foam forming on the edges of his mouth. Aim smirked. Is that a yes? Naruto. Do I even want to know? Sasuke asked cautiously, passing the blonde in the street. Kayubi again looked like he'd gotten into a fight with ladies' beauty supplies and lost. Good things. The blonde mumbled as he walked by Sasuke. I don't know whether I should be jealous or not. The last Ichiha said numbly, faintly noticing a few markings on the back of the blonde's ass, which was just barely visible due to his disheveled state. It said property of. And there were at least four names that were somewhat visible to the Ichiha's eyes. Yeah, definitely jealous. Inside Naruto's head, um, interesting. A feral grin crossed the fox-turned human woman's face as she felt out her host's body. Should I tell Naruto-kun? Feeling a little devious, the fox woman turned away from her discovery. Nah, let him figure it out himself. A loud, evil laugh echoed through Naruto's mindscape, sending a slight shiver up the genin spine, despite his kiss inebriated state. Why do I feel like I'm going to be hip deep in something crazy soon? The blonde wondered to himself and not for the first time. Bakashi stared out over the field that his three students had used for their training grounds for the last four days. Naruto sat quietly against a tree, Sasuke not a foot from the boy in nearly the same position, with Sakura standing on the other side of Naruto, leaning against the tree casually. Bakashi had watched the threesome over the past four days grow as a team, Naruto pushing his two teammates relentlessly, showing them both a defensive and offensive technique, and then sicking a combined force of a hundred clones on the both of them to practice on. In two days, the pair had managed to master both techniques enough to be a genuine threat on the battlefield. Sasuke had learned the lightning release. Thunder Lance that Naruto had shown them not a week before, and like the boy had taken to it like a natural. The defensive technique Naruto had taught him made use of the boy's new armaments, ones that Naruto had bought and upgraded personally for the Ichiha. A close inspection revealed the new equipment. A pair of metal gauntlets that had a guard similar to an Anbu's, unlike an Anbu's the metal had a small seal Naruto had concocted on it that Sasu could store excess chakra into that allowed the last Ichiha to release a debilitating amount of electricity into his guards, and anything striking them would be shocked, much like the the boy was so fond of. As for Sakura, Naruto had to be a bit more subtle with her, seeing as she didn't have as much chakra to burn as the two boys. It didn't stop her from learning the water release. Syrup capture field. 
it wasn't much of an attack, but it did play a key part in Sakura's current attack style of bait and trap, which was shown by the girl's new equipment. Like Sasuke the girl had a pair of gauntlets and arm guards, with the same pair of seals placed on both. However, unlike Sasuke, her left hand seal held a large amount of water, taken from one of the lakes of Kanoha, and the right seal stored pure chakra, rather than lightning chakra like Sasuke's, which helped the girl pull off her defensive, the water release, hiding in water technique that the demon brothers had used against their team on the mission to wave. Naruto hadn't really needed the extra training since he was getting his training teaching the pair, however he did upgrade his arm guards like his teammates with the same seals on each, except both of his were chakra storage seals, since he could just create most of his from chakra alone. As for the three's teamwork. Well Naruto had a method to his madness when he chose to teach Sakura and Sasuke the elements they were currently working on. It all had to do with assisting elements. Elements like wind and fire created an even more powerful blaze. While elements like water and lightning made for just as deadly a combination. With Sakura taking tips from Kanoha's resident prankster and trapmaster, Naruto had gotten the up to running speed in utilizing those brains of hers and her syrup capture field to pin targets in an adhesive liquid. And like most liquids, it conducts electricity. Naruto and Sasuke on the other hand worked on their tojutsu, both of them going against Kakashi in a two-on-one duel to try and get their tag-teaming skills up to snuff, while Sakura held back, looking for an opening for her to pin their opponent with a syrup capture field or hit them in the back with her tepidama. Needless to say Kakashi didn't enjoy himself, the brats were just too damn devious to really take his eye off them for any length of time, which made his battles with them rather hectic, the fact that Sasuke was using his Sharingan and Naruto was using his tail of all things to perform, so the Kakashi could copy it himself, didn't have anything to do with his lack of enjoyment. Though he'd be lying if he said he wasn't proud of his students' growth, he did feel a bit left out of it, seeing as Naruto was the one teaching them the most. When he voiced this concern to his team he was genuinely surprised and delighted that even though he was chronically late and a bit of a perv, they still considered him a valuable source of information and training. Naruto actually got him close to the heart when he said that his skills were more for learning and application of gen, nin and tojutsu, while Naruto's skills were mostly on the theory of ninjutsu. It just so happened that theory taught a lot more on how ninjutsu worked, which was why people used beginner's books which mainly focused on theory to learn things, rather than advanced books on application of certain techniques, which could be very dangerous if not lethal, if they went into it without knowing the dangers. His kids, and he wasn't ashamed to call them that, had tackled the poor man and told him without any shred of doubt that they were glad to have him as their sensei, even with all his quirks, he was still a more sane teacher than my guy, whom the three had the displeasure to meet when he had shown up to challenge the scarecrow on more than one occasion. Smiling ruefully at the three who were just now picking up his presence. He hopped down and joined his team, waving to the trio in a rather carefree and relaxed manner. So. Are you three ready? At each respective nod the man could only fill with pride at how confident each of his students were. You kids will do great today, remember your training, Sasuke. The Ichiha gently nodded his head. Yeah I got it, keep a cool head, and don't let Naruto run headlong into danger, don't worry I got his back. Akashi turned to the rest of the group. Sakura. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on the two idiots. Akashi's eye again went into its patented U-shaped smile that told everyone around him that he was genuinely happy about something good you three, now get to the academy, the testing area is on the third floor. He tossed them a little salute before he disappeared in a shunshun. Well. Naruto shrugged. Let's go then. Minus ten minutes later, the kid's getting picked on by Asuna Shinobi, what do we do? Sasuke asked quietly, as the three genin watched a man in a black cat robe and face paint pick on a little kid that had bumped into him. I say we save the kid, Naruto interjected. He may have bumped into the guy, but that guy is being a massive about it. We could just ignore it and go to the academy. Sakura supplied. Sasuke shook his head nah, Naruto's got it right. Catman is being a bit of a about this. Sakura sighed, she hated being outvoted by the two hotheads. Alright, what are we gonna use then? Naruto asked quietly, watching as the catman threatened the kid with a punch to the face. Hurry, looks like Catboy isn't taking it too well. Arrow X formation? Ichiha asked. The blonde nodded. That'll do. Before he disappeared in a shunshun, Sasuke nodded and disappeared not a moment later. Sakura shook her head, muttering boys. Before sighing and following along at a more reasonable pace behind them. Below, the catman had reared back his fist to strike. Prepare for you lumps kid. He chuckled darkly before he froze, feeling the cold hard steel of a blade at the back of his neck, not a moment later a kunai appeared on his throat, the two blades crossing in a scissoring X formation. Finally a last kunai appeared on the other side of his neck, pointed first and with a hand on the first, he had ready to punch. You know. A calm, gravelly voice spoke up behind him, holding what appeared to be an injado to the back of his neck. It's not polite to hit people just for accidentally running into you. Hankuro. 
the pigtailed blonde woman behind the catman, now named Kankuro, gasped, preparing to grab a large war fan from her back. Don't move, girly. Sasuke growled, moving his kunai just slightly to place it even tighter against Kankuro's neck. Damari. Kankuro gasped. Do what he says. Drop the kid. Sakura growled from her position opposite her two teammates. Like the crack of a whip the San Genin's hand snapped open, dropping the kid to the ground unceremoniously. The kid got to his feet and scowled at the San Ninja. You'll regret doing that to me, I'll tell my grandpa to you. Kid, get lost. Naruto growled at him. Your grandpa doesn't need to get involved. My grandpa's the third Hokage. He yelled. Naruto for his part didn't flinch, however his two teammates had a surprised look on their face, while the two San Nin looked pale. After all, they had nearly caused an international incident with one of the Hokage's family. That would have been bad. Very, very bad. Kid. Naruto growled again. I don't care if he's your grandmother, get the hell out of here. Naruto focused a small bit of killing intent on the brat, which broke the kid out of his anger, his spine snapping taut as fear filled his eyes. By the way, brat. Learn to live off your own name instead of using your old man's for everything. If the boy heard what Naruto said, he didn't show it, but that didn't stop Naruto teaching the brat a lesson. Oh and learn to stand up for yourself or no one will see you for you, now Scram Naruto lessened his killing intent, and the boy, in a fit of terror, took off running. He would be spending the next few days thinking on Naruto's words, however, and inadvertently change the young boy's beliefs for the better. Not like the ankle biter really mattered much in this story anyway. Now. Naruto turned back to Kankuro. What to do with you? Kankuro, for his part, didn't even flinch at the cold tone the boy held for him, he did however flinch as a wave of killing intent washed over him from one of the nearby trees. Kankuro. A boy, not much older than any of the three leaf gen and droned, hanging upside down in the tree not a dozen feet away. You're a disgrace to Suna. Wait, don't do anything rash. The catman held out his hands placating to the red-haired youth who had just hopped down to glare at him. Kankuro. Shut up, or I'll kill you. The calm way the redeed threatened to kill the older boy sent shivers down the spines of Team 7. I'm sorry for my brother's stupidity. He nodded to the trio of Leaf Nin, staring intently at Naruto in particular. Not a problem. Naruto replied slowly, getting a really bad feeling about the redeed. He had felt that feeling before but couldn't quite place it. That's because the boy is a Kai who spoke up in Naruto's head. Outwardly Naruto kept his cool, only a slight twitch betraying him. Internally however. You mean that bastard is just like me he nearly screamed at her. Not quite. She waved her hands gently to calm the boy. From the feel of his power, he's probably the container of the one-tailed Tanuki, Ichibi. Ah so he's the one-tailed's container eh? Naruto grimaced a bit. It's not much better but at least now I know he's the runt of the litter, still. I can feel the bastard's bloodlust from here. True, and I wouldn't pick a fight with him just yet. Though I would tell him you know what he is and you'll see him in the exams, that'll draw the bloodthirsty little bastard off your teammates and anyone else in the exams. Yeah, cause we're the only ones who can really fight on his level. With an approving nod from Kayubi the Nine Tails leveled a small glare Gera's way. If you three are here for the exams, we'll be seeing you there. The redhead nodded and turned to leave. Hey, guy with the gourd. Naruto called out to him as the red-haired boy turned to regard him with a blank curiosity. Held the raccoon I said hi and let him know Kayu sends her regards. Naruto turned on his heels, feeling a sharp bloodlust behind his back as his teammates followed behind him. Behind them Gara's eyes went wide for a moment as the Shukaku inside him started screaming obscenities at the Kaiubi for calling him such a disrespectful name, then the Ichibi Jinchuriki's face took on an almost insane and predatory grin as his bloodlust shot through the roof, his two siblings backing away from him slowly so as not to tempt his ire. Wait. The Redeed yelled. Naruto looked over his shoulder at the boy, tensing slightly in case the redhead tried anything. What is your name? It's Naruto. The blonde Jinchuriki replied. Naruto Yuzumaki. Well then Yuzumaki. Gara growled evilly. No the Gara of the desert looks forward to spilling your blood later in the exams. Without saying another word the three sand ninja turned and left, going their own route to the academy. What was that about Naruto? Sakura asked quietly, shivering slightly from the faint traces of bloodlust still apparent in the air. Just making sure the bloody bastard doesn't go for either of you in this test. What do you mean Naruto? Sasuke prodded, staring at the backs of the sand ninja before they disappeared around a corner. Just what the hell is he? He's a Naruto ground out. He has the one tail sealed within his body. Sasuke and Sakura's eyes flew wide at that. He's what? Sasuke ground out, his body almost shaking in unrestrained fear as he remembered the sheer bloodlust the boy exuded. A shiver went up the Ichiha's spine, he had come very very close to picking a fight with a redeed himself if Naruto hadn't done it for him. Another shiver went up his spine as he looked back to where the sand team disappeared. 
He's a human who has a demon sealed within him Sasuke Naruto spoke quietly, still walking along, nearly leaving his team behind. And I just provoked him so that he'd go after me instead of either of you or the others in this test. Why in hell did you do that? Sakura screeched, momentarily going into her fangirl mode to pitch Naruto out. I did it. He rubbed his sensitive ears underneath his hat gently. Because I'm the only one who can fight at the bastard level. And what's that supposed to mean? Sasuke growled. He didn't like being considered weak, but Naruto almost did exactly that by claiming he was the only one who could take it. Him. A thought seemed to occur to the boy for a moment, something about what Naruto said. Naruto. Ichiha asked quietly. Why are you the only one who can face him? And who's Kai? Naruto only tensed slightly, his shoulders coming up defensively. I'll tell you both later Sasuke, let's just get to the academy quickly. Sasuke for his part accepted that, knowing his theory was almost positively correct now. Naruto's birthday, his age, the name Kai. That in the fox bloodline he had pointed to something more than just a mutation from being in close contact with the Kyuubi's chakra. That, and Sasuke never bought that half-assed explanation back when Naruto first showed up with his fox ears and tail. But, like the somewhat patient ninja that he was, he locked that bit of information in the back of his head for later, no use in creating a split in group dynamics when they could talk about this afterward. The rest of the walk to the academy was uneventful and silent, Naruto standing just slightly farther ahead than the rest of them, immersed in his own thoughts at the moment. However he was shocked to find Sasuke had sped up right before they reached the door to lay a hand on the blonde's shoulder and spoke calmly. Whatever it is that you're hiding Naruto, we're still a team and I won't hold any grudges against you. His grip tightened just slightly. So get out of that damn funk, we have an exam to win. Naruto stared at his teammate for a moment, his calculating gaze staring into the Ichiha's dark eyes. After a moment's thought the blonde nodded and placed a hand on Sasuke's shoulder as well. The two broke apart a moment later when Sakura started tapping her foot in irritation. We're going to be late if we keep stopping like this. She told them pointedly, and while she hated to be left out of the loop, seeing as that's what Naruto and Sasuke seemed to be doing, she could still see that teamwork was more important than stopping to talk about it right now. Right. The two nodded and opened the door to the academy. To immediately be assaulted by the noise of dozens of people talking and milling about on the first floor. Akashi sensei said the test was on the third floor. Naruto spoke quietly. Let's get by these idiots quickly. Passing by the main crowd of genin they made their way up the stairs, stealthily passing by on the second floor that had a number of participants stopped as they thought that it was the third floor. Team 7 ignored the obvious, as did a number of other teams who just looked at the pathetic teams who got caught in it and snickered. Since Team 7 completely passed by, they didn't notice Team Guy staring at their backs as they baited a number of teams into staying at the trap second floor. Denton stared at the back of her soon-to-be husband quietly while her two teammates sized up their possible competition. Back with Naruto and the team, they had finally made it to the third floor where they met up with Kakashi, who was grinning like a loon. I see you three made it. Yeah. Naruto chuckled. We did, though we did have some trouble from a team from Suna. Kakashi's only visible eyebrow raised slightly. And just what kind of trouble did you three have? Well. The blonde fidgeted slightly. One of them was kind of picking on the Hokage's grandson, and the redeed kid of the group is more than he appears. The eyebrow that was raised lowered into a deep frown. Normally he wouldn't have said anything about the Hokage's grandson, seeing as the kid was a bit of a brat, but when Naruto sounded concerned about something like he did with the red head, then something was clearly up. More than he appears. Naruto nodded. He's the weakest of the nine. Bakashi's eyes widened in worry. Was there anything in the exam other than Naruto? And Suna hadn't said anything about it. Yes, this was definitely a cause for worry. I see. Naruto, I'll tell the Hokage right away, go ahead into the exam room. And with a shunch in the left, leaving the three genin alone in the hallway. Naruto turned to his two teammates who were giving him a pointed stare. He shrugged off the glares casually grabbing the door to the exam room. Hey, I said I'll tell you later, let's just go inside. He noticed the two of them nod behind him and pulled the door open to reveal an entire room completely filled with ninja from all the various villages of the world. The quick count put it well over 150 ninja, which set Team 7 on edge as they walked quietly into the tension-filled room, each of the participants giving them a cold and calculating glare. Naruto. Hack Naruto grumbled mentally as a certain blonde fangirl latched herself around his neck from behind. Naruto-kun. A calmer voice replied, this one belonging to Hinata as she grabbed him possessively, glaring slightly at Ino. Oi Naruto. Tenten chuckled behind the blonde, laying an arm on his shoulder. Still covered in women eh Naruto. The condescending voice of Kiba spoke up behind him, chuckling at the blonde genin. And you're still covered in fleas I see. Naruto cracked back a wide grin on his face as he raised a fist up for the two to bump. Good to see you dude, Shino and I have been wondering where you've been lately. 
A nod from the bug user behind Kiba was all the greeting Naruto needed from him. Same here. Shikamaru broke in, coming up behind the group, Choji munching on chips like he always did. Naruto chuckled been training me and my teammates. You? Shikamaru nodded same, though it was a bit troublesome. So the gang's all here then? Kiba asked. The rookie nine. Don't forget team guy. Tenton cut in, waving at everyone as her two teammates appeared beside her. Hello, Naruto-san. Lee waved at him, throwing a small wink Sakura's way. Sakura threw up a little in her mouth. Naruto. Niji nodded politely to the blonde, though you could feel a deep tension between the two if you looked hard enough. That mostly had to do with Naruto knowing about the way Niji treated Hinata and Niji being an arrogant ass towards Naruto. But nothing else was said between them as a small coughing noise interrupted the group's greetings. You know, you guys should really keep it down. A young man in his early twenties approached the group, he was dressed in dark purple, his sleeveless shirt, pants and a long pair of gloves on his arm were all dusky purple in color, while he wore a regular white t-shirt underneath the sleeveless shirt and a tan cloth wrapping around his waist. A pair of round frame glasses finished off the look. Sasuke walked to the front of the group to get a good look at the guy. And just who are you? The name's Kabuto Yakushi, and really he pointed behind the group at the other applicants of the exam, who were glaring at the group as if they were a nuisance you should keep it down. Everyone here is on a really short fuse. He adjusted his glasses, the light catching the edges, hiding his eyes for a moment. I wouldn't want to be the one to set any of these guys off. He let out a low chuckle regardless. But, looking at you newbies reminds me of my first time here in the exams. This isn't the first time you've been here then? Sasuke asked. Nah. Kabuto chuckled. It's my seventh. Thiba snorted at that. Dude you must suck. Maybe. Kabuto adjusted his glasses again. But that doesn't mean I'm not well informed. He pulled out a stack of cards from his pack. These here are my nin info cards. He flashed the cards to the gen in there. And since I've taken this test so many times, I've built a large amount of information on just about everyone here. Ask away, who would you like to know about? Many of the gen in the room were curious, but the only one to really say anything at first was Naruto. Arav Suna he grunted, eyeing the bloodthirsty red head across the way. He wants to know about Yugara. Tamari chuckled, having overheard the kid who was really only a dozen or so feet away. The guy's kindle axi in a rugged sort of way, especially when you look at him from behind, she eyed the genin's ass for a few seconds, licking her lips. And judging by all the women around him he's a ladies man too. Interesting. Now that she really got a good look at the blondie she couldn't help but stare at him, his clothing doing little to hide his hardened muscles and well-toned body. And Kuro next to her shivered at the girl's lust-filled tone, he'd only ever heard his mother sound like that and that never boded well for his father. Back with Kabuto, Niji had walked forward with a curious gleam in his pale eyes. I'd like to know about Naruto Uzumaki of Kanoha the high Uga sent a not-so-hidden glare Naruto's way, which was matched by the blonde. Kabuto, not seeing any other takers, quickly pulled out those two cards. Oh it's a shame you already know their names, takes the fun out of it. Flipping the first card over he began to read out Gara's stats. Let's see. Gara of the Desert. 8 C ranked missions and 1 B ranked. Wow not many rookie shinobi get those. Kabuto hummed to himself in thought, since he's way out in the boonies, I don't have that much info on him, besides the fact that his two teammates Tamari and Kankuro are both his older siblings, no clue on their sensei. A rather interesting tidbit about the kid though is that he went through that entire B rank of his without a single scratch on him. A small silence went through the room at that, as even the other applicants turned a wary eye on the sand user. Now let's see. Naruto Uzumaki. Kami. The way Kabuto nearly dropped his info card immediately had everyone's attention. Naruto Uzumaki. Kabuto nearly shuddered. Graduated two and a half months ago with the other rookie nine, and in that time he's done 220 D ranked. A shudder went through the nin's body as just about everyone in the room looked at Naruto, as if he was insane. 44, C ranked. Again the people in the room looked at him like he was crazy. 1 B rank and 1 C turned into A rank. That got everyone's attention. Kabuto adjusted his glasses again and kept reading. He is the current head of two clans. The Uzumaki and one currently unnamed clan. He also has the last remaining member of the Yuki clan under his protection and is therefore the protector and patron of the Yuki clan. Has four reported bloodlines, one of which is supposedly sensory in origin. The second and third bloodlines are the, the Yuki clan's Haimten and the Senju Mokuten. The fourth bloodline allows him to use any bloodline elements consisting of any two of the five base chakra natures is attuned to all five base chakra natures. At this Kabuto shuddered again and looked at Naruto as if he was a freak of nature. Ninjutsu is off the charts. Hijutsu is high as his trap making and ninja tools. Kinjutsu and intelligence is above average. Low. Supposedly has a decent grasp on Fuinjutsu. Has cage level chakra reserves. 
spent five years living under the tutelage of Special Jonin and Assistant Torture and Interrogation Specialist Midarashi Anko. Teammates are Sasuke Chiha and Sakura Hirano. Sensei is the Kakashi Haddock of the Sharingan Eye. You could almost hear a pin drop in the deathly silent room after Kabuto read out Naruto's info card. In that silence Kabuto looked back and forth from the card to the blank face Naruto several times before he lowered the card completely and just stared up at the blonde genin, shocked beyond all measure. What the hell are you? He gasped out finally. Well. The blonde stated, slightly disturbed that this guy knew so much about him. And everyone, including his teammates and the other teams, were staring at him in both awe and in the case of the other village nin, outright fear. Going by your info. I'd say I'm the baddest mother hacker in the room. He shot the slack-jawed Kabuto a predatory grin before turning it on the room in general. All but a few of the occupants flinched away from him. Damn done when the hell did you do all those other DNC ranks, we just got back from our last mission like a week and a half ago, and you only had like 150 D and 5 C ranks then. Again it was almost deathly quiet. Several of the occupants in the room were nearly about to pass out from that information. While most of the others were thinking along the lines of that blonde brat did 70 D ranks and 39 C ranks in a week and a half. He's not human. A certain grass nin tucked away in the back of the room, licked her lips, a hungry grin on her face. During our time training, I took some time off and did a few missions. And hey. Naruto defended himself. I needed the money to pay for those damn gauntlets of yours. Besides, most of those C-ranks were in and out courier missions or clearing out a few bandits. Still dude. Kiba spoke in awe. That's like major overkill. While most of the men were planning to stay the hell away from the dangerous genin. Tamari along with most of the women in the room were nearly salivating at the blonde. 70 D ranks came out to around 35,000 Ryo and C ranks were usually around 4 times as much as a D rank, so 39 C ranks came out to around 78,000 Ryo, AN 3,500 and 7,800 United States dollars respectively, if Blondie could make that much cash in a little over a week, just think how much he could make over the course of a year. Even the women of other villages were starting to think that the boy was less frightening and more husband worthy by the second. In fact a few of the all-female teams were even plotting to try and kidnap the young genin for themselves and splitting him between them. None of their plans would work of course, but it was a nice try regardless. On the other side of the room a trio from Sound Village were thinking along the same lines, but for entirely different reasons. The spiky-haired one turned to his mummified-looking teammate Hey Dosu, you think Orochimaru-sama wants us to go after that brat too? Those who watched the blonde speak with his friends, almost as if there wasn't a room full of ninja that could and would kill him at a moment's notice. But Naruto didn't fool the man, he could tell by the way the blonde set his feet and the way he held his shoulders that the kid was ready for an attack at any moment. A calm and ready stance fit for a warrior. Dosu shook his head quietly. No Zaku, Arachimaru left specific instructions to go after the Acha. If he gives the order to go after Blondie later then we'll nab him. Shame really. The only woman on the team remarked. He really is quite the cutie. Shut a kin. Zaku hissed, causing the girl to flinch slightly. Unless you want a repeat of yesterday. The dark-eyed boy left that as the only warning. In fumed, staring at her two teammates angrily, cursing her fate having been stuck with the two abusive bastards. Maybe after this mission was done, she could find a nice quiet play in Rice Field and stay the hell away from everyone. The scars and bruises on her back only serve as a sharp reminder of the hospitality of her comrades. All right, maggots. A voice yelled as a thick cloud of smoke appeared in the room, blocking the view of the blackboard at the back, listen up and listen well, the smoke cleared to reveal a dozen and a tall scarred man wearing a large black trench coat. The name's Ibiki Marino, proctor of the first part of the exams. Ibiki seemed to glare at everyone in the room until each almost shivered under the man's gaze. Finally after glaring at everyone in the room, Ibiki held up a small tile with a number one on it. This here is a seat number. He tossed the tile into a bag and picked up a stack of papers from a small desk off to the side. You will come forward and pull a token from the bag. The number that corresponds to the seat in the room is where you will sit when we hand out the papers for you to take the written portion of the exams. He glared again. Now get in line and get your shit. A few minutes later we find Naruto in the front of the room, only a row behind the frontmost row, seated between Tamari and Hinata, with the rest of Team Guy and the rookie nine spread out evenly around them. Hinata could only smile at her good fortune. It's good to see we're seated together, Naruto-kun. Naruto grinned beside her. Yeah it's always nice to have a laxy lady next to you when you're taking a test. Naruto glanced over to the other side and was surprised to see the same blonde-haired girl from before. He never really got a good look at the woman, before seeing as he was too busy scaring the Begisus out of her catman brother or egging on her psychotic one. Now normally Naruto would have completely ignored the woman simply for the fact that she was the older sister of a mentally imbalanced and psychotic who spelled danger with a capital D for any interaction he had with her. 
but he had heard her talking about him earlier with his enhanced hearing, and the barely controlled lust in her tone had piqued the blonde's interest. A sly grin crossed the blonde's face, getting Hinata's attention. When the high Uga girl glanced his way he nodded slightly in Tamari's direction and mouthed play along. Hinata giggled quietly and nodded. Yeah, it's always good to have a laxy lady next to you. He turned his head to Tamari. Oh look, another laxy lady to bask in their companionship. Tamari turned to regard the blonde curiously. Are you hitting on me? Naruto turned to Hinata who nodded, smirking all the while. Naruto and her had a nice long talk after her little blow up after meeting Tenten and Haku and had come to an agreement. As long as Hinata approved of the women, Naruto could flirt with them and pursue them as he pleased. So far Hinata was lacking what she saw in Tamari. She also smelled like dusty earth, which reminded her of Naruto after he trained all day, always a plus in her book. Naruto turned back to Tamari and nodded to the affirmative that he was indeed hitting on the San Kanoichi. Don't you mind that my brother is a psychopathic murderer who would probably kill you the moment he has the chance. Tamari asked blankly. Naruto snorted at that nope, not in the slightest. I was trained by Anko Midarashi. That woman gets her chuckles by torturing and maiming people, your brother's crazy doesn't even compare. That was all the go-ahead Tamari needed. Her love life sucked because Gara scared all her would-be suitors off, and even when people had the courage to ignore him, they were still too afraid of her to even get close. With a vicious grab that caught Jinchuriki's collar, the sand Kanoichi crushed her lips to the other blonde's mouth. Naruto's head spun as her lips smashed into his dam she moves fast. The only thing the blonde could do was hang on for the ride, after a few seconds he got more into the kiss, and a few minutes after that Hinata surprisingly even got so bold as to join in, adding a third tongue to the mix. Those around the trio could only watch in silent wonder at their daring. Then back by a waterfall Jenanino was rubbing her legs together gently, watching the three go at a kami that is so hacking hot. How she wished Naruto would kiss her like that. To the far right Tenten was watching the trio with an almost predatory gaze. When Naruto had explained his situation to her after Haku had spilled the beans on him, at first the weapon's mistress had been skeptical, but after he had gone into more detail, Tenten had started to see all the potential benefits, having a large clan like what Naruto was shooting for. Not to mention, seeing her future hubby going at it with two other women was surprisingly laxy. Maybe it was just the blonde's pure animal magnetism at work. Whatever it was, Tenten neither knew nor cared, she was just enjoying the free show. A few rows in front of Ino, Kin was nearly choking on her own saliva, watching the three Jenin play tonsil hockey in front of the entire exam, proctors and all was making the girl go crazy. Ha cute, that kid's laxy as hell, and he's got balls as big as boulders to do that in front of a room full of shinobi. The sound of Kinoichi's hand slipped down unseen, trying to relieve herself of some of the frustration those three had created within her. Hack I need to get laid, Odo Shinobi are so prudish and freaking abusive. Sakura, who was on the opposite side of the room from most of the others, could only stare. She wasn't moving, was barely breathing, she was practically dead to the world. Only one thought passed through her mind during the entire thing. Why is Naruto making out in front of hundreds of people? And why is that turning me on? Sadly neither of those questions would be answered until much later. All the women of the room were in various states of arousal from the show. All the men were in various states of jealousy at the blonde maverick's incredible luck with the ladies. In the back row next to Shino, Sasuke was silent. He had been watching Naruto intently, still dead set on getting the blonde to answer his questions. Though to a less homolaxual degree he watched the three make out with a mild look of interest. Shikamaru was below Sasuke's row, ignoring it completely. Too troublesome. Tiba who was off in his own little corner of the room, could only shake his head. That lucky son of a bitch. Directly behind the trio by several rows Niji just huffed indignantly. Have they no shame? Toji nearly choked on his chips but was resuscitated with a slap to the back by Shikamaru, who had the good fortune of sitting next to his buddy. Shino was silent, but internally. Jealousy. How logical. Lee. Well aside from his eyes going more bug-eyed than normal, the young boy could barely contain himself as he nearly shouted out about the flames of youth. But Guy had beaten a bit of restraint into the kid, so he wouldn't get his team thrown out from him yelling too much. Arahu, like Kiba, was off in his own corner, could care less as he was in his happy place. It just so happened that his happy place was in a lake of blood, with ninjas begging for his mercy and not receiving any as he crushed the life out of them. Charming fellow really. Then Kuro on the other hand only a few seats away from the lovebirds was seething in an almost unholy rage. He was about to walk over to Naruto's seat and held the bastard himself, and it was only the threat of them getting kicked out and his brother killing him that stayed in his hand. Oh, but the blonde bastard would taste his puppet's wrath soon, oh so very soon. The two other sound ninja, having the good fortune of sitting together like Shikamaru and Choji could only watch, and used by Naruto's gal more than anything. As it stood the two women were sitting in Naruto's lap, making out in front of over a hundred well-trained killers, and despite that fact, no one in the room knew how to deal with it. 
Even Ibiki who had been explaining the rules of the test until the sounds of sucking and kissing got too distracting even for him. You three. He barked, finally coming out of his shock, pointing to the offending trio. What in the hell do you think you're doing? Naruto removed his lips from the two women to yell at him. Yo we heard you tall, dark and gruesome. No asking questions, no cheating, 10 points, cheating takes 2 points off, not answering a question takes 1. We lose our points. The entire team goes, final question 45 minutes from now. That still doesn't explain what you're doing. He barked. What's it look like we're doing asshole? We're not cheating and we're not asking questions so hack off unless you want me to take points from you for you asking us questions. Naruto turned back to his two babes as he flipped a picky off. Two points from your score. The man yelled angrily. Nobody would notice it seeing as Naruto was still sucking face, but the blonde had a delightful little grin on his face, they had gotten their tests a little while ago, and Naruto had spent a few minutes going over a little prank he was going to pull on Ibiki having heard from Anko-chan about the uptight head of I and T Naruto, was practically chomping at the bit to screw with the guy the moment he showed up. With the two women right next to him, it was a simple enough matter to pull off, and it benefited the both of them. Now to just bait Ibiki. And I care because why have a scar on my face? Naruto shot back snarkily. This point system is just a contrived way to make us cautious, but so long as I have one point, the rest of this shit doesn't matter. The special Jonin didn't have a comeback for that, aside from kissing two women the kid hadn't really done anything wrong, so in a way the kid was right, the points really didn't matter much, and Ibiki had taken the kid's points without any real reason besides him being a bit belligerent. It took a moment before Ibiki realized that the kid had actually gotten under his skin, a very hard thing to do when it came to the head torture and interrogation specialist. That was when Ibiki knew to back off, he wouldn't have some snot-nosed punk getting under his skin again. Alright, ignoring those three, the test begins now. Ibiki turned to grab a clipboard from the table next to him when a loud slamming of pencils nearly made Ibiki smack his head into the nearby wall as he was turning away from the exam participants. Slowly turning back to the trio he noticed that the three troublemakers had their pages turned face down, pencils atop them, and from what Ibiki could see on the back of the page, there was definitely a large amount of writing showing through on each. Ibiki's jaw dropped. That cheeky bastard set me up. He realized in shock. The kid already had his done, and the other two must have copied off him. That's why he didn't care about missing points. Papers done before the test even started just to make me look like a fool. Ibiki was too shocked to say anything for a solid 30 seconds before a feral grin crossed his face. He's got some stones I'll give him that Ibiki chuckled, nodding his head Naruto's way, signifying the brat had won this round before turning back and to what he was doing. Meanwhile in Naruto's head. Hit. That was awesome. I bow to your pranking skills this time, that look on Ibiki's face was priceless. Eh, he didn't know who he was hacking with. This test was easy compared to the shit Anko forced me to learn. If this was what the exam was going to be like all the way through. A dark and evil laugh echoed through Naruto's head, the mere thought sending shivers down the spines of everyone in the room. This was going to be fun. Chapter 16. Snake women, snake men and evil hickeys. Enko. What are you doing? Haku asked a snake mistress curiously, as she had been walking casually to meet the Hokage to find out what she should be doing now that she was a ninja of Konoha, when she had come across the snake mistress messing with a large cannon-like thing. What's it look like I'm doing? She snapped back, loading a large black tarp-like thing into the barrel. Honestly? I have no idea. Haku mused, looking over the contraption, then staring off in the direction the device was pointed. You're planning to launch yourself into the academy building, aren't you? Yep, they chose me to hack with some genin, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Well. Have fun with that. The ice mistress turned on her heels and continued her walk to the Hokage Tower. What the hell are you doing? Zabuza asked curiously, coming up on the snake mistress only a few minutes later, having the same idea as Haku, since they hadn't really been told what they should be doing right now with the exams locking down most of the higher ranked missions for them to do. What's it look like I'm doing? She snapped like before, getting a tad irritated that people kept asking her the same damn question. Hmm. Zabuza stared at the cannon, then looked over his shoulder at the building it was pointed at curiously. You're planning to launch yourself into that building over there. Isn't that where the exams are taking place? Yep, hacking with Jenin, getting paid to do it and Naruto is in the exams, so this is going to be fun. Eh, the Gaki is in this thing. I might just join you there. Nah. She waved a hand in front of her face. Too cramped, go chill at the tower in the forest of death, they're gonna have the next part of the exams in the forest of death. Zabuza snorted. They still have those there? Yeah and if enough people survive the forest they're saying that they might have some prelims this year, so if you want to watch some Jenin beat the snot out of each other's head there. Oh, I just might. The ex mist grinned fearily. If this is in this thing, he's going to wreck just about everyone. He chuckled again and walked off for the Hokage Tower. 
for all the people left in the room. Ibiki growled, staring out over the hopefuls, most of them holding their breath in one way or another. Mere moments before he had done his tenth question spiel and quite a few teams left, chickening out rather than take the question and risk their future. Those weaklings would never make it. But this batch. This batch held promise, especially the blonde idiot that had thrown him off his cool earlier in the test. Hell he still had the two women sitting in his lap. Lucky bastard. You all pass. The scarred man grinned, much to the confusion of the room. Hold you, pay up. Naruto chuckled under his breath as Kayubi started grumbling about troublesome blondes and their thrice damned luck. I'll pay you with some useful information later, why I tried to bet against you I'll never know. The grumbling continued as Ibiki explained the reason behind the test and yada yada yada. The old scarred bastard could yak like the worst of them, and to top it off he was totally boring while he did it. At least Sakura didn't give up, I was about to lay down the law when she started raising her hand, I guess she has more confidence in herself now. Suddenly Ibiki froze, glancing at the widows to his right. Not a moment later the windows shattered and a large black. Something flew in, throwing kunai into the floor and ceiling. Three guesses who that is. Kayubi chuckled. Naruto just snorted in agreement, even if he couldn't sense the woman's chakra, Anko had a very special way to make an entrance. Namely the batshit insane way. All right maggots listen up. The ball yelled still in its twirl to release Anko, while pinning up a sheet that had the words, the beautiful and laxy proctor of the second test has arrived. Anko Mitarashi. Proctors seem to love calling you all maggots, I wonder why that is. Hey who cares, I'm enjoying my laxy lady show right now. True, true. The fox nodded, watching Anko land on her feet after the sheet thing had settled. The name's Anko Mitarashi and I'll be your proctor for the second stage of the exams. Anko stared out over the group of hopefuls. Damn Ibiki, you must be slipping. 26 teams. I expected half that. Ibiki appeared from behind the sheet that had blocked his view of the room, a small smirk on his lips. Maybe we just have a good bunch this year, especially the blonde playboy over there. He raised a finger in Naruto's direction, and Anko's face lit up. Hey Gaki, how'd you do? She grinned. Heh, made out with two hot women in front of hundreds of ninja, and played a prank on Ibiki, you? Naruto chuckled as most of the genin in the room were giving them a curious glance. Anko chuckled nice, and you know me, I wouldn't pass up the chance to hack with some greenhorns. Naruto just shook his head. I know I shouldn't be surprised by that, so what's laxy? Where's the next stage of the exams? Anko snorted, you're gonna love this one, they pick training ground 44 this year. Naruto froze, then a small grin formed on his lips. Training ground 44. He let Tamari and Hinata off his lap, one knew what was going on the other was quite clueless. Oh this is going to be fun. Naruto cackled evilly. Wait wait wait. One random genin stood up staring at the snake mistress angrily. We heard earlier that you were that guy's sensei. He pointed to Naruto. He turned to Ibiki. Isn't that a conflict of interest? Naruto and Anko stood there for a moment taking in the genin's words, then looked back at each other, then back to the genin before busting out laughing, both rolling on the floor holding their ribs nearly dying of laughter. The genin that stood up now started in barely hidden shock then anger. What's so funny, that's a legitimate question, a proctor shouldn't have any attachments to the participants of the test, they could help them cheat. If anything the two's laughter increased. Oh ho 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 my kami, that is hysterical. Naruto laughed, finally making it to his feet. Listen here numbnuts. He poked a finger at the genin, the rest of the participants staring on quietly as the insanity unfolded. That woman over there. He threw a thumb over his shoulder at the still laughing Anko. Her idea of survival training is dumping you in the wilderness in the middle of winter in nothing but your boxers and a dull, rusty kunai. He fixed the genin with a playful glare. So don't think she'll go easy on me in this test, if anything she'll make it harder on me just to make this whole thing more interesting for her. Naruto glanced over at Anko who was just now getting to her feet. By the way did you start a betting pool on how many asses I kick this time around Laxi? Anko snorted. As if, I learned my lesson last time when you cleared out all our wallets with that stupid stunt you pulled. How many Anbu did it take to catch you at that time, 26. 27. He corrected her, walking over to the woman. Shocking all the people in the room again at how he could evade so many high-level ninja. So let's get this hacker started, Gaki away. Naruto yelled, leaping out the broken window. You heard the she hooted, leaping out the window after the blonde. Need us a training ground 44. Laxi away. The room was silent for a good minute before anyone even tried to say anything. Anyone else disturbed by that? Kiba spoke in the deathly quiet room. A chorus of nods answered him. Welcome everyone Anko raised her hands in front of the gate to training ground 44. To the forest of death. She cackled as several flashes of lightning and evil laughter appeared out of nowhere, despite the fact that it was a sunny day and no one was in the forest yet. What the heck was that? Kiba shouted. Oh Naruto grinned, his fangs creeping over his bottom lip, making it almost feral. 
It's just the natural ambience of the place. And how would you know? Um. Naruto rolled his eyes and shook his head like Kiba was an idiot. I think I'd know where my house is. Kiba's jaw dropped. You live in there he pointed to the densely packed tree line where loud yips and howls of large predatory animals could be heard. What the heck is wrong with you? Rumors came from most of the people around them as Kiba started bitching about how unfair this all was. Oh quite being a chicken shit Kiba Naruto walked to the edge of the fence and threw a kunai into one of the limbs of a tree about 20 yards away. A small screech came from within, followed by a small rustling as a house cat sized bug of some unknown variety fell out. See. Naruto turned around to face the other genin. Just keep an eye on your ass and you'll be fine. As much fun as watching you scare Jen and Gaki. Anko broke in, holding up a stack of papers. You all need to sign these release forms before we get the test started. The couple calls of why. Came from a few of the genin. Because she spoke cheerfully. If you guys don't sign it and die in there Kanoha will be liable for your death and we can't have that. A couple loud gulps came from some of the greener teams, but an equal number of glares met the woman's own, showing that a good portion of the genin didn't care for her threats. She held up two scrolls one black the other white. These two scrolls are what you're going to be fighting over in there. Heaven and earth. You'll need one of each to continue on to the third part of the exams, each team gets one, and you'll only get it when your entire team has signed their consent forms. The old axie, Naruto yelled from. What are the rules of engagement in there? Can we do whatever the hell we want or what? Shut it, I was just getting to that. She held up a scroll with a map of the area on it. Training ground 44. A ring of forest 10 kilometers from its center in every direction, a tower sits in the center of the forest, along with a river that runs through most of the training ground. You have five days to get the other half of your scrolls and make it to the tower in one piece. If you lose a teammate during the test you're automatically disqualified. If you leave the forest before the time limit is over you're disqualified, and if you look at the content of your scrolls before you reach the tower you're also disqualified. Why is that last one disqualify you? Tenton piped up from the back. Anko turned an irritated glare at the mouse bun haired girl. Because girly, sometimes ninja are entrusted with confidential information, so this will be a test on trustworthiness, but don't forget that this is first and foremost a survival test. She glared at all the people in the clearing. You'll be facing both nature and each other there. So the last piece of advice I'll give is she turned away from the group handing the stack of papers to a couple for distribution. Don't die. She waved behind her as she walked off to mingle with the others there. She is such a badass. I know, it makes me all tingly inside knowing that I can tap that whenever the hell I want. Naruto stared after his first wife, her trench coat doing little to hide her firm derriere from his hungry gaze. Alright Romeo, go sign your papers and let's go crack some skulls. Alright alright. Naruto chuckled internally walking with his team over to the booth to turn in their consent forms for a scroll. Half an hour later we find every team at their own gate surrounding the forest. Naruto, you got our heaven scroll safe. Yeah Sasuke. The blonde whispered. It's in a seal on my arm. But Sasuke nodded. Keep it close and let's go after the first team we can, I say we hit that sound team, they were radiating killing intent our way all through the first exam. Hey, hey, we'll hit whoever we find, unless it's a team from Kanoha. We don't fight comrades alright. His two teammates nodded to the affirmative. The loud siren rang out over the area and the gate snapped open. Alright. Naruto pumped his fist. Let's go kick some ass. As each team rushed into the forest. You know the plan. Akusa Jenin hissed to her two teammates as they rushed through the gate. Separate them, but leave the blonde one, he's caught my interest as well. Yeah. The two agreed. Naruto Yuzumaki. You've just become very interesting Kuki Kuku. That was easy. Kiba barked, grabbing the earth scroll from a trapped team of Jenin only a few minutes into the test. Yes, it was. Hinata agreed, Shino nodding next to her. Well we've already got our scroll, let's head for the tower. Hi, Uo, please no, have mercy. An nondescript shinobi pleaded. No. Gara drowned. Sand burial. Ah, and there goes another one. Kankura grimaced. How many does that make now? Eight. Tamari scrunched her nose up as another wave of blood rocketed up into the air, make that nine. Gara must really be excited for this exam, I haven't seen him kill this many people in a long time. Hey, it's probably that Yuzumaki brat you were kissing earlier. Kankuro gave the woman a scandalous look. Seems the brat really got under Gara's skin. Oh shut up Kankuro. Tamari huffed. Naruto is cute, and since Gara is Gara, I haven't been able to get a date, ever. I'm taking what I can get. Tamari. Gara's dull voice asked behind her, making the woman jump at how close he was, Kankuro was praying for her soul and sanity as they spoke. Do you like that Yuzumaki boy? Tamari turned to stare at her sand using brother cautiously as he approached her, the dried up husks of his latest victims lying behind him. Why yes. She nodded slowly, slightly concerned by the way that he was looking at her. I see. 
He turned away from his two siblings and started walking towards the tower. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't kill him then. Perhaps I should only torture him. He mused to himself, walking back over to another down shinobi and squashing him like a grape. Ankuro and Tamari were walking behind him when Kankuro whispered to Tamari, did Gara just say he wasn't going to kill something? I, I think so. I'm scared of Tamari. Me too. Contact. Naruto whispered, stopping his teammates. In the trees ahead and to our right. Naruto had removed his hat allowing his ears to poke out proudly, providing a better understanding of their surroundings. What do you want to do? Sasuke asked. I'm going to sneak around and take him from behind. Naruto sensed ahead for a moment before creating a shadow clone. Keep walking forward and pretend he's not there. Sasuke and Sakura nodded, grabbed the clone and kept walking, while Naruto himself used his hours of hide and don't get stabbed training from Anko to sneak up on a lone named Shinobi, who was watching his teammates and clone, looking for a place to strike. Not even bothering with killing the poor bastard, he snuck up behind the oblivious Genin and struck him in the back of the neck, knocking him out. Grabbing him before he fell to his death, Naruto hopped down to his teammates. These guys really need to learn to be aware of their surroundings, Naruto asked. I almost feel bad for this guy. Yeah, but he's still an enemy. That's why I said almost Sasuke Naruto dug through the genin's pouch and pulled out an earth scroll. Ha, this dumbass had the scroll on him, how stupid can you be? Naruto just shook his head. Now that we got both our scrolls let's make like a ninja and get the hack out of here. After 30 minutes of tree hopping the team landed on a large branch to take a breather. Alright, we're almost halfway there already. Naruto pointed ahead of him and to the right. Up ahead about 1500 meters is the river that goes through the center of this place. We reach it, then haul ass to the tower, hopefully we'll be the first ones there, and there won't be anyone waiting for us, if there is then keep your eyes peeled alright. A pair of nods answered him. Good, now since you two don't know your way around here we'll go over the general topog Naruto suddenly stiffened, eyes going wide. Almost immediately ten clones of him phased into existence and spun around, flashing through hand signs at a speed neither of the two genin behind him had seen from him before. Naruto then inhaled deeply, gathering an immense amount of chakra for a genin, hell immense for most even. Just then a loud roar could be heard, and looking farther into the dark forest Sakura and Sasu could see a large force of some kind tearing through the tree limbs, snapping the several foot thick branches like toothpicks. Wind release. To top all ten Naruto's exhaled at the same time, sending a similar technique out, which formed into one large wave of wind. The two techniques clashed, pushing against each other for several long seconds until Naruto's technique failed, which surprised both his teammates. Thankfully the other wind technique had lost most of its power during the collision. It still would have knocked the three genin off the branch they were standing on if they hadn't anchored themselves to the tree with chakra. The three genin were just getting back to their feet when a distinct clapping was heard. Good, very good. A dark chuckling laugh echoed around them, none of them able to pinpoint it, until a woman with a kusa headband hopped down from a tree above and towards where the other Tatapa had appeared from. I didn't expect that to be stopped so easily, you continue to impress Naruto-kun. A suffocating killing intent washed over the area as the woman leveled a playful glare their way. How about we play a little game? She chuckled evilly, the killing intent nearly doubling, sending Sakura to her knees, Sasuke was having a better time of it, having felt Naruto's killing intent on the bridge in waves, and Naruto was standing there, beads of sweat forming on his brow. Thing was putting out almost as much killing intent as he could manage at full anger. And the blonde didn't think that this woman was even a little miffed about anything, so this was all just. Fake. That thought sent a shiver of fear down the normally fearless Jinchuriki's spine. Sasuke stared at the woman, taking several deep breaths to calm his beating heart as several images of his painful death flashed through his mind. What the hell is this guy? He's putting out so much killing intent it isn't even funny. He stared back at Sakura, who had almost passed out from the pressure the woman exuded. A quick smack to the cheek roused her however. A Sasuke. Sakura blinked, rubbing her aching cheek, then her eyes again landed on the Kusa Genin. We have to get out of here, she's too dangerous. Kukukuku, the girl there is smart I see. A wicked grin spread across her face. But it won't matter regardless, you'll never outrun me. A predator always catches its prey one way or another. The bloodlust pouring off of the woman by now was starting to affect the animals around them now. Sasuke, get ready to fight, I don't think this bitch is kidding, I doubt I'd be able to outrun her. A tense nod answered him. Good, you at least know when you've been cornered and when to fight at your best. The woman chuckled in that strange throaty chuckle she seemed to enjoy using. Sakura. Naruto whispered behind him. Keep out of this fight, lay some traps if you think they'll help but don't try to fight directly. Another nod answered him. Kukukuku, I think it's time we begin. The woman cackled, rushing forward to strike at the three genin. 
the three scattered Sakura falling back to hide in the surrounding trees and lay some traps, while Naruto and Sasuke leapt to the side, with the Kusajen in between them, Sasuke, fire, right. The two flew through several hand seals before bringing a hand up to their mouth. High release. Great fireball technique that breathed out a torrent of flames at the same time, immolating the spot where their attacks met. When the flames cleared there was no sign of the enemy genin. Did we get her? Sasuke asked cautiously. I highly doubt that, Naruto replied, that would be too easy. You're right. A voice whispered in his ear. Naruto's eyes widened. Reacting on instinct, already on the tips of his fingers striking out behind him, what he didn't expect was the woman to dodge the surprise attack like it was nothing. Going low into the serpent stance Naruto launched a dozen strikes at the woman, both hands powered by a taser. However, every strike was dodged or diverted in a shocking display of skill, something that was on par with Jonin level to jutsu or higher. The woman laughed in his face as he tried desperately to land a hit. You seem to be having trouble with Naruto-kun, maybe I should help you. And by help she meant placing her foot right into Naruto's sternum, stopping his forward momentum cold, eyes flying wide as blood flew from his mouth. Naruto. Sasuke yelled, dropping down from above to land a kick to the Kusa Genin's head, only for it to turn to mud under his strike. Hack. Sasuke ran over to his down teammate, helping him to his feet. That woman isn't normal. You're telling me. Naruto grunted, rubbed his bruised ribs. She hits like a damn jonin, and if I hadn't run a bit of earth chakra through my bones at the last moment, I'd probably have a couple broken ribs right now. Naruto pulled himself from Sasuke's grasp, favoring one side of his body. We need to come up with a plan, you think I'll give you the chance? A voice said behind them slamming a foot down into the place they were standing just moments before. Spider web-like cracks formed in the wood as the two genin leapt forward, spinning around into a crotch to face the woman. You both have nice reflexes, but you need to be more aware of your surroundings. The woman scared slightly. Come, both of you show me your keke genkai and make this fight a little more interesting. The two boys glanced at each other for a moment before nodding. One's eyes turned a bright crimson, while the other started going through several hand signs for an elemental. Brushing forward Sasuke pulled out several shuriken and threw them at the grass nin, who easily dodged a straightforward attack. Grunting in irritation the Achiha pulled out a kunai. The two ninja met in a clash of steel, the woman holding a kunai in her hand as well. Show me what those eyes can do. She hissed hungrily, making Sasuke shiver slightly, but he wouldn't back down from anyone, especially not this pedo bitch. The next few seconds were a frantic clash of steel and tojutsu, as Sasuke used what skills he had and the foresight of his Sharingan to block, dodge or otherwise deflect the Kusa Genin's incoming attacks. But despite his best effort and superior eyes, the woman was just too skilled, too strong and above all too fast. You alright Sasuke? Naruto pulled his teammate to his feet after he was knocked back by the Kusa Genin. I've felt better he turned a glare on his teammate. What the hell were you doing while I was getting my ass kicked? Naruto rolled his eyes. Planning, you ass. The bitch has an amazing tojutsu style. Naruto narrowed his eyes, speaking loud enough for the woman to hear. Snake style if I'm not mistaken. Naruto had a hunch on who the woman actually was, after all, there were only three living practitioners of the snake style currently alive, and only one of them would be able to pull off a jutsu of that power. Kukukukukuku the woman chuckled. Very perceptive of you, I guess Anko-chan taught you my style fairly well from what I saw earlier, you modified it for your body type if I'm not mistaken, correct? Correct, Arachimaru. The woman laughed again, reaching a hand up to her face to grab the skin there, and in a sickening display, ripped the skin from her face to reveal the pale skin and yellow eyes of Anko's hated teacher. Was I really that obvious Naruto-kun? The now male voice hissed, amused. Only one person other than me and Anko knows the snake style, and only you're strong enough to force a wind like mine back with one of your own. How very perceptive. Arachimaru clapped his hands together a couple times mockingly. That still doesn't change the fact that you're fighting me now does it? A vicious gleam came to his eye as he stared down the two genin. Naruto tensed. Here he was, the bastard that had made Anko's life hell, and he couldn't do a thing about it, just the man's presence was making his bones hurt. There was still a vast plateau of power difference between him and the snake sand and Narachimaru knew it, he was just toying with them. Sasuke. Naruto whispered. We need to distract him long enough to get the hell out of here. There's no way in hell we're taking Arachi hacking Maru in a straight up fight. I'm all ears, what's the plan? Twin Hook, followed by Horfrist. You think we can do that then make a run for it? Sasuke ran the plan through his head for a moment before nodding. You better make it massive though, I don't think this guy's notices anything but wide scale and highly destructive. Can do. Go. Naruto and Sasuke rushed forward, each running to one side of the massive limb coming at the snake Sanin from the side. Naruto pulled out his ninjato, running wind chakra down the blade. Sasuke did the same with the kunai and lightning chakra, Naruto, having shown him how right before the exams. What are they up to? 
Orochimaru wondered curiously, dodging the strikes the two genin tried to land on him, knowing he wouldn't be able to block the element-enhanced blades, falling back a few feet the man regurgitated his katana from a snake within his mouth. Now, brandishing his longer blade the twin attacks from the two genin let loose a ring of steel on steel. Naruto. Sasuke yelled as his kunai was knocked aside by the kusanagi, the only thing saving him from being stabbed was Naruto's ninjato having to be blocked instead. Added. Naruto yelled, forming several hand seals. Eight clones flickered to life, four shadow and four water clones, each of them pairing off and surrounding Orochimaru as Sasuke and the original Naruto leapt back. The four water clones in the front held up a single hand seal. Water release. Kurigakur no jutsu the air in front of them filled with a heavy mist. The clones behind the first set grabbed a hold of their water clone cousins and yelled ice release. Dehimbakuha and a loud bang the shadow clones exploded, spraying the remains of their brethren at the hidden mist, the mist then began to freeze rapidly as the Heimton took effect, encasing the area surrounded in mist in a solid block of ice. The two genin glanced at each other for a moment before they turned tail and ran, booking it as quickly as they could to the tower, the two tensed slightly when a rustle of bushes sounded from their left, but they relaxed a moment later when Sakura appeared next to them. Do you think that will hold him, Naruto? Sakura asked quickly, falling in line next to the fleeing duo. If it doesn't then I don't know what will. Naruto replied. Sasuke stared behind them, Sharingan still active. Just who was that guy Naruto? Naruto glanced over at his teammate. What, you didn't pay attention in history class Sasuke? Sasuke shrugged. Did you? Duche. Naruto conceded. Well. You two at least know of the title Sanin right? A pair of nods answered him. Well that was Orochimaru, the snake Sanin, and one of Kanoha's most wanted missing nin. Here Naruto's face twisted in a scowl. He's also my sworn enemy and a damn pedophile as well. And what the hell is he doing here? Sasu cursed. Seriously, why the hell was a missing nin and a sanin of all things hacking around in exam of all things? Orochimaru's a scientist, Sasuke. Naruto spoke tonelessly. And that's a very loose definition of the word. A grimace crossed his features. The guy experiments on anything he has an interest in, his biggest dream is to master every ninjutsu in the world. That's impossible. Sakura said. Yeah. Naruto agreed for any mortal and normal person. But one of Orochimaru's biggest experiments was a way for him to cheat death, and above that were his experiments on bloodlines, so that he could gain access to all spheres of elemental techniques, that means my bloodlines, and your eyes are probably a big interest to Sasuke. A shiver went up Sasuke's spine. If that bastard wanted his eyes then he'd have to pry them out of his cold dead eye sockets first. Another shiver went up his spine when he realized that the man probably could and would do that anyway. Let's just get out of her Naruto. Sasuke refocused back on the path ahead just in time to duck a kick aimed at his head. Naruto wasn't so lucky. The blow blindsided the blonde genin and launched him towards a tree where he slammed into the bark of the aged wood, sending spiderweb cracks through it as the blow to his head knocked him out cold. Standing where the blow had struck was a very frayed and very pissed Orochimaru. His clothing was ripped in several places and there were even a few red lines of blood where his skin shedding ability hadn't healed all the damage the blonde brat had dealt him. He hadn't expected a mass exploding ice clone hidden mist combination, hell he had never even heard of the two techniques being used together before. I grow tired of these games. Orochimaru growled, approaching the Achiha menacingly. Sasuke backpedaled away from the powerful man, quickly going through hand signs for a lightning release. Thunder Lance he had to settle for using the lightning chakra for a taser as Orochimaru rushed, launching several punches and kicks, setting the boy back on his heels. Sasu cursed as he ducked under several strikes that would have definitely broken something, had he not used his eyes to divert the path of the attack just slightly. Flicking a quick glance back at his teammate, he couldn't help but curse again seeing the unconscious Yuzumaki laying against the tree he had struck. Damn it Naruto I could use some help. Naruto of course heard none of this, unconsciousness could be a right bitch sometimes. Meanwhile in Naruto's busted up head, ugh. What the hell hit me? Orochimaru hit you, and you are suffering from a concussion where you struck that tree Kayubi's voice responded quietly, trying her best not to aggravate the blonde's already serious wounds. Wonderful. Naruto rubbed his head gently, already feeling the phantom pains from his conscious mind, as they told him in no uncertain terms that shit was hacked up. Kayubi noticed his discomfort and approached him from behind, laying a hand on the blonde's head, sending a small bit of her chakra there to stop the pain. I'm already sending chakra through your body to help heal the damage, but it won't be fast enough to continue your fight against Orochimaru. Her voice was subdued as she relayed this information to him. Damn it. Naruto curse. If only we could make it to the tower and back up. He laid his head in his hands and rubbed it gently. Do you think flooding my system with your chakra would work Kai? He spoke finally, raising his head from his palms. At least enough to charge me up and scare the bastard off. 
The red-headed vixen hemmed for a moment as she mentally surveyed the damages to Naruto's skull. It could work, but it's going to hurt after you get done with it. Doesn't matter. He growled. I just need to spook the bastard off until we can get reinforcements. Very well. She motioned him over to her where she laid one of her delicate hands on his head. This may sting a bit. A red vapor-like chakra formed in her hand before it flowed into Naruto. It started as a pinching pain, but then grew to a ragged clawing at the boy's skin as he let out a strangled. Naruto's eyes snapped open in the real world, a growl of pain and anger erupting from his chest. His eyes fell on his teammate Sasuke, who was twitching in pain at the snake Sanin's feet, a dark try of marks forming on his neck in the shape of three tomo. Damn it, he marked Sasuke. Naruto growled in fury, releasing some of his killing intent the Sanin's way. Orochimaru glanced over at Naruto for a moment in curiosity. Ah, I see, so that's who you are. He mused abashedly. I always wondered who they stuck the Kyubi into and here's living proof. He chuckled evilly as he watched a rich red chakra erupt from Naruto's body, his fox ears and tail erupting out of his clothing as the ethereal chakra formed around the appendages. The Budokun said that you had a sensory bloodline, but I never expected it to be something like this, truly you are an impressive little mon whatever else he was going to say was lost on the Sanin, as several dozen spears of electricity dug into the tree where he was standing, separating him from Sasuke by a wall of jagged lightning. Creating a clone, Naruto had it retrieve Sasuke as he faced Orochimaru down. To his credit the snake Sanin at least had the mind not to watch as the clone gathered his creator's teammate. Instead the traitor kept his slitted yellow eyes on his opponent's slitted red ones. As soon as the two cleared the field and the lighting spears dissipated the two titans clashed, Orochimaru with his skill and knowledge and Naruto with his raw chakra density and power. On the sidelines Naruto's clone found Sakura huddled around the side of a tree nursing a wound on her leg. She looked up quickly expecting the snake was coming after her, especially with the dense killing intent nearby, but she relaxed slightly when she saw that it was Naruto carrying Sasuke's unconscious body. Will he be alright? She asked the clone quietly. Yeah. The clone answered. That bastard Orochimaru just gave him a cursed seal, the boss's seal lit up tight after he gets done wiping the floor with the bastard's sorry ass. Your clone. She then glanced around the tree to catch a glimpse of the two terrors clashing farther away in the forest. She caught a glimpse of Naruto, sheathed in a deep maroon cloak of chakra, with his tail and ears extended out further than normal by said chakra. Yeah, boss had to call on Kayubi for help. He replied absently, before what he said seemed to truly register. He stiffened and sent a glance at Sakura's way, but was confused when he saw how casually she was handling it. I already knew, at least somewhat. She replied to the clone's look. Sasuke talked to me about it on the way here to the forest. It doesn't take a genius to put two and two together with Naruto. The clone chuckled. Then you must have come up with it rather easily since you're a genius after all. Before a serious look crossed his face as he watched the battle between his creator and the snake Sanin, committing to memory all the bastard moves used so he could analyze his and styles used, maybe figure out how to add them to his arsenal later. A blush crossed Sakura's face at the clone's praise, remembering quite clearly how Naruto had explained that his clones were basically an extension of himself, anything they said or did would be what he would say or do if he were in their place. And knowing that her teammate valued her intelligence like he did made the girl's heart flutter slightly, she had been rather withdrawn from everyone since the mission to wave, but somehow, someway the blonde idiot that was her teammate was warming his way into her heart. The girl didn't have time to think over these feelings as a large explosion rocked the surrounding trees. Kukikuku, not bad Naruto-kun, I dare say you have more potential than Sasuke-kun, maybe I should mark you as well. Sanin's tongue crossed his lips as he damn near salivated at the blonde in front of him. This boy would make the perfect vessel for him, with the boy's complete elemental affinity and Sasuke Sharingan eyes, he would be unstoppable. The mere fact that the boy seemed adamant to stay within his own body did nothing to discourage the traitor, not even when he started throwing a low-ranked offensive of every element the Sanin's way. Several shards of ice and stone stuck from the trees around him, there were also several smoking holes in those trees, where an errant lava or fire release had burned away the bark, also quite apparent were the disintegrated and rotten pieces of tree that had succumbed to his lightning or boil release techniques, missing the sanin completely of course. Hell, not even the grasping branches and clawing limbs from Naruto's wood release had stopped sanin's mad grin as he forced his quarry back on his heels. I think it's time this little game came to an end, Naruto-kun. We both have places to be, people to kill. Orochimaru's face grew predatory. Bring it snake face. Naruto growled, slipping into a stance, his blade and body thrumming with all five elements, bringing him close if not up to par with a jonin in raw power and speed. Orochimaru grinned, rushing forward with his kusanagi drawn, clashing against Naruto's element-enhanced ninjato, unleashing a shockwave of power that threatened to overtake everything in the area. This power is incredible. Orochimaru practically painted in excitement. 
he was going to mark this boy as his next physical vessel, and the Ichiha boy would his new eyes, just the thought sent shivers of sick pleasure up the snake's spine. All he needed was an opening to get a bite in, just one opening that he could exploit. That moment soon came when Naruto flinched in pain as Kyuubi's chakra started to take its toll on him. He had spent the past 10 minutes throwing power at Orochimaru, and it was starting to drain his own reserves and allowing the corruptive powers of Kaiyu's chakra to eat away at his body. He knew he was finished the moment Orochimaru flew through several hand seals, his neck elongating and shooting through the half dozen feet between them to latch his fangs into the blonde's neck. Ah! Naruto gasps, already feeling the dark, corrupting chakra enter his system. Kaiyu. Drop what you're doing and memorize whatever the hell snake hack is pumping into me, you know as much about seals as I do so try and memorize how the curse mark sets itself in. He would have said more, but pain overwhelmed him as Orochimaru's mark started to burn and force him to his knees. He was glad to feel more than hear the fox woman's nod that she would do so. Naruto was done for the fight that was apparent, but he wasn't done getting his final licks and that's for damn sure. But the final rush of energy the genin grabbed Orochimaru's neck in a vice-like grip, using what little of Kayubi's chakra he had left, then with a roar of defiance, he brought his ninjato up and through the traitor's neck, severing the thing from the bastard's body. Naruto however didn't think for one moment that he had killed the man, reaching up, he grabbed the bastard's head and tore it from his neck, tossing the thing over towards his body. Naruto glanced at his shoulder where a fair portion of the pain was coming from to see the three telltale tama marks on his flesh. You got this shit memorized Kayu. Yes, Naruto-kun. This is a very nasty seal, and I can already feel it trying to corrupt your chakra. I've sent my chakra to the area to limit its movement for now and give you some breathing room, but you'll need to rest soon. Dotted Naruto attention was brought back to Orochimaru's supposed corpse, as the thing seemed to shake and stretch for a moment before, in a spray of juices and gore, another Orochimaru seemed to rip itself out of the throat of his body, to the shock and disgust of the ones watching. That was a nice try, Naruto-kun. The man clapped slightly, on the outside full of bravado and self-assurance, but on the inside he was silently thanking whatever gods were looking out for him, since the boy had come awfully close to killing him at that moment of weakness. A crooked smile crossed his face. The moment of weakness was now gone, and the boy was on his knees at his feet, where he should be until the snake Sanin could eventually swap bodies with the boy. Well, I think it's about time I made my exit. The man backed up against the tree behind him. Till next we meet Naruto-kun. The man seemed to fuse with the tree until his form disappeared completely from view. Hacking bastard. Naruto grunted, still in an abnormal amount of pain as he made his way to his teammates. Once there he received a very teary hug from Sakura, who had witnessed him getting bit on the neck and thought the worst. Don't scare me like that you baka. She cried into his torn shirt as the boy patted her on the back, to be perfectly honest he was really out of his element at that moment. Sorry to interrupt the boss, but I think it's time we get the hell out of here, those explosions were bound to bring some of the more bouncy teams in, and I for one don't want to stick around here for longer than I have to. His clone had already picked up Sasuke and had him over one shoulder like a sack of potatoes. Yeah. Naruto agreed, leaning on Sakura for support. I'm nearly out of chakra, and as soon as that happens this hacking seal is going to drop me, we need a place to hide and rest for now. His clone and teammate nodded and took off toward the tower, it only took them a few minutes to find a defensible position to camp out, a giant hollow tree with the front covered by a bit of shrubbery to camouflage it a bit. Okay, this'll have to do. Naruto grunted, raising a single hand to Sasuke's neck. Kaiyu, juice me enough to place a seal on Dumbas here. It doesn't have to be much. One moment. Okay there. Naruto felt a small surge of energy in his body, along with the burning it was causing. With a grunt of effort the blonde gen informed a few hand signs and placed his hand on the cursed mark. The mark began to glow slightly before it was encircled by a moderately simple seal that Naruto had seen in one of his study books. It was an evil sealing technique that sealed off corrupt chakra. But the last of the light dying down a single, simple circle was placed around the mark, sealing it off from the rest of Sasuke's body. There, that'll have to hold. His world began to swim, eyes crossing in dizziness. Nighty night. Before he fell face first to the ground. Sakura who had watched the scene for a moment looked on in worry as her two teammates lay unconscious in her care, it really, really didn't fill her with determination, like either of the two idiots would have claimed. No, right now she was feeling cold, alone and. Her attention drew to Naruto's face, even in unconsciousness he had a serious look on his face, like he was doing something of great importance, even while asleep. Seeing her teammates resolve helped the girl find her own. With a grunt of effort, still favoring one leg as the injury from earlier had yet to set. The girl went about work setting up some traps, quite a few of them taught to her by Naruto himself. Sitting back in the cave like a tree, the girl stared out over the clearing outside the tree. Her teammates needed her so she would guard them with her life. 
She looked down at the kunai clutched in her hands, thoughts going back to the man she had killed. Yes, she had already killed, this was no different. She'd protect her friends, or die trying. Chapter 17. Noises in the forest. Frantic footsteps echoed in the deathly quiet forest. Anko's pace was broken as she searched the forest for him. It had only been minutes since she and a team of ninja had found a team of grass ninjas with their faces ripped off, she took off for the forest at once, it was his technique after all. Her teeth grit in frustration as she thinks of her bastard sensei. He was here now, in these exams and possibly after the Achiha kid. And maybe even Naruto of all things. Her heart caught in her throat as she thought of her husband having that bastard's mark. The years that she had spent with the blonde had been some of the happiest moments in her life, and the possibility that it could be taken all away chilled her to the bone. Ukukukuku, well if it isn't my old apprentice, come to see me have you. Banko's blood ran cold as she landed on a branch, a kunai already in her hands. Her entire body went rigid as she felt a presence behind her. Spinning with the blade of her kunai, leading Anko aimed for a debilitating strike right from the off. Only to have it be stopped by a grasp on her wrist. Now now Anko. The snake san and hissed, his face only a few inches from hers. Is that any way to greet your old sensei? Anko spat in his face and struck him in the jaw. It was only a glancing blow as the man had twisted his head just slightly to let the punch glance off, losing most of its strength. Retaliating, he kicked the woman away. I guess you're not happy to see me then. His cold mocking tone nearly drove Anko into an unstoppable rage, and only the years of patience drilled into her from having to deal with a little ball of annoyance that was Naruto kept her from rushing the bastard. As if. She growled. I'll be the happiest woman in the world when I see you dead at my feet. H-M-H-M-H-M-H-M-H-M. Interesting choice of words there Anko-chan. The man's piercing, slitted yellow eyes bored into her. When your little pet Jinchuriki will be kneeling at mine soon enough. Anko's eyes widened for a moment before they narrowed in rage. What did you do? Why are you even here? HMHMHMHM. I'm here for a few new prospects, these exams do bring out the best of the best after all. The man's voice turned into a feral purr. Two participants in particular have caught my eye. Anko grit her teeth, she was aware of what he meant. Sasuke and Naruto. The mocking clap met her words. Correct Anko-chan, you always were smart, it's a shame you could never be more, my failed little experiment. Anko saw her ed, her entire body coursed with fury, adrenaline pumping wildly through her veins, as she let out a hoarse scream of rage. Orochimaru blocked the first punch, before his eyes widened imperceptibly. You've gotten a bit stronger since the last time Anko-chan. The next punch went low only to be blocked as well. Then a kick, which he couldn't block so he had to bend his body almost vertical to dodge. Not like it was hard after all, since his body was one of the most flexible things around, like a human slinky he bent over backward, planting a kick into Anko's stomach, launching her into the air. Anko recovered quickly, landing on the side of a tree trunk, before launching a volley of shuriken at her former master. You'll have to do better than that. He mocked, dodging the feeble attack, but that had merely been a feint as Anko came in from the sides. How about this then? Another kick to the head, only barely dodged this time. She's speeding up. Grabbing another punch and diverting it to the side he surprisingly caught an elbow to the jaw from an in-close cross strike. That wasn't snake style. He smirked. So you've been doing a little tinkering with my style while I was away as well. How naughty of you Anko-chan, and here I thought you'd try and beat me at my own game. Dodging a punch he caught another elbow to the ribs. She's gotten strong in my absence, interesting. Anko leapt back and lifted her arm up level with the snake Sanin's face striking shadow snakes. You think you can defeat me with my own technique? striking shadow snakes. The two attacks collided, both swarms of snakes biting and tearing at each other as they all at once dispelled, leaving behind a cover of smoke, which Anko plowed through, kunai leading. Arachimaru pulled a kunai of his own to block. Sparks flew as the blades met, their shining surface reflecting the eyes of each in the reflective metal. You can't beat me like this Anko, even though you know this. The Sanin deflected the next slash of a kunai. You don't have the skill to beat me, only time and age can a student overcome the master, but we both know that age holds no meaning for me. Orochimaru chuckled at his little joke, while many didn't know of his body swapping, Anko had known about some of his plans, before he had left Kanoha and her behind, the body swap being one of them. The grinding sparks of metal on metal flashed again as the two struck with kunai, fists, elbows, knees and feet. The kick to the head being diverted here and a slash to the midsection blocked and pushed harmlessly to the side, only a few nicks and strikes ever got through to do any lasting damage. It truly was a dance to any outside observer, like most jonin level fights where both combatants were soft style to jutsu experts. Another flurry of punches were sent to Rachimaru's way, only one or two got through to do any significant damage though, and only one of those was even serious, as she had held a kunai in her hand while she had inflicted it. 
But no matter, for every hit Orochimaru would give her five in return, by the end of their little warm-up, the woman had far more cuts and bruises than Orochimaru did. You're slowing down Anko-chan, how about I hold one hand behind my back, that might make things interesting. He continued to mock and berate her until the snake woman had reached her snapping point, summoning up a fair amount of her chakra she created two sealess cage bunshin, a bit of a gift that teaching that chakra powerhouse of a husband of hers, and had them approach the sand and from the sides as she struck from the front. You think these dolls can defeat me? He sounded amused. Foolish. The two clones fell upon Orochimaru with a vengeance, using their shadow kunai to add pressure to their assault. Orochimaru was playing with Anko for the most part as he dispelled her two clones, taking a few hits in return, that is until Anko had used a slight opening her clones had made to grapple the man against a tree and pinned his hand and her own through with a kunai after knocking his blade away. Now this is a compromising situation don't you think? The snake san and chuckled. Tell me why you're here you bastard, she pulled another kunai from her pouch and placed it on the man's neck. Kukukuku, you think that this can stop me? He grabbed Anko's wrist before she could move to slit his throat, pulling it to the side and away from the blood-pumping veins. As for why I'm here, I told you earlier, I'm here to look for some amusing tools, I found those two in particular to be most amusing. I even gave them my mark. The sickening smile he gave her nearly made the woman gag, then what he said hit home. You bastard. Just the thought that her husband had been poisoned by this hacker set her blood boiling again. Oh don't worry, I'm sure they'll both beat the odds and survive, if not. Oh well. Why did you even mark Naruto, we both know you can't change bodies with a Jinchuriki. HMHMHMHM. Orochimaru lifted his head and laughed upward in mirth. Ah, but that's the magical part of science my dear, it's amazing what one can do with a few samples of DNA and a bit of time and loving effort. He smirks at her confused expression. I can easily have an army of loyal vessels cloned and bred to my exacting specifications, with both boys' bloodlines Anko-chan, can you just picture it? The perfect body. He leered at her. And to think I once considered you for a vessel, how foolish of me. Anko nearly gagged. In another time and another place the woman might have actually tried to kill her sensei, along with herself with the twin snake sacrifice jutsu, but frankly speaking the woman had too much to lose by doing that, and she was also pissed. The hack. Off. So she did what her perfectly laxy husband would have done in that situation. She slammed her forehead and by extension her forehead protector into her former master's hacking nose. Blood flew, as the sharp sound of cartilage breaking could be heard, along with a sharp intake of breath from the sanin. It was a tactic that Naruto had used during his spars with her back when he had no skill to speak of. He had a hard as hell head, even harder than most headbands, and he put the thing to use many, many times during their spars. Hell, even now Naruto was a brawler at heart, and when push came to shove that little brat would fight dirty, like dirtier than two women in a lesbian mud wrestling competition, dirty. Did you just headbutt me? The snake sand and asked in an almost novel curiosity. I thought I taught you better than that. Not one to ever be outdone by her hubby Anko ignored her ex sensei's words and struck the bastard again. And again. And again. In fact after the next ten or so consecutive strikes, Orochimaru's face was beginning to take on a nice purplish hue, like that of the markings around his eyes actually, so much was the facial beating that the man actually started cursing her. Would you smack stop damn smack hacking smack quit head butting me you crazy bit smack. In hindsight he probably should have created a mud clone to take his place during that beating. But he was actually rather tired after facing both Naruto and Sasuke, and then on top of that his surprisingly skilled former apprentice. It was most likely due to this new body of his, he had switched only the month before, and it hadn't been as responsive as he'd hoped it would be. Not to mention he was reeling from the first few headbutts to really get enough concentration to do so. Anko's forehead meanwhile was beginning to hurt even by Naruto's pain threshold standards, and she couldn't really break the hold she had on her sensei to give her enough room to work with, so opting to do as much damage as physically possible before they separated the woman, decided a bit of feminine wrath was in order, and repeatedly slammed her knee into the snake Sanin's crotch. Orochimaru's eyes crossed for but a moment before he let out an unmanly howl of pain, working on an adrenaline and sense of self-preservation he hadn't known he had, the man threw Anko off him to the ground, causing her to strike her head and knock her senseless for a moment. As he staggered to the side with a distinctly noticeable limp, he cursed the fact that while he may have had the body of a female at that current point in time, through his which changed the outward parts of his body, he remained distinctly male in certain areas, and now wasn't exactly a good time to be a guy, or even a woman for that matter, since getting hit there hurt like a mother hacker regardless. Letting out a gasp of air as his stomach nearly emptied itself, the man decided it was best to cut his losses and just get the hell out of there before that crazy bitch of a student of his decided to abuse his body and man parts in some other vicious way. Well this wheeze has been fun no it hasn't but time wheeze is short, I'll be wheeze seeing you again wheeze Anko. 
The man turned and slipped into the trunk of the tree he was standing next to, actually giving a bit of thought if he actually did want to meet that crazy bitch again. Anko, despite the pain in the back of her head and the thought that her husband was possibly dying in this god's forsaken forest, was grinning up a storm, she had made that bastard run away, she'd struck him where it hurt, a place she'd never had been able to strike him before, dealing damage she'd never dealt to him before. It wouldn't be till much later that she realized the significance of that moment. Three sets of eyes watched quietly over a clearing, a single, large hollow tree being its only distinguishing feature, along with a trio of ninja taking shelter inside, two of them asleep, the other watching over their sleeping forms. The pink one looks dead on her feet, we'll wait till morning, then we strike. The bandaged Osu muttered the command just loud enough for his teammates to hear. Got it. Zaku nodded before turning to Kin. Don't hack this up he growled quietly. Or you'll pay for it later. Kin scoffed. We won't fail against a little brat like that. That seemed to appease him as he turned back to glare at the three genin. Asshole Kin mentally cursed the man as she turned her attention back to the clearing. Morning, Sakura's eyes blinked several times as she fought to stay awake. She had spent several hours in a meditative state to get as much rest as she could for what was to come. A slight rustle of branches alerted the young girl. A slight flick of the wrist and a single flew out to strike the ground right next to a small squirrel. Sakura sighed in relief, keeping up the ruse. As the little animal ran off another rustle got her attention. A small smirk crossed her lips. Three forms jumped from the bushes to land a few dozen yards from Sakura. You've been up all night guarding the two brats little girl. Dosu walked forward a step. But it isn't you we're after. Wake up the Achiha, we have a bone to pick with him. No. She glared at the three. He's injured, he couldn't fight you even if he wanted to. Ain't that a damn shame. Zaku laughed before his eyes turned deadly serious. We could care less, either you wake him or we'll kill all three of you right now. Screw you asshole. Sakura growled, flipping him off. You bitch. Zaku made a move to rush her. That's right, walk right into my trap. Sakura mentally prodded him, she could tell the guy was a hothead, and a little provoking was called for. A hand shot out and grabbed Zaku before he could make a move though. Don't be a fool Zaku. Dosu pulled the volatile boy back and walked forward, stopping in front of a patch of grass. You might have gotten us with this girl, but you made one crucial error here each down and lifted up the patch of grass, this kind of grass doesn't grow here. While Dosu was disarming Sakura's trap, Kin was watching the girl's facial expressions intently. She's not scared. Was the first thing she noticed, besides a small frown at how easily Dosu had found her trap the girl hadn't made a move to do anything yet. She's got guts I'll give her that. Kinda wish we didn't have to kill her. Shrugging, such was life she'd just have to deal with it. Dosu stood up from his crouch and dusted his hands off. Go. He ordered, leaping through the air, his teammates not far behind. As the air rushed past them Dosu noticed something strange, Sakura hadn't moved an inch. And she seemed to be. Smirking. Yeah, Sakura smirked, all the while slicing a small wire hidden behind her, releasing an absolutely massive log from the treetops, swinging like a pendulum straight for the three sound nin. Dosu's only visible eye widened a trap from above. Only for a scoff to escape his lips. Amateurish. He pulled the sleeve back on his right arm, exposing a large metal gauntlet with holes all along its surface. Placing a hand on the log surface, a wave of pressure blasted through the hollow log. Osu's bandage-covered smirk of triumph was however stalled when he again made eye contact with Sakura. She's still smiling. A small sliver of white entered his vision, barely perceptible, except for a momentary flash of morning sunlight off its colorless surface. Dog's eyes widened in horror as he noticed many other flecks of white all around him. He had just enough time to witness Sakura hold up a single hand sign before his entire world filled with white and all sound left him. Eyes all around the forest turned toward the large explosion echoing through the forest around them. Denton raised an eyebrow at the sheer pressure the explosive wave exuded. Sounds like someone was on the wrong end of an explosive tag. And a lot of them at that. It doesn't matter. Niji dismissed the explosion, they already had their scroll. Let's find Lee and get to the tower. Hi. Bibble landed on a tree limb, flattening his ears to his head with his hands, as the loud report of the explosion blew past his team, popping the ears of all three members. Ow, what the hell was that? Akumaru whined in his hoodie, flattening his ears as well. It sounded like an explosive tag. Hinata pointed out landing next to his left side. Many of them. Shino agreed, landing on his right. Yee, whoever would use that many explosive tags I certainly don't want to meet him. Kibo altered his trajectory as he hopped from tree to tree to get to the tower, while avoiding whatever or whoever had tripped those tags. What was that? Tamari stopped pre leap to stare off into the distance as a loud bang filled the forest. It is unimportant. Gara drowned. Keep moving. You heard the man. Kankuro leapt past her. Chop chop. Tamari pouted and hurried to catch up to her two brothers. Man, what the heck was that? 
Shikamaru lowered his head as a gust of wind and noise passed over his head, he quickly ducked into some bushes to get out of sight. Sounded like explosive tags. Choji whispered, taking refuge in the bush next to him. I say we go check it out. Eno voice next to them. Both boys' heads snapped to her. Are you crazy Eno? There's no telling who could have set those tags off. Do you have a death wish? Yeah, what Shikamaru said, we don't need to be caught up in anything like that. The pudgy Akamichi started uncertainty in the direction the explosion came from. Eno huffed at the two's response. You two need to get a backbone, Naruto-kun would have gone. We're not Naruto. Shikamaru groaned. And since when have you been so gung-ho? Eno lifted her nose in the air haughtily. Naruto-kun likes outgoing and strong Kanoichi, so I'm going to become stronger so I can get him to notice me. Little hearts appeared in her eyes as she let out a little perverted giggle. Troublesome. Come on, let's go, maybe they killed each other and we can have two scrolls to barter with. Eno grabbed a hold of her two teammates' collars and proceeded to drag them towards the epicenter of the explosion. Um. One of Kabuto's teammates grunted, hearing the far-off explosion. Ignore it. Kabuto ordered. Lord Orochimaru wants us to study the competition and weed out the weaklings. Right, he nodded. Oh. Rock Lee's eyes lit up. Someone must have allowed their youth to explode. He yelled in a hushed whisper. Guy had at least had the intelligence to keep his youthful student from screaming at the top of his lungs in a search and capture style mission, preferring to spread their use or youth through their actions in those situations. This seems interesting, I wonder what could have caused such an explosion. As the youngest of the two green beasts followed the direction of the blast to investigate. At ground zero we find Sakura leaning against the back of the inside of the tree, rubbing the back of her head where the outer edge of the blast had launched her into the tree. Might have used one too many explosive tags. Sakura chuckled to herself, before an arm went up, the medal of the gauntlet Naruto had gotten her blocking that nearly took her between the eyes. You're going to pay for that girl. An angry voice growled as the smoke cleared from the clearing, the forms of the three sound ninja came into view. All of them were burned in various places, and their clothing was singed and torn in several areas, including a metal gauntlet on the mummified man, which had cracked into several pieces and lay on the ground at his feet. In response Sakura pulled another kunai from her pouch. You wouldn't be like that if you just left us alone. Not budging an inch Sakura stood up, this time intent on physically defending herself. She still had a couple traps set up around the clearing, but nothing between herself and the sound trio, she'd have to lure them in if she was going to beat them. Saku took a step forward shakily, he was by far the most injured, but at the same time he was the angriest of the three, and that gave him just enough power to fuel his next attack. Raising both of his hands up to point at Sakura he screamed out his. Zanka. His roar was drowned out by the sound of his own. Sakura's eyes widened in fear as the wave approached. A scream rang out over the roar of the wind. Ugh. My head, Kami, that seal sucks. Naruto sat up in the middle of his forest-like mindscape, the sky around him, giving off a slightly ominous gray cloud that Naruto took note of, he also noticed many of the trees around him looked sickly and dying. What the heck is going on? It's Orochimaru's seal. Kayubi spoke up behind him. Naruto glanced to the side to see the fox woman leaning against one of the trees with her arms crossed, where her body touched the tree. It looked far more healthy than the rest. Naruto glanced around and saw many of the trees were the same way. I take it the curse mark is trying to corrupt my mind. Ayubi nodded, frowning slightly. Yeah it's kind of irritating, it's taking chakra from your system and corrupting it, then sending it back into you to wrap your coils so you'll become dependent on the thing. She let out a sigh. Luckily for you I'm mitigating the damage with a few spikes here and there with my chakra, it seems like Snake Face doesn't like chakra jammed into his soul that much. Naruto's eyes widened. His soul. His voice was filled with incredulous anger the Mother hacker pumped a piece of his soul into me. Be it, about that. She chuckled a little you're going to enjoy this. She turned on her heel, breaking contact with the tree behind her, which immediately started turning a slight grayish tint like the others. Naruto fell into step behind her, his head still throbbing from the previous battle, his overuse of Kayubi's chakra and Petamaru's wonky seal screwing with his coils. After a few minutes Kayubi and Naruto arrived in a clearing where a ring of dead-looking trees with purple leaves stood sickly in a ring, a wall of semi-clear red energy encircled said ring. I take it this is where my neck is in my mindscape and not answered his question. So where's Snake Hack at? Over there. The fox woman pointed to a deformed looking thing that was undulating on the ground. Hello Naruto-chan. Insane and strange. Off. A tone of voice greeted him. The humanoid-like creature reared up on its haunches and smiled a wicked smile with a face too to be threatening. The thing's body was completely out of proportion with the rest of its body and looked like a Buddha statue with overly large comically snake-like eyes. Give me your body, Naruto-chan, we can have so much fun together at the end of the strange verbal tikta. Things started undulating on the ground. What? In hell. Is that? 
Naruto drawled out, staring at the abomination in front of him. Yes. Well. I studied the makeup of the seal as it was setting in, and several things raised a warning flag for me. She pointed to the fat malformed thing. Orochimaru's seal corrupts the chakra network allowing it to weaken your mental defenses, after it does that it slowly drives you crazy, allowing the piece of Orochimaru's soul to easily take over your mind, from what I can tell, it's so the rest of his soul can take full control of your body later on. That still doesn't answer my question as to why he looks like a pedophile Lakamichi that used the human bullet technique through a woman's beauty salon. Ah. Kayubi blinked owlishly as she chuckled, rubbing her head in embarrassment. Well, the only way I could keep Orochimaru's mental intrusions from influencing you was to use my chakra to make his appearance and message so ridiculous that you could never take him seriously. The seal's power is based on verbal consent after all, if you give in to him he can take control more easily. So. You turned the piece of his soul that was injected into me into a total retard. A hesitant nod answered him. Kayu, have I ever mentioned how awesome you are? He literally glomped on the kitsune woman, laughing all the while. Oh Kami this is hysterical. Ayubi chuckled under him. Indeed it is, but now we have to do something about him before he can come back from his senility. We should become one, come to me my beloved. Nioro Nioro. And we just kill it. Naruto offered, ignoring the abomination and its heresy. Ayubi sighed. I've already tried that, the best I can think is either you remove his soul from outside the seal through some form of counter seal, or push his soul out from the inside, killing it in the process. Naruto glanced over his shoulder at the deformed Orochimaru then back at Kayu. What are the odds of removing it from the outside with a counter seal? The fox woman tapped her chin errantly and thought. Since Anko still has hers and that fool of a godfather of yours hasn't removed it yet I can say with certainty. Fairly close to zero. And pushing it out from within. Alone? Maybe 50 50 -ths. With me here though, we could probably do it easily, I just need your help. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Just how hard could it be to remove that jackass? He pointed over his shoulder at Orochimaru's soul, which had started masticating on a triard. You'd be surprised she glanced over at the man in question who had moved on from eating tree bark and had started humping a lemon tree, which caused Naruto's eyes to twitch for a moment since that tree was technically a part of his mind, so Orochimaru was technically mindacking him at the current time. The bastard is a crafty one I can tell you that. Ignoring the grunting and the crazy bastard in question was making. Even with me poking holes in his mentality with my chakra he's still a competent fighter, he's just much, much slower and less flexible than his true self. The two of them watched as the abomination of a snake finished doing whatever it was he was doing, which disgusted them both. And with most of my power devoted to containing the cursed seal's corrupting influence and that. I don't really have the strength to hold both back and push him out at the same time, which is where you come in. Naruto frowned a bit as he went over his options, what few there were anyway. Coming to a decision quickly, Naruto slammed a fist into his palm. Alright, let's kick this snake bastard ass out of my head. Nodding in agreement, Kayubi places a hand on the blonde's shoulder. Listen closely to Naruto-kun. She pointed to the snake man. I'm going to lower the barrier I set up, the moment I do this he's going to try and attack you, I want you to hit him with the strongest you know of, he's slower now, so he can't dodge it as easily, but he's still just as strong, so don't stop until you destroy his soul. Naruto nodded, turning towards the soul fragment before flicking a two-fingered salute over his shoulder as he focused all of his attention on the snake Sanin. Can do Kai. Moving his hands into his patented cross-hand seal, the Uzumaki formed six shadow clones in a line, three to either side of the original. Flying through several hand seals each, the six clones originally breathed deeply. Now. The barrier of energy holding back the corrupted trees was lowered, and almost immediately the trees surrounding that ring started to decay as well. Naruto didn't pay attention to that. No, he focused all his concentration on the rot on Snake San and rushing him, trying to force his will on the blonde's mind. Naruto would have none of that. Three clones brought a hand to their mouth and blew. Fire style. Fireball jutsu. While those three clones blew a massive wave of fire the other three clones exhaled sharply. Wind style to Tapa. Finally the original slammed his palms together, pulling both sets of together. Hidden art. Great firestorm. The two sets of three collided on a single focal point, striking each other, each wrestling for supremacy. Until both gave way at the same time, the wind spiraled around the fireball and the core of the flames compressed under the wind's power, causing the entire thing to heat up from friction and burn even hotter and larger. The spiraling vortex of doom bore down upon to the corrupted soul fragment, who didn't even have time to squeal out an Iora before he was struck by the ball, knocking the wind out of him and sent spiraling upward, being torn limb from limb by the churning flames. Within moments the conflagration struck an invisible ceiling after a hundred or so yards of upward travel before the space the fireball was occupying seemed to flex. I'll be back. The fragment screamed. Your body will be mine Nioro. 
His scream extended as his soul was forced from Naruto's mindscape, eviscerating the thing as it went, only stopping when the fireball reached its maximum height and exploded, clearing the sky of all the dark clouds that had cast such a dark shadow on Naruto's mind. There, that should take care of him. Naruto nodded, glancing around at several of the trees which had regained some of their luster, though a frown formed on his face moments later when he noticed that there was still some corruption leaching its way through his body. I noting this filled him in. You took care of Orochimaru's soul, but the corrupting influence of the seal remains. It's only bought you more time to remove the thing. Naruto stared for a moment before sighing heavily. I see, I guess I can take some time out after the Chunin exams to see how this thing works, now that we have all the information on how the thing is set up I can finally. Naruto's body went taunt as a thought came to him. What about Sasuke's curse mark? He glanced over at Kaiyu. You think he can force Orochimaru from his seal like I did? The fox woman's expression mimicked his own. I don't know, he could probably hold it back thanks to your seal, but I don't think he can do what you just did so easily. Is there any way I can help him with that? Naruto asked curiously, it wasn't like he was going anywhere soon. Ayubi brought a thoughtful hand to her chin, scratching an errant itch in thought. It's possible, I have a connection to him with my chakra and the seal of his, I could send some of your chakra through to help him a bit, but not much, too much of yours and my chakra in his system could kill him, so only enough for a quick chat. That's all I'll need. Naruto growled, he wasn't going to let that snake bastard have his way. Alright then. The fox woman placed a hand on Naruto's head and closed her eyes, connecting herself to her distant chakra. This may sting a bit. Naruto snorted. When is it ever not? A small twitch of a smirk touched Kaiyu's face as she gathered both her and Naruto's energies. Good luck. Kaiyu wished him before his mental representation disappeared in a flash of white light. Sakura held her arms crossed in front of her face, hoping and praying that her end came swiftly. But when the end never came and a loud meaty thwack registered to her ears, she slowly lowered her arms to see the strangest thing she'd ever thought she'd see. An ass, covered in green spandex, crouched in a battle-ready stance only a dozen paces in front of her, facing two of the three sound nin. A shallow trench was carved in the ground to his right, the angle of which barely missed the tree that she was standing in. A shocked realization came to her when she saw the sound nin that had tried to kill her laying on his back several yards away from the trench, a dark red mark slowly starting to bruise on his chin. Rock Lee rose from his crotch after having used a dynamic entry on Zaku, slowly taking his Gokin stance, with his left hand folded behind his back, right hand held out with palm facing inward. Attacking one of my comrades when she is unable to fight back. The boy's large eyes narrowed just slightly at the three sound nin. I don't condone such youthful actions. Who the hell are you? Zaku growled, aimed the thing in front of him in the horrendous green spandex. Lee stood a little straighter at the question before a small smirk crossed his lips, his stance shifting just slightly, muscles preparing to push him forward. The three sound nin tensed at this, but Lee ignored them in favor of yelling out his name to them. I am Kanoha's beautiful green beast. Rock Lee. His eyes narrowed again, this time showing a dangerous glint. And I shall be your opponent. Chapter 18. Getting real sick of this forest. Darkness darkness and moisture. Sasuke's eyes snapped open to that gloom, only to quickly gag as a deep copper scent hanging in the air entered his nose. Placing his hand down on the floor beneath him produced a wet sloshing noise, ignoring the possibility that he was in some cave of some sort for the immediate need to find the source of that rancid smell. Holding a hand to his face the boy looked around for the source. Sasuke's next breath caught in his throat as the bodies of his mother and father entered his vision. The coppery smell he had breathed in earlier was the odor of the pool of blood he was laying in. Gulping, he lifted his hand from the wet floor and brought it closer to his face. Deep crimson stuck to the hand, dripping down his wrist to stain his shirt sleeve. But the strangled gag the boy got to his feet, a bit of the red liquid seeping deeper into his clothing, forcing the smell to cling to him. That smell, the noxious fumes that clung to his body the night of the massacre, the stench that had taken days to wash from his skin, the nightmares however. They'd taken much longer to get over, and now they were coming back full force, bursting in on the edge of his psyche, what he'd tried to suppress over the years with his own progress and the helpful social interactions with the few friends he'd made in the academy. Naruto being at the top of the list, if it hadn't been for Naruto, Sasuke would have probably continued to brood in a self-serving spiral of hatred until either his mind or his resolve broke and neither boded well for him. The annoying blonde had put him on his ass constantly, that in turn set his Ichiha pride to boiling, which pushed him even harder the next time, until finally he'd had to admit to himself that Naruto actually was stronger than him. His pride had taken a hit that day, sure. But he soon realized that he hadn't felt that burning jealousy he'd usually attributed to his normal fights with the blonde, it was strangely soothing to have his ass handed to him by someone stronger than him, but not hold that wind above his head. So sad, so tragic. A purr of a voice echoed out from the darkness. 
Sasuke's eyes snapped to the noise to find a younger version of himself standing in his old school clothing, casually watching him from behind a clear glass wall, the only thing allowing him to talk to Sasuke were several small holes in the pane of clear material. But that wasn't what was strange to him, what was truly strange were the purple markings around his younger self's eyes. Sasuke's back went rigid as his younger self glared at him. Mother and father. They didn't have to die, if only you were stronger. Mini Sasuke fixed his elder self with a glare, the tears in his eyes slowly turning red with blood. If only you weren't so weak. Splashes of blood flew up as he watched his parents die in front of him. Stop it. Sasuke yelled, crouching low to avert his eyes from the thing in front of him. Oh, but why would you hide your eyes from me? The thing hissed, unable to move in for the kill because of the barrier, but more than happy with his verbal assault. We both know if you had been strong enough you could have stopped Itachi, weakling. Stop it. Sasuke grit his teeth as he curled into a ball on the ground. His hands were plastered over his ears, so he couldn't hear the ghostly wail of his clan, as the visions of the massacre played behind his eyelids, the memories burnt into his brain by his brother's Tsukiyomi. You just stood there and watched them die, coward. Weakling. You'll never kill Itachi pretending to be a ninja. You don't have enough hate. The last Ichiha's breathing caught in his throat as his mind hyper-focused on his younger double, the haunting words of his brother echoing through his mind. There is no value in killing the likes of you. My foolish brother. If you want to kill me. Curse me. Hate me. And live a long and unsightly life. Run away. Run away. And cling to your pitiful life. A hoarse scream escaped Sasuke's lips, only to get cut short by a blow to his head, silencing his hysterical cries. That's enough of that. A rather familiar voice echoed in the dark. Sasuke's black eyes rose groggily, the twin black orbs catching a pair of black shinobi sandals near the glass partition, where his younger self seemed to be shouting at him. Only he couldn't hear the curses as whoever had kicked him was leaning against the glass, covering the small holes that allowed his younger self to talk to him. Slowly his eyes rose again to meet a pair of slitted blue ones, set above a frowning face crossed with three lines on each side of his cheeks. Ichiha's eyes widened. And Naruto. The one and only. He replied cheekily. This was so surreal. That was the first thought in Ichiha's mind, the next was how the hell Naruto was. Well. Wherever the hell here was. Cozy little mindscape you have here Sasuke. Naruto quipped, glancing around the dark and dank nothingness around the single area of light in Sasuke's mind, an area that housed the bodies of Sasuke's dead parents. Can't say much about the decor though. Sasuke grit his teeth, it was Naruto alright. No one he knew of could annoy him and at the same time relieve him. Thanks to the blonde's words he knew where he was, in his mind. If this is my mind, what are you doing here? Naruto wasn't a Yamanaka, he couldn't walk minds like Ino and her family. A fact that Sasuke praised Kami every morning for. So that begged the question why. Or better yet how was he here? Naruto snorted in amusement. Well, for starters I used some of Kaiyu's chakra to seal off that hickey on your neck where Petamaru bit you. That chakra linked us, it'll give me about 5 minutes to talk to you and to warn you about chuckles here. Naruto tossed a thumb over his shoulder at the Orochimaru died Sasuke, who was cursing at Naruto through the glass, though with Naruto's back to the wall, you couldn't hear anything he said. The Ichiha frowned as he watched his younger self make several rude gestures at Naruto's back. And just what is that exactly? Naruto looked over his shoulder at the fragment of Orochimaru's soul, finally seeing the gestures being flashed at him. Heh, from what I can gather that right there is a piece of Orochimaru's soul, he injected it, along with a very advanced sealing formula into your neck. Sasuke turned green, that thing was a piece of someone else's soul. And it knew enough of his darkest thoughts and secrets to torment him, like it had been moments before. The boy felt sickened by that fact. So. What exactly do I do about that? Naruto's annoyingly cheerful attitude fell. That's all up to you actually. At the questioning look, he pointed at the mini Sasuke who had stopped its muted ranting and now sat on the floor, glaring a hole into Naruto's back. This is your mindscape, right now I'm not able to do anything but talk to you. That thing however is directly connected to your body and can influence you, this wall I'm leaning against is a seal I set up around it to keep it from messing with your mind, looks like it wasn't strong enough, and Petamaru poked a few holes in it so it could talk with you. He moved away from the wall and walked closer to Sasuke, Orochimaru's soul piece jumped up from where it was sitting and started yelling out curses and using what it had dug from Sasuke's memories to corrupt the boy, but Naruto moved Sasuke away from the wall until it was only mildly annoying. I can't do anything to keep that hole closed, all seals of this nature require the user's will to keep it in check. So if I want him to shut up. He left his question open to get a definitive answer from the blonde. You shut him up. Naruto agreed. Right. Sasuke glared at the snake who had dared to infiltrate his memories, focusing all his mental will on closing the few holes it had made in the wall. 
At first nothing happened, then the glass-like wall seemed to ripple a few times, the ripples passing over the holes causing them to shrink until nothing was left but smooth and clear glass. Now. Naruto sighed. What do we do with you? Sasuke blinked, turning to him. Friend. Yes, friend. What do you mean by that? Itachi. Naruto spoke simply. He only had to say that one word and several things happened in quick succession. Sasu tensed up at the name, his face scrunched in mild anger, and the lights of the room in his mind flickered a bit. And that's exactly why. Naruto pointed out the obvious reaction to a simple name. With great effort Sasuke schooled his features and waited for Naruto to explain, a few tense muscles still visible on his neck. Sasuke. Naruto sighed. Stop jazzing Itachi. The reaction was immediate. Sasuke's eyes widened, pupils dilating and an angry snarl forced its way past his lips. How dare you? Do you know what he's done? Do you know? Naruto's face was no less angry as he snapped at the livid Acha. Of course I know. He growled. Anchan is a member of T&I and, and a former Anbu, she knows a lot more than either of us do. The blonde boy sighed, releasing the built-up tension in his body. Something is really weird about that day Sasuke, something I haven't quite placed yet. He looked the Achiha dead in the eyes. But I don't think Itachi was working alone or killed them simply on a whim like the reports say. That had Sasuke's retort caught firmly in his throat. W what? A single eyebrow rose. Do you honestly think that one man could take down an entire clan of Sharingan users in one night without anyone realizing it before the job was done? Really? Sasuke was about to say that his brother was just that good when something stopped him, he really thought about that question for a moment. His clan was situated in over 20 acres of land, enough for the 100 or so members of the clan to live with a spacious bit of land between each other, but that wouldn't stop the sound of death being heard by at least someone. It was strange, there were always guards set around the entirety of the district, so someone would have seen or at least heard something, unless Itachi had taken down the entire guard for that evening. So either he spent the time to take down each guard, which would take far more time than necessary, or he had helped to take them down. The last loyal Ichiha blinked several times before his eyes widened. If Itachi had helped then. I see you're getting it now. Naruto smirked, nodding to himself. If Itachi had helped then it wasn't just him going psycho on his clan. This was planned for a purpose. A scowl formed on Sasuke's face. And just what purpose could that be for? Naruto shook his head you're not gonna like this. The scowl grew deeper. I could care less about what I like, the only thing that matters right now is finding out who else helped murder my family. A deep sigh escaped the blonde. I've always thought that the Achiha massacre was a bit fishy, so I kept tabs on the more blatant rumors I could remember. The most damning one at the moment was that the Achiha were possibly planning a coup. A breath caught in Sasuke's throat. W wa. I'm telling you this now Sasuke because it's highly likely that this was the case, and the Hokage or someone high up in the village ordered Itachi to kill your family after countless negotiations failed. It's actually kind of obvious if you look at it from an Anbu standpoint, something that Anchan beat into me from day one to look underneath. Naruto grew quiet for a moment, a thoughtful look on his face. From what I could find out, the Achiha hated most of Konoha because the people thought the Achiha were the cause of the Kaiubi attack. Naruto pointed a finger at Sasuke. A fact that is attributed to one of your patrons, Achiha Madara. He was able to control the Kaiubi with the power of his Sharingan. That single bit of bad history ostracized the Achiha and the Achiha, after some time of course, reciprocated. It's actually quite funny really. He chuckled here, a small depressing laugh. Why the hell would that be funny? Sasuke growled. The way you say that, the people of Konoha are at fault. Naruto nodded. That would normally be the case. If they were wrong. Sasuke's eyes widened for the second time in that conversation. Why you mean they? I've had a lengthy talk with Kaiyu-chan about that night. Naruto looked away, a pained look on his face. A man with an orange spiraled mask that only revealed the man's right eye. My mother, the previous Jinchuriki of Kaiubi, was killed by the man when he extracted the biju from her stomach. Sure, she lived for a short while after that, but died protecting me from Kaiyu-chan while the fourth sealed her. My father died, sealing her within me. He rubbed his hand on the seal on his stomach, a fact that wasn't lost on the Achiha. Your dad was. The man who essentially killed my mother and father, the man who destroyed half of Konoha and killed hundreds, the man who brought the fear of the villagers upon your clan, igniting the flames of rebellion within the clan, and the man who wore an orange swirl mask to hide all of his face, all except his right eye. Naruto stared Sasuke down. A Sharingan eye. Sasuke fell to his knees at that revelation. Indirectly or not, the evidence was just too possible, too hard to ignore. He'd heard a few rumors now and again about his clan, he usually never gave them much thought, but a few fit too close to Naruto's scenario for comfort. Many considered the Achiha to be a treacherous clan, the ability to steal things as a bloodline will do that for you, and it wouldn't take much to fan the flames of doubt after that. If his clan were attempting to overthrow the village. 
killing hundreds. Most likely weakening the village enough for other villages to attack. It would have at the very least sparked a civil war, if not a full-on shinobi world war. Suddenly the odd behavior of his brother around the rest of the clan made a sick kind of sense. Itachi probably knew that he'd have to do something like that eventually, he had always been more loyal to the village rather than the clan, he had seen the pride the man had in just doing his best for his village, which made this all the harder for him. Harder because Sasuke prided himself on his reasonable hatred despite his unreasonably large hatred for Itachi. No, that hatred may have been unreasonably large, but he hated Itachi for a reasonable reason. He couldn't rationalize hating the village for ostracizing his clan when it was in Ichiha that was the cause of that hatred in the first place. Even if he could muster up some form of anger at them, it was quickly doused when he realized that the village was as much the stooge of the mask Ichiha as his clan had been. The man hadn't destroyed Kanoha with the Kayubi like he had most likely wanted, because really, why else would you unseal a biju on the outskirts of a village? But the mask Ichiha had sown the seeds of doubt that had destroyed his family and weakened the village from within. And Sasuke felt anger, a rich, vibrant and all-consuming hatred. Not for his brother. No, he could wait for that now that he had some information on the why of that night so many years ago. Right now he was feeling a burning anger at the masked man who had started this entire debacle in the first place. If he hadn't unsealed the Kaiubi. His family and Naruto's family. That doused the flames of his rage as he turned an unwavering eye on the blonde in question. This is why I said to stop chasing Itachi Sasuke. A hand snaked its way up to the blonde's brow to rub a sore spot there. It's highly possible that Itachi was just as much a victim as you, not only that. Do you really think that you're the only person who could kill Itachi? That question caught the young Ichiha off guard for a moment. Itachi is an S-rank criminal, it's highly possible that someone could collect his bounty, or he could even succumb to some illness at some point, living, then dying an incredibly short life. Naruto rolled his eyes at the obviousness of his next statement. Hell, you have a solid six years on the man, you could just wait patiently for him to age to a point where he's weaker than you then kill him when he has a significant advantage, or find him and poison his drink with a blinding poison to weaken him. A hand shot up to forestall the coming tirade. We're ninja Sasuke, before you go off on things like honorable vengeance and a fair fight. Remember that we are ninja he put emphasis on each agonizing letter there at the end. We don't fight fair, it's the whole reason we're taught stealth in the academy, so we can simply sneak past an enemy or hack him up from behind. The last Ichiha opened and closed his mouth several times, raising a finger now and again to try and make his point known, but each time he tried he lowered it just as quickly. Naruto decided to wrap this up, he could feel himself slipping away from the connection between them. If nothing else then look toward the goals you've set yourself for a reason to stop chasing the man. Sasuke looked up, far away and lost his face. One of your dreams is to bring the Ichiha clan back to prominence, that means having kids. At the blank stare Naruto groaned in annoyance. Dude, you're one of the smartest people in my class can't you? TCH, whatever. The point is this, Itachi is an S-rank missing nin, a man who could have probably ran for Hokage if he wanted to. You're planning on chasing this man down in his prime, while well, he's still capable of bringing down cage level opponents. Even if you somehow manage to fatally wound him, how well off do you think you'll be? An almost audible click was heard as an imaginary light bulb above the kid's head turned on. Yeah, that's basically it, even if you kill him you might end up sterile from a sneak attack. Or ever worse, dead. If it were me. I'd leave the guy well enough alone until he was old and cripple and have my children gang rape his ass after I taught them everything I know. An evil little smirk came to Naruto's lips as that little scenario flashed before his eyes. You're so high strung about it being an Ichiha who kills the guy, just because it has to be an Ichiha doesn't mean it has to be you. The blonde smirked, that's the whole point of me coming here, besides the witty banter of course. Naruto waved cheerily to him, his body already starting to disappear back to his real body. So what's more important? Clearing your clan's name or making sure there's still a clan to clear the name of. With that, the blonde's entire body disappeared from sight, leaving a confused and lost Ichiha to go over those words, all the while a disgusting little ankle biter copy of him with snake-like eyes was loudly but at the same time silently cursing him from behind the magical STFU glass. Brock Lee was many things. A hard worker, a splendid ninja and a beautiful green beast, I can only feel sorry for whatever woman. Or man. He ends up with, because beast is an accurate description of the boy's equipment, how he hides the thing in a skin-tight green leotard is beyond even this author's extensive perverted knowledge, but beyond all of that, the boy was first and foremost. A tojutsu specialist. The fact he made readily apparent when the mummy rap sound nin tried to rush forward and beat our fuzzy-browed savior. Readily apparent because the mummy received a very distinct sandal print to the chin, courtesy of said fuzzy browed savior. Another kick midair sent the mummy flying back into his other male teammate, leaving the girl to try and defend herself. 
Lee rushed forward, leading with a kick that would have taken the girl's head off, had a large slicing wave of wind not blocked his attack, knocking Kin away in the process to land heavily in a heap. Lee turned back to the two boys who had extricated themselves from each other and were now watching him with a circulatory stare, looking for any exploitable weaknesses. There were none. Without the melody arm on Dog's right arm, the trio of ninja would be having a hard time with this opponent. R-H-H-H, Lee Furkane. Rock Lee jumped towards the two boys spinning as he went to place more destructive power behind his kick. Zaku, dodge. The mummy man pushed his teammate out of the way and leapt to the site, avoiding the telegraph kick easily, what he hadn't counted on was seeing an infuriating smirk on the boy's lips as he punched him in the jaw, loosening a few of the mummy's teeth in the process. Divide and conquer, eh? The cheeky little brat. He had separated them quickly to keep them from tag-teaming him. His melody arm made up the brunt of his attack list since that no longer worked. Well this called for some improvising. After flipping through a couple hand seals the sound nin placed a hand against the ground. Hit an art. Echo pulse. When his hand hit the ground, the sound waves created by the heart tap sent rippling waves of force through the ground, forcing the green menace to leap back or risk losing his balance and possibly taking a blow that wouldn't have normally occurred. Like the giant wall of wind that was a bull rushing its way through his landing spot for instance. Oh. Lee grit his teeth, holding his arms in front of him in a cross to guard against some of the damage. Like getting tossed into a meat grinder, the boy struck the wall of force and was propelled back, the rippling wind girding away at his steel-like forearms. Humming out of the attack with only light wounds the green hurricane that was Rock Lee, set back on his opponents, pushing the two boys back into a corner. The two sound nin worked well together to block most of the more lethal blows to their person, but they didn't have any more ground to give. Then a sound seemed to bring Lee's attention away from the two. A good thing too or he'd have caught a pair in the back of his head. Gin had joined the fight. Gin watched as her two teammates were pushed back by the green freak in the leotard. Seriously, why the hell is he wearing that? Ignoring that self-imposed question for the moment, the girl tossed several more bell tips at the boy and like she expected the green beast, like his namesake, swatted the offending metal away. All according to plan. But the single tug on almost invisible wire, the bells tolled several times, which seemed to surprise Lee for only a moment before his knees hit the ground painfully. Rock Lee was a creature of obscene balance and dexterity, the boy had spent most of his shinobi career, mastering every ounce of his sensei's style, but one of the unfortunate downsides to his style was that it was too precise in its motions, focusing all that power required a balance that was matched only by the style's direct opposite, the Jayukin. As a result of this mastery of balance, anything that threw that balance off would cause an almost complete loss of control. Osu, seeing that the boy was down for the count, smirked to himself. That's good kin, keep the brat on the ground. His eyes flashed over towards the tree where their quarry had again taken refuge. And now to take care of the target. As he approached a single kunai flew across the expanse to strike the ground near his feet. Leaping back, the exploding tag attached to the weapon exploding in a small plume of fire. TCH, still want more than girly. He glared at those who had several more of those explosive kunai in her hands. Dodging those as easily as the first, the man started taunting the girl. You are so pathetic, you can't even hit a moving target, just how bad of a ninja are you? The next couple of explosive tag kunai came whizzing by just a bit faster than the last. Oh did I make someone angry? The man continued to crow dodging ever closer to the girl, when the kunai stopped raining on him, he took a moment to see that yes, the bitch should finally run out of explosives. Ha, that's all you got. He walked forward to end the annoyance once and for all. Click. Dog's eyes widened as he looked down. Under an almost undetectable layer of grass a small tripwire stuck just enough above the ground for it to be effective yet unnoticeable. Silently groaning to himself the man leapt away, escaping the inevitable explosion. Only to land in yet another trap, this one gluing his feet to the ground. Shit. The man cursed, panic setting in as his feet stuck fast to the sticky substance. Looking up the man found yet another log, this one quite a bit smaller, barreling towards him. Thankfully for Dosu, Zaku was nearby and willing to help. Don't worry Dosu, I got this. Zankuro. The air blast tore through the log and turned it into so much kindling. See, that was nothing. Then how about this? Said the gauze wrapped fist as it met the cocky sound nin's jaw. Um? What? Zaku? Dosu yelled, pulling out a kunai and tossing it at the green blur that had decked his teammate. The green blur stopped to swat the knife away, revealing Rock Lee standing there in a relaxed fighting stance. How? Dosu growled mentally, staring out of the corner of his eye to see Kin sitting in a sinkhole almost completely covered in water. A small twitch revealed that the pink bitch had used some kind of suetin on her. Damn. We won't be able to beat these brats if we can't hold this guy down. What the heck is going on? 
Dosu glanced out of the corner of his eye again and noticed the other two members of Team 7, stumbling out of the hollow tree, that the pink headed stashed them after the green boy had saved her. Damn. He cursed again, jumping over to Kin, yanking her a bit harder than necessary. We're falling back, Zaku. The mummy tossed several smoke bombs to the ground, sending out a massive amount of smoke to cover their escape. Brock Lee waited for several minutes for any sign of a sneak attack before he fell to one knee. He had used the first gate, the gate of opening, to get over the nausea of having his equilibrium shot to hell, and now he was slightly exhausted. The leotard wearing Jenin approached Team 7 slowly. Are you okay Sakura-san? He asked the girl, trying to calm the aches in his muscles. Why yes, thank you Lee. She bowed her head as much as she was able, having spent too much chakra releasing a rather obscene amount of water from one of the gauntlets that Naruto had given her to incapacitate Kin. Are you going to be okay out here on your own? Do you want us to help you find your teammates? Thank you but no, Sakura-san. I can find them easily enough. The two nodded to each other again in thanks. One for the initial save, the other for getting him out of a tight spot during the rescue attempt. Lee turned and leapt off into the tree line, leaving the three alone. What happened here Sakura? Sasu cast quietly while hanging an arm over Naruto's shoulder, and he did the same in return, both still weak from overcoming their curse mark's corrupting influence. We were attacked by sound nin Sasuke. She nodded her head in the direction of where Lee had left. I was able to hold them off until Lee could drive them away himself, we can get the full story after we find a new place to rest. Naruto grumbled. And some food while we're at it. Several hours later. Ah, that's better. Naruto sighed, rubbing his full stomach. Nothing better than grilled fish with teammates. He joked, tossing the bones of his meal into the fire. And now we have a general idea who to look out for in the third part of the exam. A growl escaped his lips. Those sound bastards are going down. For once I agree with you. Sasu chuckled, tossing his food into the fire as well. I'm going to scout the area, you two wait here. Sakura looked up from her fish. Be careful out there Sasuke. Hey Chen. The boy turned on his heels to walk off into the forest. Naruto stared after his teammate for a few moments before turning back to Sakura. Five Ryo says he's going to take a piss and he's too shy to do it in front of us. Sakura snorted on her food, waving what was left of her fish in his direction. I'll take that bet. Ugh. Sasuke sighed, zipping up his pants after having relieved himself on a nearby shrub. And now for scouting. Eek. Or saving damsels in distress. Sasuke rolled his eyes. That works too. The boy was beginning to think Naruto was rubbing off on him. Running in the direction of the scream, the last Ichiha came across a scene that looked like it had been pulled out of a fairy tale. Well a very grim fairy tale, but a fairy tale nonetheless. A young grass Kinoichi with neon red hair was sitting against the base of a tree, her two teammates dead at her side and the giant bear. Well. Bearing down on her. Sasuke made quick work of the beast with a fireball to the back. Like all problems, that one could be solved with liberal use of fire. The red-haired girl looked up at Sasuke, tears running down her cheeks in lingering fear and a slightly larger amount of gratitude. T thank you. She whimpered. Normally Sasuke would have just nodded and grunted in classical Ichiha form before hopping off to meet back up with his teammates, but something stopped the Ichiha and kept him rooted in place. Oh. The girl had a death grip on his legs. That's why. Thank you so much. The girl cried, large tears seeping into his pant leg as she hugged the already numbing limb. Unused to this level of gratitude the young Ichiha didn't really know how to comfort the girl beside what he had done for Sakura and he really didn't want to hug the girl that was already trying to fuse herself with his leg. It's nothing. Sasuke grunted, rubbing the girl's back gently trying to calm her down so she could remove her vice arms from around his leg, all the while getting a vaguely uncomfortable feeling in his nether regions, seeing as the girl was practically rubbing herself against him. The girl looked up and stared at the now blushing Sharingan user. Hey, you're the teammate of that Yuzumaki guy right? Rubbing teams from her eyes, the redhead now had a calculated look on her face, like she was planning something devious. Just without the devious part. Yeah. Sasuke said at length. He's my teammate. Why? Did I come with you so I can talk to him please? Now that question threw the Ichiha for a loop. Really Naruto? You're drawing women to you while you're not even here. The Ichiha sighed for what seemed like the thousandth time in the last hour. And why should I let you talk to my teammate? Because. The girl smoked smoothly, whatever fear she held for the bear seemed to be long gone. My name is Karen by the way, Karen Yuzumaki. Sasuke's jaw dropped at that little confession, blinking owlishly as the girl formed a small smug smile on her lips. So are we going to talk to him or what? The girl asked, that smug little smile not leaving her face for an instant. Really? Naruto stared at Sasuke and the redeed behind him for several moments, his eyes twitching in annoyance. Even when I'm not trying I'm finding family in the strangest places. He smiled ruefully. Still, it's nice to see another Yuzumaki out there. 
Karen, was it? Why yes. The girl squeaked, her voice quavering just slightly now that she was in front of the man she wanted to see. She was shaking, Naruto noted, but not for the reasons that the three Kanoha Genin thought. Karen was first and foremost, a sensor nin. And right now she was feet away from the largest chakra battery in the world. It would be like comparing her matchstick to a steel forge going full blast. It's really nice to meet you Naruto smiled, bringing a small blush to the little girl's face, though oddly enough, instead of getting closer to him, like most women would have by now, she instead moved away slightly and squished herself closer to Sasuke. Naruto blinked. Well that's odd, though I can't say I don't like this bit of blackmail material he got a little closer, and the girl moved farther away in turn. Is something wrong Karen? Sakura asked the girl curiously. And no. She replied shakily. I it's just that I I'm a sensor, and Naruto-sen is. Shining like a neon sign on the sun. Naruto suggested. The girl nodded, scooting back a bit more which now placed her damn near sitting in his teammate's lap, snuggling as close as possible to the boy. It seems you have a fan Sasuke, and this one doesn't screech like the others. A smirk found its way on the blonde's lips. I think that should be love at first sight for you. Both Sasuke and Karen turned a brilliant shade of red, doing an admirable job of matching their key features, namely Karen's hair and Sasuke's Sharingan. Ibaka. The redhead stuttered. I I just met Sasuke Kun. Naruto's eyebrow rose at that. Kun is it? Moving awfully fast aren't we? If anything the girl turned an even brighter shade of red, almost literally shrinking down like a little puppy in Sasuke's lap. I am going to stab you, Naruto. Sasuke growled in annoyance. Take a number and get in line, asshole. Naruto quipped, turning his back to his team to stare at the tower off on the horizon, the sun just peeking above the trees on its way down, casting sharp reds and purples up into the air. I think we ought to move out now while we still have the chance, you three up for moving. Sasuke shrugged his shoulders. Night's as good as daylight for a ninja. I'm fine with it. Sakura agreed. I guess I could go with you. Karen poked her fingers together, staring up at Sasuke quietly. I would have dragged you to the tower regardless. Naruto spoke out. No family of mine is getting left in this forest on their own while I'm around. Karen nodded shakily, still wincing at the sheer power emanating from the blonde's body. Then let's move out. A half dozen hours later, really starting to hate this forest. Naruto growled as they passed the same tree for the fifth time. Yeah, pretty sure we're in a Jinjutsu. Sasuke flashed his Sharingan to get a good look around. Yeah, definitely. But I can't see the person who's casting it to break it. Baron blinked, having not realized that they were in a Jinjutsu until Sasuke had said something. If you want to know where someone is, why not ask me? I have plenty of practice finding people with my sensor abilities. You don't need to tell me twice. Naruto growled. Just find these bozos so I can flatten them, right? The girl backed away slowly from the angry teen. Taking a moment to center herself, the girl projected her senses off into the forest around her, picking up minute fluctuations of chakra. It was sort of difficult to pinpoint the signatures with Naruto's blazing sun standing right next to her, but in the end she managed to find them. There, at 4 o'clock, 132 meters ahead and 2 meters underground. Anything else? Nope, pissed off. Forming a few shadow clones the boy and his doubles flew through a dozen or more hand seals. Naruto smash. Earth release. Earth flow divide. Throwing out one of the few beer anchor earth ninjutsu the boy knows, the ground split and ruptured several times around the area, leaving a massive sinkhole where the girl had pointed at. Like a haze the air around them faded, and the forest of death towers stood out even closer than it had before. Good. Naruto nodded, rushing off in the tower's direction. Is he always like this? Karen asked cautiously, not wanting to get on the blonde's bad side. We've been walking in circles in a place he calls home. Sasuke ran to catch up with his teammate. How would you like it if people cast you in your home and you wandered around for several hours in your living room? Fair point. Karen frowned. That would be pretty irritating. And Naruto doesn't play nice when he's irritated. Sasuke chuckled back. I'll keep that in mind. Congratulations you three. A single finger poked Ruka, who had met the three genin, plus guest, out in the lobby, after they had opened both their scrolls together. I'm tired, hungry and annoyed, we can do this later. Naruto grumbled, poking the scar a second time for good measure. The man in question nearly busted out laughing right there never change Naruto, never change after a small chuckle session the man led the four, which included Karen, whom the three vouched for, Naruto included, since he was going to do his best to get Karen to move to Konoha. There was no way in hell he was letting a family member stay anywhere near the same place as that snake and grass, lol, Orochimaru. And here are your rooms. The Chunin opened the door with several beds all in a row. Get comfortable, you still have to wait two days for the second stage to end. Quiet now, bed. Naruto jumped a dozen paces to his mattress, did a flip mid-air, then belly flopped onto the comfortable piece of furniture. 
Karen's staying here and tell me when the Hokage gets here so I can talk to him about her. And do Naruto. The Chunin chuckled, shaking his head at the boy's antics while throwing a little salute over his shoulder as he left. Naruto flipped over onto his back and laid his head on a pillow, idly, noting that his two teammates and Karen were doing the same, the red-haired girl sharing the bed with Sasuke of all people, who was trying to look all cool about it but was failing miserably, mainly because he was blushing up a storm because his cousin, what he assumed she was, had latched herself back onto to his leg and was using Sasuke's thigh as a pillow, coming dangerously close to the goods for the Ichiha's liking. The blonde grinned at his teammate's misfortune, whatever the hell happened next, it could wait until he had some sleep or he'd likely start going Kyubi on someone's ass. Yeah, it could wait. Chapter 19. Round 1, Fight. The next two days went by quickly for Team 7 as the three genin focused on scoping out their competition. Out of the eight teams that made it through the second exam, Naruto and company had rated them like so. Teammate. Kiba, Shino and Hinata. Threat level. Low mid. Don't hurt Hinata too bad and Naruto won't have to hack you up. Team 9 guy. Niji, Tenten and Lee. Threat level. Mid-high. Like Hinata, Tenten is not touchy. Niji needs a desperate ass beating and Lee is not one to be trifled with. Team 10. Shikamaru, Ino and Choji. Threat level. Low. Ino's a fangirl, Shikamaru is a lazy bastard and Choji is a fattest don't tell him I said that. Please easy pickings. Team Sand. Kankuro, Tamari and Gara. Threat level. Hi don't hack with. Tamari, like the other girls Naruto sank his claws into, Kankuro may look like a geisha, but seems like a credible threat. Gara, Stay. The hack. Away. Team Kabuto. Kabuto. Two other forgettable bastards. Threat level. Low Kabuto's the real threat, the other two are a write-off that'll probably only be good for meat shields. Team Sound. Kin, Zaku, Dosu. Threat level. Mid. Both the guys are going to die. Painfully. Kin. Naruto's blood boiled as he put a protective hand around the sound girl who was standing next to his team. This didn't go unnoticed by the other genin who noticed several bruises on the girl's face and arms. Well the other two sound men looked like they had been roughed up rather harshly, but nothing that would cripple them in any noticeable way. The blonde Jinchuriki could still feel the ache in his knuckles after giving Dosu that black eye and the burning rage of why he had to do so. The day before, Naruto giggled. Not chuckled, snickered or laughed, the blonde maverick let out an uncharacteristic set of bubbly snorts that would have been rather unbecoming of one of his masculinity if said male hadn't been holding a damning piece of blackmail in his hand. A picture of Karen laying half-naked on top of a certain sleeping Acha. Both of them in a rather embarrassing and erotic pose. Courtesy of your friendly neighborhood Yuzumaki. Naruto giggled again as he made his way to Anko's room, this sort of thing would have the kinky special Jonin rolling on the floor. That's when he heard it. The meaty contact of flesh on flesh. Something was definitely wrong. It wasn't a punch as most would think when hearing that kind of impact, though the groan of pain that accompanied that noise did put Naruto on edge. Sealing away the picture, Naruto crept silently down the hallway to a far out of the wear room that he had discovered was the room for the sound team just a few hours earlier. Expanding his senses into the room behind the closed door, Naruto picked up several disturbing things. The smell of blood and fear along with anger and the distinct feeling of violence. His sharp ears picked up several grunts of exertion and the sound of a woman trying and failing to hold in her tears. The conversation that the three voices within were having during all this sent red flags blaring. You stupid bitch. We almost had them, but you had to go and get your ass kicked by the pink-haired loser. Another slap resounded. Zaku is correct. Dosu said in a strange strained voice. If you hadn't lowered your guard to that woman, we would have completed our mission. Now that Sasuke is here in the tower it is all but impossible to complete our objective, this is your punishment. Kin sobbed quietly. Hey Dosu. Hurry up, I want a tur dot. Whatever he was about to say was cut off as the air in his throat was choked out of him. What was that Zaku I didn't hear Dosu looked up to see angry red eyes with dagger thin pupils inches from his face. Ah. Who the hell are you blackness covered his vision before he could say another word, a sharp pain in the back of his head, alerting him to a blunt strike, though he was already unconscious by the time that registered. Bastards. Naruto spat on the scum at his feet. The blonde turned to the a girl who was tied down to the bed Dosu had just been occupying. Kin's face was bloody, with a swollen eye, and her lip was busted in several places, all along her arms were bruises, where it looked like she had been grabbed, and around her wrists, where she had fought her restraints. She was also completely naked. That only confirmed and angered Naruto further as he kicked Dosu in the face, breaking the man's nose. Hopefully he'd choke on his own blood, maybe that would atone for this travesty. Naruto cut the girl's restraints and helped her sit up. SHH, it's gonna be alright. She immediately grabbed the blonde shirt and sobbed into his clothing. 
Naruto grimaced after Sakura's near encounter with much the same, having to see the act in progress, and its inevitable aftermath was much much worse, and it only sent his blood boiling more. As soon as he got another crack at these guys, they were going to die. But not right now. No, now he had to help Kin out of here. Enemy or not, no one deserved this. W wait. Naruto blinked and looked down at the girl in his arms, even though she was only a few inches shorter than he was, she seemed absolutely tiny right now, huddled into his chest. P please, I don't. I don't want to feel like this. She wiggled in his grasp while rubbing her legs together, a pleading in her voice that made the blonde uncomfortable. Please, help me forget. Naruto gulped. Are you asking me what I think you're asking me? Kin nodded. Naruto swallowed a hard lump in his throat. Put on the spot, the blonde was having a hard time saying no to the girl. Sure, he could come up with a myriad of reasons to deny her. But then he superimposed Sakura's face on Kin's and his heart clenched up. He couldn't say no to someone whose eyes seemed so lost, she was asking him to help her forget the feeling of her rights as a human being violated, callously tossed aside like cheap trash. Anyone would find some reason to take control of their existence, and here she was asking of him, begging him, pleading even. Resigned, Naruto nodded, using Shunshin to quickly move them to his room and do as was asked. Though he didn't enjoy it, he just couldn't say no to someone who seemed so desperate. He made sure to honor Kin's wishes and consequently made sure she never forgot about him. Banko's eyebrows rose as she watched Naruto's actions with Kin from the control room of the tower. Her assistants. Raiden Amy Ashi and Genma Shiranui sat at the console, gaping somewhat at the blonde's goal. Should we do something? Raid masked cautiously, glancing over his shoulder at Anko. Aside from assaulting another team which they rightly deserve, mind he hasn't done anything wrong, and there aren't any rules against. Fraternizing. As long as nothing important is revealed. Genma shared his companion's hesitation as he eyed the snake mistress. You're not going to go on a murderous rampage because your boy toy is sleeping with another woman. Are you? Blunt, but so was Anko, and she only appreciated bluntness when facing something like, nope. Except when Anko casually dismissed it like an everyday occurrence. Both her stooges started. Dot why? Was the general question between them. Because. Anko turned her nose up at them. I know how to share and my husband already has several other women in his little harem. Anko let out an evil and slightly perverted fufu 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 that made both men pale several shades of white. Anko walked off, still laughing as the two special Jonin leaned in close together. Did she say husband? Genma whispered conspiratorially. What? You didn't know. Raiden whispered back. When she said she was married, I thought that was a joke. She was married to the Yuzumaki kid when he was seven. It was a political maneuver to protect the kid. Ugh, politics. Genma's face curled up in disgust. A necessary evil I guess. And Anko actually agreed to it. Raiden nodded from what I can tell it was a mutual thing. And don't tell anyone I know this, but she's already slept with Yuzumaki. Genma blinked. What? Really? How did you find out? We got her drunk a while back and she spilled her guts about it to Kurinai. Had the Ice Queen's face as red as her eyes. Genma nearly choked on him. She did what the man blinked. Wait, if the kid could satisfy Anko. Genma stared at the screen where Naruto and Kin disappeared into Naruto's room. Well damn, I kinda feel sorry for that sound girl now. Raid nodded sagely she had a limp for a couple days and a very, very satisfied smile on her face for the longest time. She was also a bit more frisky in her torture sessions, poor bastards. May the log have mercy on their souls. Genma intoned. Amen. Raiden agreed. Present. Ahem. Naruto and the rest of the gathered genin turned as one to see the hookage step up onto the dais along the back wall of the room facing them. And then went into a 20 minute long speech that has no real importance for anything, but padding out an otherwise boring topic of the basis for the Chunin exams. Chunin exams are a substitute for war. See how easy that was? Moving on. A sickly looking ninja stepped forward to speak. My name cough is Hey Jack, and I will be the proctor cough for the preliminaries. Is this guy contagious? Was the gist of what most of the genin were thinking, several of them leaned away from the coughing and sickly looking special jonin. Preliminaries. Kiba's voice rose up, sounding rather incredulous. Then what the heck was that out there? Inuzuka threw a thumb over his shoulder at the doors behind him and presumably the forest beyond. This time the Hokage spoke up. The Chunin exams are held to determine the best of the best of our genin Hirazan, lit his pipe and took a small drag on it. These select few are then graded by their performance by a group of lords and peers. Ideally it is your own village who has the final say if you get promoted or not, the Chunin exam is merely a stage with which you can show off your potential, as well as show that your village is a good place to do business, as opposed to those that would otherwise be adverse to a client's time and money. So we're basically grandstanding to make our village look good. Kiba again. Indeed. The Hokage nodded to Hayato to continue his explanation. 
and by the same cough reasoning. Hey, motion to the gathered crowd. Those that participate cough must be of a certain quality and finite cough amount. There is only so much time cough after all. Ankuro sneered. So we're getting weeded down to make time for a bunch of rich bigwigs. Money is money. Hey, deadpan. And ninja villages cough need an income. Always remember the cough. Oh, don't worry. Kankuro muttered bitterly. We're well aware. If Hei ate heard that he chose to ignore it. Very well then. The special Jonin's gaze rose to a certain section of wall, the Jenin's eyes followed to find a small TV screen. Since full teams are no longer cough required to proceed, you may all choose cough to continue or leave at your leisure, I will give you time cough to back out before we proceed. A certain white-haired medic gave the entire group a once-over, before his eyes met another certain sound Jonin sensei. In those eyes a small bit of goading could be found, as if saying show off a little. Kabuto adjusted his glasses interesting, my lord for a moment the medic's eyes turned sinister before they disappeared in the glint of his glasses. Orochimaru, disguised as the sound Jonin, smirked knowingly. That's right Kabuto-kun, continue my little experiment, I'd like to see what a few of these children can actually do. His eyes roved the crowd, picking out Naruto and Sasuke in short order. Especially those two. His attention briefly found Kin and Karen, his wayward servants before writing them off as inconsequential. Neither knew enough of the plan to do anything more than tip off the fact that Sound was planning an invasion, and the snake wouldn't have put it past the old monkey to already know about that little fact, or at least assume that was the case regardless. Down in the arena all of the gathered genins stood resolute, if a bit tired for a few cases. They ate looked over the assembly and nodded. Very well, seeing as none of you are forfeiting. A dull racking sound like that of a slot machine started up. A quick glance confirmed that the TV on the wall was cycling through the names of the combatants at a fast pace. Slowly, the names came to a stop. Sasuke Chiha vs Dosu Kanuda, hmm. Hei turned to the assembled genin. All but those called for cough moved to the upper viewing area. Seems luck is on my side. Dosu mused as the other genin walked past him. I have another chance at a Chiha's head after all. Sasuke glared at the mummy man. Sakura said he and his team Sasuke glanced over a kin who was still clutching Naruto tightly. Correction, make that him and his spiky-haired teammate are out for my blood. Kin mentioned he has sound-based powers that can affect the inner ear and by extension my balance. Judging by that shiny new gauntlet on his arm he had a spare. Whatever that is. Better play this by ear then and keep my distance. Sasuke's eyes flashed to the Sharingan, visually feeling up his opponent as he prepared for him to make so much as twitch of movement, though a slight twinge of pain went through his shoulder from the activation of his. He quickly realized it was the curse mark trying to strong arm its way into his mind and squash the attempt like the irritating bug that it was, leaving the flesh around the sealed mark throbbing and red. Orochimaru up in the stands watched in amusement. A basic containment seal with a lock key to emotion. How cute. But how long can you fight your desire for power, Sasuke? How long until you come to me for the strength I can easily give you? The snake Sanin smirked as his subordinate made his move. Osu started off the fight with a kunai, throwing it towards Sasuke before following behind it, gauntlet leading the charge. The Sharingan saw through the pathetic attempt at an initiative. With a rough application of chakra to his feet Sasuke shot up to the ceiling of the room. Now upside down he flashed through several hand seals, sending a barrage of phoenix flower fireballs at Dosu. You think that paltry flame can hurt me? Does growled, raising his melody arm up. Hidden art. Echo bell. He tapped the side of his melody arm, releasing a ringing noise that grew into a large cone of force that stopped the flames cold. It however didn't stop the shuriken that was hiding within the flames. Osu raised his gauntlet to block the projectiles which bounced harmlessly off his melody arm's metal surface. When he lowered his gauntlet his eyes widened as his view was filled by Sasuke's heel. Sasuke smirked evilly, feeling his foot connect with the mummy man's head. Poof. Sasuke grunted as he hit the ground, a log landing next to him. So, the enemy knows of the log's greatness. Blessed did it be. Sasuke rolled to his feet, instinctively raising his arm to block the punch that would have caved in his skull. Gotcha. Dosu smirked under his bandages as he flicked his melody arm again. Almost immediately Sasuke's eyes crossed as the liquid in his inner ear vibrated, causing severe vertigo. A kick from Dosu sent him flying back into a wall, spreading spider web cracks through it. Damn, this isn't a fun feeling. It felt like his insides were spiraling in a washing machine and his guts were set on rinse. It was only thanks to his Sharingan that he was even standing at all, the photographic imaging of the eyes telling his brain that despite it having no sense of balance that yes, you are standing up straight. To keep from having a confusing overlap as his eyes swam, the boy closed his left eye and allowed his right to focus on the enemy. That's a nice trick. He hawked, spitting out a wad of bile. But you'll have to do better than that, cheeky brat. The sound nin rushed in for another punch. Sasuke swapped out with a log that Dosu had used, making the other nin smack his hand painfully into the wooden thing's surface. 
Dosu quickly realized the danger and rolled out of the way of several more fireballs. Quite the pyro, aren't you? Dosu pointed out using his gauntlet to again clear the small flurry of fire. Is this the best you have or are you just a one-trick pony? Hum at me and find out. Sasu growled, covertly molding lightning release chakra in his hands. Taking the boast as a challenge the sound nin rushed forward, completely confident in his hand-to-hand -hand abilities. That poor poor bastard. Sasuke Sharingan spun wildly as Dosu closed in. Then, in one of the most brazen and balsy moves anyone had ever seen, the young Ichiha didn't even try to block the punch. Instead he took the hit with a strained grunt and groaning ribs, his hands latching around the metal gauntlet. Gotcha. The Ichiha mimicked the mummy's earlier words as a spark traveled down his arm, igniting a blue buzzing ore in the boy's hand. Somewhere intermixed with that buzzing was the smell of cooking bacon, but Dosu was too stunned to move. Having electricity running through you and a metal gauntlet that could easily be turned into a parabolic radar dish makes for a very, very bad situation, as Dog's arm was literally cooked like a rotisserie chicken. It didn't help that the taser running through him kept his muscles from moving more than a fraction of what they were capable of. It was a solid 30-10 seconds before the buzzing stopped and Dosu was able to break free, but by then the damage was done. Dosu clawed the smoking metal off of his arm and found to his horror that his arm was dark and shriveled like a piece of bacon, with painful lesions up and down the area that was covered by his gauntlet. It was an injury that would cripple him, but he wouldn't be conscious enough now or ever to realize this. Regaining some of his advanced motor function with that applied lighting, Sasuke flipped backwards until he was standing atop the large hand seal statue in the back of the room. Sasuke Ichiha was the kind of person who buried his enemies, he wasn't like Naruto who could sweet-talk the Shinigami himself if given the incentive. The sound bastard had tried to kill him and his entire team, he wasn't going to give him a chance to attempt it again. Seeing a perfect chance to try out a new technique, Sasuke pulled out a pair of shuriken and threw the windmill blades at his opponent, the wires attached to the spinning wheels of death, wrapped around Dosu once before the shuriken slammed into the walls behind his opponent. Now standing there, wrapped in wire, Dosu struggled in vain as the last loyal Ichiha of Kanoha flashed through several hand seals, ending on Tora, which also clamped around the wire held in his mouth. Fire style. Dragon flame jutsu. Flames erupted around Sasuke, coiling around the wire before being sent down it like the roaring dragon of its namesake. The fireball struck Dosu head on. None of the proctors tried to help him as he hadn't forfeited and was still strong enough to be a credible threat to Sasuke, the proctors saw no need to step in and save the sound nin. The fact that Raid Genma might have spread the word of that particular contestant's actions towards his teammate the day prior had absolutely nothing to do with it. Nothing at all. Let it be known that Kanoha respected its teams, and its teams didn't look kindly on other teams who willingly and maliciously brutalized their own teammates, a fact many would regret as they were mowed down mercilessly by said Kanoha ninja. The winner is Sasuke Chia. Heid announced as the medic nin carted Dosu's smoking body away, surprisingly enough the man lived through the attack, but his career as a ninja was now unequivocally over. Sasuke nodded with a quick HN as he made his way up to the upper platform. Now for the next match. Heid called, the TV in the back scrolled through the remaining names for several moments, ding, Anada Hayuga vs Niji Hayuga. Chapter 20. Round 2, Fight. Anada Hayuga vs Niji Hayuga. The two Hayuga stared each other down as they made their way to the arena floor. As Hinata passed by Naruto, she felt a comforting hand pat her shoulder, knowing that her future husband was rooting for her, it made Hinata's determination to win even greater. Not that she was going to lose, not when she had. Hei coughed, glancing back and forth as the two Hayuga settled in front of him. The second match is about to begin, are you both ready? A pair of nods answered. All right then, you may begin. Before leaping back to watch the fight, Hinata-sama. Niji greeted coldly as the two faced each other on the arena floor. I did not expect to fight you this soon, but I cannot say I am not looking forward to it. He by Akigan flashed to full power as he glared at the girl across from him. I will give you this one chance Hanada, give up, I will not go easy on you, and I will not stop until you are bloody on the floor. Hanada stood there for several seconds, stiff as a board with her eyes closed. Then at some unseen signal the girl's eyes snapped open, by Akigan flaring in them. Niji. I know that we haven't spoken as family for quite some time, but I've changed since last we sparred. She fell into the standard Jaiken stance of the Hyuga clan. I will not have you or our family call me a failure or weakling, not this time. Niji scowled at the casual dismissal of his charity, but that scowl soon turned into a frown as his own Byakugan scanned her stance. From casual observation, there didn't appear to be any openings in her guard. You. Have improved somewhat. Niji grudgingly admitted, though he went into his own Jaiken stance. However. The scowl returned. It will not be enough. 
and like a crack of lightning the two were in each other's faces, throwing and blocking Jiyuakin's strikes with impunity, appearing almost like a mirror of each other, as they blocked low and high, adjusting stabbing fingertips or palm strikes by mere millimeters. Lee blinked in surprise. So fast. Coming from Lee, at least for those who knew the boy's true speed, that was a compliment. Naruto, who stood next to him, nodded. That's a surprise to me as well, she wasn't nearly that fast the last time we shared together. Naruto's gaze turned suspiciously to Anko. You wouldn't have had anything to do with that, would you? Anko cracked a hair-thin grin. Perhaps. Naruto quietly fascinated with a small groan. What did you teach her? Kurinai, who had overheard the conversation, moved closer as well. Yes, what did you teach my student Anko? The glare she leveled the purple-haired special could have peeled paint. Oh. Not much. Anko sing songed. I may have put her through the mini gauntlet a bit and maybe, just maybe taught her a bit of spitting cobra to go along with it. Naruto froze, turning slowly, mechanically to Anko. You did what? She did what? Kurinai parroted the younger Genin, though in confusion rather than horror. The gauntlet. Naruto sighed, rubbing his forehead for the small headache blossoming up there. Is an obstacle course meant for Anbu captains and any Anbu willing to test themselves. It's very secretive and highly dangerous. The mini gauntlet is a course Anko put together herself a few years back to mimic some aspects of Anbu training and keep herself in shape. There's far less danger of course, but it's still something that would make most cringe to think about. And spitting cobra? She asked. Naruto released his head to stare down at the two Hyuga who were even now trading blows, every so often scoring a glancing hit. Some aspects of snake style are surprisingly similar to the Jayuikin. My Viper variation for instance is meant for cherry tapping pressure points, not unlike the Jayuikin's ability to strike. Anko's Pit Viper is a variation that uses her love of poisons in conjunction with this, Python is meant for defense, while using single heavy strikes to break bones, and Anaconda is meant for strictly heavy frontal strikes, Boa is a happy medium between the two. Naruto stared down at the fighting pair and indeed noticed aspects of Spitting Cobra and Hinata's style, it was barely there, but there was enough of the mincet for him to notice. Spitting Cobra however, a sharp smack echoed as Niji was sent over to Kettle, as Hinata's rising knee caught the quickly ducking older Hayuga in the jaw. As that. Naruto finished with a snort. Tiba whistled quietly off to the side. Damn, Hinata is kicking his ass. A knee strike. Kurinai frowned. In a Jayukin fight. How odd. Not odd. Naruto pointed out. Unexpected, unorthodox and most importantly, unblockable. Bakashi nodded along with the points. Between two Jayuikin users it would be. With a focus on the hands to deliver strikes, most practitioners neglect other points of the body, preferring to strike from a solid base so that they can move seamlessly into their Jayuikin base. Niji is finding out the hard way that you can only block so much with your hands alone. Anko grinned devilishly as Hinata moved in with another combo that set the rapidly backpedaling Niji back on his heels. Spitting Cobra teaches lightning fast strikes with every point of the body, knees, elbows, palms, fingers, heels, toes, shins, shoulders, even the forehead if it's required. An elbow caught Niji in the shoulder, causing the team to grunt in pain as it sent him into the far wall. Combined with the Jayuikin and Byakugan it creates a high impact soft style. Had Hinata wanted to kill Niji then this battle would have already been over with that first knee strike. She can use Jayuikin through the other points of her body. Kakashi hemmed to himself, focusing more on the interesting fight. A strike to the chin would have traveled to the brain and left him brain dead. Hiba, who had been listening to the explanation, simply shook his head. Damn, remind me not to piss off Hinata, ever. Uli noted. Shino agreed quietly. Niji meanwhile was not doing well. He had taken to dodging Hinata's strikes, quickly and painfully readjusting his shoulder into place after taking several glancing hits, numbing his shoulders and hip. How is this possible? His mind all but screamed at him, dodging as best he could. A strike to the jaw had been a wake-up call and forced him to use all of his not-so-inconsiderable speed to dodge Hinata's odd fighting style. I warned you, cousin. Hinata glared, facing Niji in her modified Jaikin stance. I will not be so easily defeated. The veins around her eyes bulged as the Byakugan flared with chakra. Niji froze as he stared into the determined eyes of his cousin. How is she this strong? It's only been a half a year since the last time we spared, how could she become so powerful so soon? He focused on her body again with his Byakugan, scanning the girl's Tenketsu and her Karakuke. What he found after close observation sent a small shiver down his spine. Her network has doubled in size. And the Tenketsu. There. Pulsing. He didn't have time to ponder the meaning of that as Hinata closed the distance between them to match him to Jutsu to Tejutsu again. Fingers and palms traded blows as an occasional odd elbow or knee made its way into the fight. The pair danced around each other, trading attacks that would have punched holes through cinder blocks, every once in a while scoring a solid hit as exhaustion started to make itself known. 
The duel of speed and skill ended however, with the pair standing back to back, breathing heavily and watching the other through their biakugan. Have you noticed it yet, Niji? Hinata breathed harshly behind him, slinking lower into her stance. Niji remained silent as he stared at Hinata through his biakugan, still trying to figure out how she was matching him in strength and speed. He would have found it a bit easier to understand if that blasted flashing of her tenketsu wasn't so Arita Niji's eyes widened even further to dispute his Byakugan's already bulging state, all the Jayuken strikes he had landed were dissipating. How? I knew I would have to fight you eventually, cousin. Hinata smiled sweetly. And I prepared myself to fight you especially. She felt Niji tense up behind her as what she said dawned on him. She could negate the short-term effects of individual Jayuken strikes. Then the only way to defeat her would be to go for a completely debilitating or lethal blow. So be it. Hinata. A scowl formed on Niji's face. It would have been better if you had just given up, I apologize in advance, but. An arm lowered while the other raised, lowering his body nearly to the floor. You are in range of my divination. Surprisingly Hinata looked to be rather calm in this situation as she lowered herself into a similar position. I as well, Niji and you are in range of mine. Unseen by those around them the colors of the world inverted into black and white for the two Hyuga as a yin-yang symbol formed beneath them, around that two circles with trigrams surrounding them, flared to life as their perception slowed down. Eight trigrams. Sixty-four palms. Eight trigrams. Thirty-two palms. Both fighters twisted in place, bringing fingers around in an arc of destruction. Two palms. They yelled together, each matching and deflecting the other. Four palms. Again they were matched and stopped before any strike could get through. Eight palms. The speed between them picked up as they moved only a few short inches from each other. Sixteen palms. For anyone not a Jonin and above, a wielder or Naruto the hands of the two Hyuga were nothing but a blur. Thirty-two palms. Hinata's technique finished first in the last burst speed and jabbing fingers, the girl landed in a guard position, her Byakugan flashing dangerously. Now. Niji roared in his mind, taking advantage of Hinata's loss of agility. Sixty-four palms. The elder Hyuga spun, adding more force behind the strikes as he unleashed the final part of his attack. Time slowed for both Hyuga as the adrenaline pounding in their blood sluggishly brought the fight down to where it seemed like they were fighting in slow motion. Hinata-sama. Niji sneered. Your fate was decided the moment that you were chosen to fight M. What? The older Hyuga blinked in shock as the first couple of strikes struck their intended target, but shockingly Hinata had raised her hands and was standing in a very odd pose, almost like that of a sumo wrestler. While well, strange, the next set of dozen blows were stopped with the palms of her hands, as were the next. And the next. By the time the 64th and final blow had landed the girl's hands were bruised red and purple, but it weathered most of the damage. The next moment Hanada was in his face. I told you Niji, I was completely prepared to defeat you. Stars flared in his vision as Hanada's forehead flattened his nose against his cheek. Niji's head flew back and his eyes closed, though with his Byakugan active, he didn't miss a single movement, as Hinata spun to where her back was facing him, and their bodies were so close as to almost be touching. Eight trigrams the girl intoned before letting out a harsh shout, slamming both of her elbows back into the larger Hyuga's sides. Sumkatsu. Chakra arsed from the tips of her elbows, slamming into his stomach with the force of a wrecking ball. The chakra traveled so quickly and violently through his body that it exploded out the back, tearing through the fabric of his shirt in the process. Niji folded over the blow for a moment, mouth gaping and blood flying from his lips, before inertia finally reasserted itself, and he flew back into the wall behind him, sending spiderweb cracks through the stone before he fell to the floor. A8 walked over to the still body of Niji and checked his pulse. After several moments he nodded. Hinata Hayuga is the winner by knockout. All strength seemed to leave Hinata's legs as she collapsed to a kneeling position, chakra exhaustion setting in. Hinata grimaced slightly as her Byakugan deactivated. It seems. Even with all the training I've gone through, I'm still unable to pulse my chakra like that for long periods of time. She clenched numb and bruised fingers, feeling slightly sick at the dark purplish bruises over the of her palms that would definitely take a while to heal. As the medic carted off Niji, Hinata turned to her audience, one crazy blonde in particular, and smiled beatifically. Way to go Hinata. Kiba pumped a fist as Shino next to him let out a grunt and a small nod of acknowledgement, Naruto just smiled proudly. She has definitely improved by leaps and bounds. Kurinai mused quietly, though her expression soured as her head turned to regard her purple-haired friend. You didn't teach her anything else, did you? Particularly anything. Unsavory. Enko snorted. Kurinai let out a long, suffering sigh. Did you at least teach her what protection is? Enko's return giggle did little to settle the woman's fears. Cough, ahem. Everyone's eyes were drawn to Hade, who was once again in the center of the room. Now that I have your attention, the next match will soon begin. The matching board once again clicked through the remaining names until Shino Aburam vs Yoroi. 
the two combatants eyed each other up as they made their way to the bottom of the arena. So I get the creepy silent guy, eh? Yorway clenched his fists in anticipation. Let's see what these Aburum can actually do against someone of my skills. A fellow leaf nin. Shino ran a critical eye over the nin, noting his dress and any weapons upon his person. Hmm, it lacks any noticeable weapons aside from a kunai pouch. Calluses on hands and fingers denote extensive tojutsu practice, air of confidence present, close combat would be unwise. Further, clothing is similar to that of his teammates, suggesting a speciality between the three of them, given that it is a variation of medical core issue clothing, it is quite possible that they have knowledge of the body and possible medical fighting ability, caution warranted. After the clinical deconstruction of his opponent's possible abilities, Shino stood more confident in front of his opponent, though he still prepared a bug clone, just in case he was wrong. Hey glanced at the two silent fighters before slashing his hand down between the two. Begin. Before leaping back to allow the fighters rom. How about I start this off? Yorwe drew a kunai and launched it at Shino's chest, in response, Shino grabbed his own kunai and deflected the thrown weapon to the ground. Moments later another kunai ground along the blade surface, this one held in Yorwe's hand. Quick reflexes, I like that. The man's hand lanced forward to grab a hold of Shino's kunai arm and immediately started glowing a dull blue. Shino's eyes widened behind his sunglasses as he switched places with his bug clone, his previous position exploding in a swarm of angry kakechu. Ah. Yorwe swatted at the swarm of bugs before leaping away to distance himself from the tiny parasites that were eating away at his chakra. As the man got to his feet, he noticed that Shino was standing a dozen or so feet from him, a curious look on his face. I see the chakra absorbing abilities of your clan run through. Yorwe ground out, draining the chakra from the bugs until they were husks on the ground. You have a similar ability. Shino noted, his dry monotone sounding almost bored. Though, if you were to listen, you could hear an air of curiosity in his voice at finding another person whose main combat skill was absorbing chakra. Shall we continue? Indeed. The two clashed again, Yorwe scoring glancing hits from his chakra-stealing fingers, even as the Kakechu continued to suck chakra from his body. The match came to a standstill as Shino locked hands with Yorwe, the smaller area of contact further from his chakra coil, giving him precious seconds to think. Yorwe, seeing his chance, forced his chakra-stealing powers out full blast. In response to the large amount of chakra flow, Shino's bug swarmed his opponent, their thousands of tiny mouths keeping pace with Yorwe's greedy hands, even as Yorwe's powers started to kill them off while dragging the aburum around the room, playing keep away from the swarm. Up in the stands Kakashi shook his head, his team glancing at him silently. Both of them are absorbing each other's chakra, it's now a race to see who runs out first. Yeah. Sasuke stared down at the fighters with his Sharingan active. There's an almost visible ring of chakra circling between the two. Do you think Shino can win? Naruto frowned. Because I don't really like the smell coming from him and his teammates. Sakura and Sasuke nodded, Kin however, had a small look of confusion on her face. Smell. She asked quietly beside him. Naruto has really good senses. Sakura whispered to her. Like all good foxes. Karen chuckled. So what does he smell like anyway? Naruto grimaced. It's faint, but they smell like snakes the rest of Team 7, Karen and Kin, flinched at that. Kakashi's eyes sharpened as he took a deep whiff of the air as well. Now that you mention it. The Jonin mumbled, eyes darting to the other side of the arena to the Jonin sensei of the sound team. For a moment he met the eyes of the Jonin and felt more than saw the amusement in his snake-like eyes. Kakashi froze, he'd have to report this to the Hokage. After the matches. Arachimaru may be Balsi by coming here, but there were plenty of people that he could take hostage. He needed to be discreet about this. Down on the arena floor, Yorwe and Shino were still locked in a battle of wills, seeing who would drop first. Shino tried to pry Yorwe's arms off Ugg. This situation is not the best of circumstances. Try as he might he couldn't shake the other leaf nin off, and their struggle ended up on the floor in an impromptu wrestling match, where a single lapse in concentration would spell the end. Yorwe ended the clench first as he found his way on top of his opponent, taking a chance, then quickly grabbed a kunai and tried to slam it home. Shino used his forearm to block the downward stab, but flinched as Yorwe dropped the kunai above his head. The kunai missed his eye by mere centimeters as it stuck in the floor. Then the small explosive tag attached to the handle exploded. A thick blanket of smoke erupted as the two nin separated, Yorwe leapt to the left, relatively unharmed with a side benefit of most of what few Kakechu left attached to him, were either killed by the shockwave or blown off during the explosion, Shino on the other hand, went right, and was honestly lucky to be alive right now, had his Kakechu not absorbed most of the explosion with their bodies, he would probably be missing the flesh and bone from half his face. As it stood, his ears were ringing and there were spots in his vision, as the bright flash made it through his sunglasses and the thick layer of bugs. Going over a quick mental check of his bugs left the team grimaced under his collar. 
less than 45%. Conditions unfavorable for continued battle. He stared down at the bugs crawling along his arms for a moment, contemplating the best method to handle Yoroi. He absorbs chakra as quickly as I do and can kill my Kakechu by draining their chakra, is also difficult to pin with my Kakechu, the only time he slows down is when. Abiram narrowed his eyes slightly. Yes. That could work. Shino calmly closed the distance between them until they were only a dozen feet from each other. Your skills are. Admirable. He eyed the blue glow of chakra on the other nin's hands warily. A worthy opponent. The Oroi nodded slowly, always keeping Shino in his field of view. You as well, bug boy. The two nodded, a small bit of respect passing between them as they rushed at each other. Shino watched carefully for the moment he could initiate his plan, as he carefully dodged the other nin's grip. His eyes sharpened when he noticed Yorway going for another grapple, the bug nin mimicked his movements, and their hands clasped again in a bid for dominance, though with less Kakechu to drain his opponent's chakra he was starting to feel the fatigue of this plan of action. No matter what few bugs he had left encompassed the entirety of the two fighters, obscuring them from outside view. At some unseen signal the two leapt away from each other, each staring the other down. This is getting us nowhere. Yorway growled. Don't you have anything else besides those damn bugs? Several people behind Yorway started snickering. Shino adjusted his glasses, taking in his opponent for a moment. I suppose. He held up a half hand sign. That I could simply end this with a bang. Yorway's eyes widened as he felt more than heard the hissing noise behind him, then he knew no more as an explosion enveloped him. Did Shino just make a joke? Kiba mumbled to himself, a bit shocked that the normally humorless bug user had actually attempted something resembling humor. Bug delivered explosive tags to the back haha. <laughs> Freaking priceless. Naruto wiped a small tear from his eye, laughing too hard to really say much more than that. Pei-8 held a hand up to get the attention of the audience. Winner of the third match, Shino Aburam. As the bug user made his way back to the stands the randomizer screen started ticking through the participants. Please let me be next, please let me be next. Lee was nearly doing backflips in his excitement. Please let me not be next, please let me not be next. Shikamaru, obviously. Not Lee or Gara, not Lee or Gara. Naruto. The three most emotional about the exams let out various noises as the screen clicked into place. Lee groaned in disappointment, Shikamaru sighed in relief, Naruto swallowed in worry. The next match is decided, Sakura Haruno vs Gara of the Desert. Sakura took a leaf out of Naruto's book and cursed vehemently. I am an evil bastard, I know this, your assurances are unnecessary at this point. Several of Hinata's abilities were drawn from a couple of characters who I like a lot, one's from a video game, the other is from an anime. I'm sure you can figure out the anime one fairly quickly, but can you figure out the Vidigam reference in this chapter? Eight trigrams? Sumkatsu, Twin Bone, C rank, the double Jaiwa can strike of considerable power. Can be used with the hands but can be used with similar effect via the elbows, knees or feet, if the hands are incapable of performing it. Amic, and not as true power. Because reasons. Warning, this is kind of huge for an Amic. Hey, glanced back and forth between the two Hayuga. You may begin. Before leaping back to watch the fireworks. Anata Sama. Niji greeted her coldly as the two faced each other on the arena floor. Give up now, failure, you have no chance of defeating me. Anata winced as her cousin's words bit deep into her feelings, the girl hung her head, eyes low and shadowed by her hair. Judging this to be her resolve weakening, Niji continued to stick in the metaphorical knife. Just give up, you have no business in this exam, fate has shown time and again that you will never defeat me. Anata flinched, if one were close enough you could hear a distinct click-click noise, like a switch being pulled. That's when the collective audience froze, those that weren't experienced enough to know only felt the slightest twinges on their peripheral. The more hardened ninja there, felt what could only be their sixth sense screaming at them to make it stop. Then Hinata's eyes turned wistful as her pseudo half-brother talked down to her. Niji Nai the blunette's lip lifted up into a small pout. Why do you have to be so mean to me? Oh. Oh god. Naruto's eyes twitched. The orb along with its sibling glancing over at Anko who was fighting to hold in her giggles. Naruto casually walked over to his first wife, eyes still twitching as he did so. You didn't. It was said in such a deadpan tone that Anko's meager self-control faltered allowing her silent guffaws to escape her. Oh, but I did, muhehehe. <laughs> her laugh turned evil as Kurunai inched closer to the pair. And what exactly did Anko do to my student? The red-eyed woman fixed her friend with a withering stare, which only egged the snickering woman on more. Naruto fasipumed you'll see. Meanwhile Niji was feeling rather. Uncomfortable. Hi. The cousin was crying large tears with eyes far too bright and emotional to be natural. And Niji Nii wa. Hinata held her hands over her eyes, little teardrops filling her palms before falling from her hand to the floor. You're so cruel. I I I only wanted to help you. 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 You baka. The girl fell to her knees and let out a wave of worthlessness and self-pity. 
why is it always me eh? The motherly instincts of every girl in the room spiked. Naruto's jaw dropped, Ara blinked. Can I snuggle her mother? Blue or maybe later Ood. Alright mother, anything for you. The rest of the men in the room felt an unusual need to protect a crying girl. Niji on the other hand felt terrible, like worse than complete scum. He hesitantly approached his crying cousin, trying several times to pat her back. He tried several more times to try and say he was SSS. I'm. I'm as sorry Hinata-sama. I, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. And like that Hinata was hugging him. Oh I'm so happy to hear that on chan Everyone in the room snapped backwards like they were physically struck by the mood whiplash. Hinata stood up on her tippy toes and brushed a kiss against Niji's cheek. Thank you Sue M-U-C-H. The elder of the two Hyuga froze. The movement didn't go unnoticed by the younger generation. Oh. Hinata's voice turned sultry as she felt her cousin stiffen in her arms. Did you like that Onai-chan? Hinata lengthened each syllable with a definite rolling purr. Niji gulped, sweat forming on his face. Her apologizing so nicely, I have to give you a reward. Her mouth turned upward in a small smirk, lips coming closer to his, tongue peeking out ever so slightly. Niji's eyes bulged in their sockets, and it had nothing to do with his biakugan. Hinata lowered the shoulders of her coat, exposing her mesh shirt and pert breasts to Niji as their lips connected. Thump, several of the males in the audience passed out with bloody noses. Then she started French kissing him. Thump, another batch hit the floor, joining their peers in sweet, sweet unconsciousness. Hinata broke the kiss, a trail of saliva connecting the two, Niji is still a statue. Hinata let out a little perverted giggle at the state of her cousin. Did you like that Onai-chan? Maybe now we can move on to other things. Niji's already bulging eyes threatened to break free of his face, as Hinata ran a hand down the front of his stomach, coming dangerously close to his thump, everyone blinked. Niji was on the floor, twitching uncontrollably and foaming at the mouth. Oh, Nuo. Hinata's eyes widened in over-exaggerated horror. Ani-chan. If anything Niji started twitching harder. Is there a doctor in the building? I'm a doctor. Kabuta leapt from the railing to tend to the ailing Hayuga and find out how the heck Hinata just did what she did, it defied all logic. After a cursory glance Kabuto came to a conclusion. I think he's suffering from shell shock. Oh no. Hinata sobbed gently, projecting the same aura of hopelessness. HNNNG. Niji's hand clenched his chest before finally, gratefully passing out. This defies all logic and reason. Kabuto mumbled under his breath. But you can help him can't you? Hinata started shaking the silver-haired man. Damn it woman, I'm a medic nin, not a psychiatrist. Kabuto pulled himself from the Hayuga girl's grasp and quickly walked away, allowing the proper medical personnel to take Niji away. Hinata stood up, bowed slightly to her audience, then skipped. Yes, bloody skipped her way back up to the viewing deck. Hey, who had been staring blankly, shook his head, blinking a couple of times to get the sheer out of his brain. Winner, Hinata Hayuga by. Whatever the cough hell that was. Naruto turned slowly, a mechanical creaking in his neck as he simply stared at Anko. You are an evil, evil woman. What? Exactly was that. Kurinai mumbled dumbly. In response Anko unsealed a rather large book from within her coat. Big Book of Seduction, Chapter 49. Innocent Big Brother Dirty Little Sister, Style 3. Naruto deadpanned. When the hell did you find time to teach her? That. When you were in Wave. She replied offhand, obviously pleased with her handiwork. Two weeks is more than enough time for me to turn any wilting flower into a budding seductress. I also may or may not have spiked the girl's perfume with a special aphrodisiac of my own concoction. You are a very bad influence. The illusion mistress shook her head mutely. The both of you. If you'll excuse me. I need a drink. Make that several. A swirl of leaves signaled her departure. You. Naruto breathed deep, wanting this to all be some bad dream. I think it's time for me to start taking the training of my spouses into my own hands. Naruto glared at Anko, who had a wicked smirk on her face, even as she tried and failed to play innocent. Naruto groaned. Kurinai is right, you are a bad influence. Anko swatted her husband on the rear. You know we both enable each other's bad behavior, don't try to deny it. Naruto rolled his eyes. I suppose so. Just warn me next time you teach one of your sister wives weapons grade cuteness like that. If for nothing better than my own sanity. And do. The snake mistress assured him. Why does that not reassure me? He sighed, rubbing his forehead in irritation. Chapter 21. Life's a beach, grab a kunai and dig it. The next match is decided, Sakura Haruno vs Gara of the Desert. Pack all kinds of duck. Sakura hissed, a shiver of doom going up her spine. Sakura. A shiver of doom which was dampened by the comforting hand of her teammate. Naruto squeezed her shoulder gently. You know you don't have to do this, and I wouldn't hold it against you if you didn't want to fight him. Sakura stared at Naruto in equal parts shock and outrage. Did you just ask me to give up? Naruto smirked. 
just checking, can't have you losing your nerve now, you'll face worse later on in life if we ever make it that far. The boy's smile faded, leaning in closer to whisper in Sakura's ear. Kayubi says that Gar is housing the Achibi and to expect sand, lots of sand. Most likely it'll come from that gourd on his back and act like an extension of his body, don't get close and don't get cornered, or it will end you faster than you can blink. Naruto hesitated for a moment, deep in thought. I know you used some of the water during your fight in the forest. How much is left? Sakura listened intently, glancing at the gauntlet on her arm. Um. I think I used it. Maybe a third. Naruto's grin returned in full force. Caillou says that if you ever find yourself cornered, let him have it all, the raccoon will sink like a stone. Same with the other one, if you need juice don't hesitate to use what I left you. They nodded. Right, wish me luck. A slap on the back and a small shove pushed her towards the stairs. You know it, get out there and kick his ass. Filled with more confidence than before, Sakura strode purposefully out to stand in front of Gara, who had sand sunshine down right after the match had been called. Weak. Gara responded dryly in an emotionless monotone. You are not strong enough to give my existence meaning. The vein throbbed on Sakura's brow as she clenched and unclenched her fists, terrified of facing a Jinchuriki on open ground, but too stubborn and filled with confidence to back down. Don't think I'm weak just because I'm a girl. She held a fist out and grabbed her bicep with the other arm. I'll show you just how strong us girls can be. You tell him Sakura. That was Ino, cheering from the sidelines. Ara seemed less than amused. Your gender doesn't matter to me, mother only cares about your blood. Okay, that was a bit unnerving. Alright, the match between Sakura Haruno and Gara of the desert, well now the proctor slashed his hand down while jumping back at the same time. Begin. Sakura responded with a volley of bladed weapons. Not the smartest opening move. Naruto bit his lip. Gara's sand stopped them cold. The exploding tags attached to the handles detonated in a raging fireball. Naruto blinked, an eyebrow raised. I stand corrected. Bakashi gave him a funny look. I've seen you hand them stacks of exploding tags before, but... Just how many of those did you give both of them? Enough. Naruto replied simply. If you want a definite amount. He paused for a moment, as if contemplating telling him, then shook his head a moment later. Enough. Bakashi's uncovered eye twitched, the orb staring blankly at his student. Back on the field, Sakura appeared through the cloud of smoke, hitting the ceiling and sticking to its surface. Her eyes flickered around the room watching for any signs of movement that would signal. A moment later a wall of sand exploded from the smoke to wrap around her leg, yanking her towards the ground. You can't escape now. The dull droning voice of her opponent remarked as he appeared out of the now settling dust, unharmed, but for a small bit of hair out of place. He pulled Sakura closer, as if inspecting a particularly boring insect, poking at it to see if it would squirm. Pathetic. Sakura spat a blob of water at him, the sand coming to his defense to stop the ballistic wad of phlegm. Gara scowled at the woman, raising a hand to crush the life out of her. Several of the Jonin tensed, ready to interfere if they were given the chance. Sakura didn't seem too worried, if anything she seemed. Smug. The girl grinned viciously as her form disappeared in a puff of smoke to reveal a log. Gara's eyes widened. The log loaded with enough explosive tags to level a small apartment complex. Boom, when the smoke cleared this time, there was now a giant smoldering crater in the center of the arena, which had a veritable web of cracks leading away from it, a similar crater in the wall opposite Sakura, was now playing host to the smoking form of Gara. Had the walls not been made of sterner stuff and reinforced with seals the building could have very well collapsed atop them. The Hokage breathed a sigh of relief, even he had some doubts about the safety of such a tactic, noting the odd creaking in the walls around him, perhaps it would be a good idea to call a recess after the match, to repair the place before it started falling down around their ears. The Kashi deadpanned, eyes boring into the student he thought he knew. Naruto chuckled, a small smirk on his lips. Like I said enough. You are an evil, evil bastard. Sasuke grumbled, though there was no real bite to it, he had just as many explosive tags on him. And him, being the pyromaniac that he was, could really appreciate a good explosion now and again. Damari, who had thought the pink-haired brat had been nothing to write home about all through the first exam, hesitated ever so slightly in her questioning do. Do you think Gara could be? She turned to look at her middle brother, who was just as on edge as she was. Out that. He whispered. It'll take a lot more than that to put him down. He nodded towards his younger brother. See, his sand armor is still on, cracked, but there. By chance, it was at that moment that Gara let out a groan of discomfort, eyes slowly regaining focus, as well as a deep-seated need to cause grievous bodily harm to the person who had caused him such discomfort. I am going to relish killing you. Slowly it was almost a growl as the crack sand on and around his body started forming along the boy's arms, creating a disfiguring pair of meat hooks that had once been a pair of human limbs. 
Naruto grimaced as a mental image from Kaya showed him that such a thing was but a prequel to a first stage biju cloak, something Sakura would have no chance against as she was, she needed to wrap this up quickly, if she had even an inkling of hope against a monster that Gara could become. Sakura meanwhile was racking her rather generously proportioned brain to come up with some method to get around the shifting sands that were starting to become rather annoying, on top of that the sand could clearly be condensed and hardened into a shell, which had protected the bastard from her precious explosion. Sakura twitched slightly, trying and failing to ignore the fact that she had just called an explosion precious and that maybe Naruto was influencing her fighting style more than originally thought. Not like that was a bad thing. But it can't be a very good thing either. Sighing, the girl clenched her hands into fists as she ducked and dodged the sand attacks that came her way, using substitution whenever she could to escape certain death by suffocation, blunt force trauma and crushing, not particularly in that order either. Stop running girl. Gara's voice was now quite a bit more gravelly than before, sending little tingly arcs of warming up the spines of those there that now knew exactly what Gara was. How do you plan to defeat me if you're too afraid to face me? Sakura bristled, her hackles raising at the insult to her determination. Glancing up at Naruto, the girl sought his permission to use everything he gifted her up to that point to utterly ruin this little twit. Naruto nodded, none too subtly and sharing a matching devilish grin with a girl who was beginning to look far more fun than previously thought. Oh? He hadn't taught her how to rig explosions like that, the cheeky girl had come up with a few things on her own time it seemed. A weighted net appeared from a scroll somewhere on Sakura's person, each strand covered liberally with exploding tags. A snap of the wrist had the thing sent towards the half-turned Jinchuriki. With a snarl, Gara threw a hand forward to launch several sand shuriken at the net, which shredded the thing into ragged cords. Ragged cords that were still somewhat explosive, not smart on his part. Another series of explosions rocked the arena, sending people scrambling to hold onto the railing provided. The scream and loud snap caused several of the genin to shudder. As the smoke cleared, many of them assumed the match had finally come to an end. Naruto sucked air through his teeth, lengthening nails digging harshly into his palm. Sakura spat up a bit of blood as the giant hand made of sand held all but an arm and leg in its cocoon-like embrace. The one leg visible was bent at an odd angle, never mind that one of the femurs was sticking out through the skin. Nowhere to run now. The demonic growl in Gara's voice had turned sinister, as if he was deriving pleasure from the blood and pain, in some ways that was exactly what he was doing. Several of the proctors readied muscles and prepared in case they needed to stop the crazy boy from killing one of their own when the match was clearly over. Who said anything about running? That stopped them cold as each one of them noticed the girl raise her weakened arm up into Gara's line of sight. Remembering the girl's devious explosions, the boy turned beast attempted to squash the life out of her. Attempted. But the small flash of chakra, what was once a dry, almost dusty arena, was now beginning to look more like an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Ah. And that was the sound of a child, clad in hundreds of pounds of sand, and the superior drowning skills accredited to those growing up in a desert wasteland, struggling to find purchase in the tumultuous rapids of the river Sakura. Sakura coughed up a mouthful of red-tinged liquid as the last remaining bit of water from her gauntlet trickled out until coming to a complete stop, her own waterlogged body struggling to remain on the water's surface, with just a single working leg and a crouched hand placed on the water. Gar was nowhere to be seen. Then. Ah. Gara's head splashed up out of the water, hands desperately pawing at the water, trying to use what few chakra control exercises he knew to grab hold of the water's surface. Sakura would have none of that. Dipping into the gauntlet on her other arm, a bright blue and thick chakra seemed to ooze out of the metal, permeating the girl for several moments before seemingly settling around her in a circle of power. The girl nearly shuddered at the outflow of energy, the intoxicating Naruto nest that was his chakra, it was almost a scent unto itself that reminded her of scorched earth that had recently been soaked by a thunderstorm. A strange analogy, sure, but Sakura took a deep breath anyway, reveling in that power, as she pulsed the chakra out of the hand that was touching the water, using what little knowledge she had of her element to brute force, what was most likely an air ink. It started slowly, a subtle current, but building into a noticeable stream that started pulling everything in the water towards the center, including Gara, who was struggling against the pull, while desperately trying to get to his feet. The glob of spit impacted his forehead, the wet and sluggish sand, doing a far poorer job of dissipating the kinetic force that staggered him back into the water. The Jinchuriki screamed bloody murder, which turned out to be a bad thing as water went down his throat, causing his screams to choke off into desperate hacking. H help. He managed to get out, the desperation in his voice a far cry to what he had used before. Up in the stands, Kankuro and Tamari nearly had a heart attack, hearing their brother say such a thing and sounding as desperate as he was. Sakura, not wanting to drown the guy, no one deserved such a horrible death, no matter how batshit insane he was, decided to help. By standing over him and gloating. 
She could be a right vindictive bitch when she wanted to be, she had to repay him for the broken leg and likely cracked ribs after all. Finally, after what felt like an eternity for all those involved as well as the audience watching, Sakura reached a hand down into the water and snagged the drowned rat that was Gara and hoisted him up onto the water's surface. Once there she held him up with her own chakra and fished a kunai out of her pocket. A quick glance around showed that the boy's sand was making a slow slither towards her and she needed to act fast, with a spinning flourish she had the blade pointing downward, hand raised to slam the blade tip first into the boy's eye and into his brain, likely the only place not covered by sand. The blade came within a hair of Gara's eye when it was stopped by Hade. I believe that's enough. He coughed into his open hand. The winner of this match, Sakura Hirono. There was a silence where Gara's eyes widened, staring up at the blade that would have, if not interfered with, claimed his existence. A subtle twinge in the back of his mind screamed at the insult, but there was only a sense of melancholy as the blade was moved away and he was gently hoisted onto a gurney by Medic Nin. Then the dam broke. She won. Naruto crowed, whooping happily. She won that was the scandalized thought of a certain snake-faced Jonin, who was quickly thinking of a way to fix this travesty towards his plan. She won that was the general consensus of the room, ranging from shock disbelief from the other Jonin, who knew what Gara was, to the just plain disbelief of the many who were clueless to Gara's true nature, but knew that the girl fighting him shouldn't have stood a chance in hell. I won. Sakura looked down at her shaking hands, the burning inside of them telling her that she had stretched her chakra network a bit too much with that last push of chakra and would likely take many days to get back to normal. Then the adrenaline started to wear off and the pain in her ribs and leg was getting harder to ignore. She was almost grateful when a similar gurney was placed next to her. After she was carted off by Medic Nin as well, Hei took a moment to get the room's attention. Off there will be a 30-minute recess in matches to clear the arena and repair damages cough now would be a good time to use the facilities or visit an injured teammate. Most of the nin in the room nodded, filtering out through one of the doors that had an earth cast around it and the water drained to allow exit. The rest of Team Kakashi and surprisingly Ino were the first to make their way toward the infirmary, followed closely behind by the elder two of the sand siblings. Sakura sat uncomfortably in her hospital bed, leg already reset and chest bound, the skin on her leg mostly healed and wrapped in thick uncomfortable bandages. Say what you will about Medic Nin, they worked fast. Unfortunately for Sakura, they had stuck her and Gara in the same room. Right across from each other. Yeah. Gara, who was still rather wide-eyed and unblinking in the face of his defeat by someone who he had considered weak, sat quiet as the grave across from her, staring into her eyes, expecting her to finish what she'd started. Sakura just wanted to sleep, she hurt all over, and this creepy kid was keeping her awake. How? The raspy and raw sounding voice was filled with something not quite an emotion. Sakura looked over to Gara, who was the only one in this particular room that was conscious enough to speak. How what? She growled, not particularly in the mood to talk to the person who broke her leg. How can you be so strong? Gara retorted back. You are nothing special. And yet you called upon such power, how? Again the boy's rude words stung at the girl's pride, but then the words themselves caught up to her. It was a gift from my teammate, Naruto. The one who is like me. Gara mumbled, though loud enough for her to hear. Like you. She blew a raspberry. Hardly. Share the same burden as you? Yeah. He's like you in that regard only. Sakura shrugged. He's acted the way he has for as long as I can remember. I don't understand. The boy sighed. Why does he care for others? What makes him so strong that he can so easily give others his strength? Am I so weak? Sakura grimaced, she really didn't want to have to deal with this. She wasn't Naruto, she couldn't bullshit an explanation for other people's problems like he could. Look, I'm not the best at this, but I'll give you the short version. Okay. The hesitant nod was more than enough. Alright, in that order, because he loves and appreciates them, they're his friends and family, because he has something to protect and helping teammates is what Kanoha does, never mind that helping people in general is never a bad thing, no, you just have an absurdly contrived weakness that would normally be covered by your teammates. She inhaled sharply, then released it. That answers your questions. Friends. Family. Teammates. The boy grit his teeth, raising a hand to his head as if he was in pain. Slowly, he growled a reply they don't love or care about me. My father has tried to kill me every chance available, and my siblings fear me like all the rest. The bitterness in his tone was more than clear. Have you ever asked them? The boy stilled, the thought having never occurred to him. Had he ever asked them what they truly felt about him? His father would probably tell him that he was the village's mistake, but he had never actually asked him or his siblings what they thought of him. No. It couldn't be that simple. Regardless, they would still fear me. Sakura shook her head. Then it would be your fault, they were willing to meet you halfway, but you were unwilling to control yourself and do the same. Ara was shivering now, the pain in the back of his head worsening. I can't control myself. 
I can't rest without the voices taking a bit more of me with them every time I try. Mother. She tells me to kill. Even now she wants your blood. She always wants more blood. That final word ended with a snarl. Sakura tensed, ready to defend herself restricted as she was to the best of her abilities. I honestly doubt that's your mother talking. Yurijin Chiriki, has it ever occurred to you that maybe, just maybe that was your burden making your life miserable because it's trying to get out of you? No. No that thought hadn't occurred to him. A sharp spark of pain hit him right in the temple, but the boy latched onto that thought like a man possessed. When was the last time he'd questioned his mother? It certainly hasn't been lately. Even now he could feel the tension building, as if in protest to what he was thinking. But why? That brought on another sharp stab of pain. No. The boy latched onto that pain and pushed it away. Immediately he felt the pressure weaken, as if his will alone was holding it back. Gara's insides churned, as if the loss of that subtle thread of pain spun him around onto his head. The world spun, but he kept pushing against that pain with all the willpower his small body could manage, hell-bent upon this course of action to the bitter end. After almost five minutes of forceful grunting and pain groaning, the Sand Nin gave one last desperate push, and almost immediately his mind stopped. No. Not stopped. It was quiet. There wasn't a voice. There wasn't a pressure on his mind, crawling around in his brain as if it had a mind of its own. Slowly, Gar returned to an upright position, having folded over to grip his covers tightly with fists and teeth, even now he could see the mauled wet spot where his teeth had ground the fibers of the cloth. Blinking once, the Sand Nin glanced up at Sakura, who was giving him a very cautious if not outright hostile stare. Everything alright? Sakura asked slowly, she did not want to be stuck in a room with an unstable and trigger-happy Jinchiriki. Gara blinked, feeling an odd tingling sensation on his stomach. Looking down after he pulled his shirt up, the two were treated to the sight of the boy's seal appearing on his skin, with one spot, which had never looked right to Gara, appeared to fill in, completing what was otherwise a broken circle. The implications were not lost on Gara as he closed his eyes for several seconds, listening for the subtle beat of his heart, something he hadn't heard for many years now, thanks to his mother. Feeling a tingle in the back of his brain, Gara's head tilted slightly, the overpowering effects of his near drowning along with the exertions just a few minutes ago were starting to take their toll. Idly the boy heard voices coming from the door to the room. Glancing over, Gara was treated to the sight of his siblings walking into the room behind the rest of Team 7, willing to meet halfway. Gara mumbled, a slight twitch of a smile forming on his lips. Maybe the pink one was onto something. Whatever else he might have thought was soon lost to the darkness of blissful sleep. Naruto raised an eyebrow at the older duo of the Sand siblings as they walked into the room, took one look at the sleeping Gara, and froze in their tracks. I take it that doesn't happen often. He never sleeps. Kankura muttered. Except when. The boy's eyes flew wide as he took a hesitant step backwards. Wait. Tamari grabbed a fistful of the puppeteer's shirt and pulled him to a stop. Slowly, oh so slowly she walked toward her sleeping brother. Gently, as if she was touching thin glass, she placed a finger on her brother's cheek. To her shock and secret pleasure, the skin was warm to the touch rather than the hard grainy shell of sand armor. How long had it been since she'd touched her youngest brother skin to skin? Naruto glanced over at Sakura who looked relieved for some reason. What happened? He asked her curiously. The girl shrugged in response. He started rambling on, asking why you were so much stronger than he was and why you seemed to care about me enough to share that power. She snorted. I told him that you had a reason to help us and that you actually cared about people. She glanced over at the sand siblings to see Kankuro hesitantly reaching out to touch his brother as well. Sakura frowned. And I suppose him saying that his family feared him was true too. Kankuro, having overheard the girl, turned a scowl on his face. Of course we fear him. Don't you think we've tried to do something? He the teen shut his mouth before he said any more, not thinking about what his words would entail, they were, after all, in enemy territory with no backup. We already know he's a Jinchuriki. Naruto rolled his eyes at the surprise on Kankuro's face. Hell we knew before the exam even started, I told your sister as much when we were making out during the first exam. That brought a small twitch of the eye to Kankuro's face. Speaking of. Sakura interrupted. He kept talking about his mother whispering things to him. Did either of you ever try to tell him that the voices she kept hearing were probably the Ichibi? Kankuro shook his head. We couldn't even get close to him until a few years ago, he was always kept away from us. It was when we became ninja that we found out why. Naruto held a hand to his chin, in thought. So he was intentionally isolated from people and forced to make assumptions on his own. He raised another brow at the duo. And then on top of that, the seal you gave him was so screwed up it allowed the Biju direct access to his mind. How hacked up was the person who sealed the Chibi into him? Did anyone think that maybe the Biju would corrupt his mind? That's what I told him. Sakura sighed, shifting a bit into a more comfortable position. 
he looked surprised, like he hadn't thought of that before. Then he started grabbing his head and looked like he was focusing really hard on something. Bakashi, who had remained quiet up until that point, broke in. Did he say anything? Sakura shook her head. No, after a few minutes of straining himself he collapsed, though he looked like a weight had been lifted off his shoulders. He checked a seal on his stomach and it looked like a piece of it was repairing itself. He. Looked surprised. Well as surprised as I've seen him. Naruto glanced up at Kakashi. You think he forced his biju down and somehow repaired his seal? Yonin shrugged. I don't know a thing about biju seals. My skills are more about combat-oriented seals. Naruto breathed out his nose in annoyance. Do you know of anyone else who'd know? Bakashi stroked his masked chin and thought for a moment, silently humming to himself. Well, I do know that Master Jurei would probably be the best to ask in this case. He is, after all, Kanoha's greatest living seal master. Though I'm not sure if he's in the village right now. Kakashi glanced down at his student and immediately noticed a sour expression that appeared on Naruto's face. Is there a problem? Yeah. Naruto grouched. The lazy perv hasn't come to visit me for over a year now, he said he'd be here during the exams. Naruto rolled his eyes. Knowing him he's probably nose deep in some bathhouse wall doing research. You know Jiraiya? Kakashi asked curiously. I knew he was sensei's sensei, but... Kakashi's single eye widened for a second before he looked down at a frowning Naruto. Wait, he's your... Keep that bit of information under your mask Kakashi. Naruto glanced over at the sand genin, then pointed to a nearby bathroom. The Jonin schooled his features what few there were and nodded. Noted. He blinked away the annoying brightness as they closed the door to the bathroom and the fluorescent bulb turned on, though that does answer a few of my questions. And raise a few more I'm sure. Naruto rolled his eyes, leaning up against a stall. If it wasn't for him chasing after that snake of his and investigating this rumored organization that he keeps mentioning in his messages, he'd likely be here now, annoying me to no end. Bakashi raised an eyebrow. I expected you to be a bit more bitter than that after finding out. Naruto snorted. And you'd be right, I met him a year after I met Anko, and he let that slip on the third's orders. I don't think he expected me to go second stage on his ass. Another small chuckle. Broke two of his ribs before he had a chance to explain himself. Naruto rubbed the back of his head as if a phantom pain emanated there. The third smacked me in the back of the head with Enma and knocked me out cold. I woke up a few hours later in a hospital bed with the old perv bandaged up next to me. He explained a few things and for obvious reasons he couldn't drag a kid, especially a baby around while he did his work. He sent money back of course, but he couldn't, wouldn't bring any attention back on me, he had too many enemies and too much to do in the wake of the Kyuubi's attack. The Kashi nodded sagely. I see, that's rather mature of you Naruto. Another snort shattered that thought where it lay. Hardly, I decked him as hard as I could across the nose after he explained himself. Just because he made excuses didn't excuse him from abandoning his previous responsibilities. Naruto waved it away. Regardless, I'm over it now and the two of us have come to an understanding. It's in the past and I have more than enough home to go back to these days. Enko? Enko? Yonin shook his head, rubbing his student's hair good-naturedly. You are so much like him it's not even funny. Naruto swatted the offending limb away and straightened his hair. Like who? Bakashi's eyes glazed over a bit, as if remembering a painful memory. An old teammate, one who gave his life to save mine and taught me a few things. The far-off look disappeared as quickly as it came, as did the strained catch in the man's voice. Tell you what, if you defeat your opponent and all three of you move on to the third exam, I'll call in a few favors and get some people from my Anbu days out here to help you, Sasuke and Sakura. Naruto frowned at that. Why can't you teach us? The Kashi eyes smile. I have to remain impartial, if I'm training three separate contestants at the same time any of the visiting dignitaries could accuse me of sabotaging any or all of you, even the daimyo himself. He ruffled the boy's hair again. It's why most only take one of their students and sub out the other to someone else. Since all of you are probably going to make it through to the third exam, I don't want to alienate over half my team, so I'm bringing in sensei for all of you. Noticing Naruto's deadpan stare, the scarecrow hastily added. That doesn't mean I won't write up several technique scrolls for all of you on some of my elemental techniques, as well as some helpful tips on their use. The man sweat dropped lightly when Naruto's stare didn't lessen in the slightest. After a quick visit with Sakura, where Naruto gave the blushing girl a hug as reward for her awesome victory, the trio of Team 7 and the older Sand siblings made their way back into the arena. Sorry we're a bit late coming back. Kakashi's eyes smile, waving at the rest of the room. We just had to stop and help an old lady cross the street. Those who knew Kakashi fasipumed at that. Once everyone was back into position, the attention of those left were drawn back to the board, where the names of those who were left spun rapidly until their inevitable stop. The fourth match has been decided. Tenten vs. Kankuro. 
Penton leapt over the edge of the railing and landed down in a crouch, while Kankuro took a slow methodical stroll down the stairs, mind more on the fact that his brother might no longer be a crazed psychopath hellbent on murder and destruction. He still kept his eyes on his opponent, hand almost caressing the strap attached to the bundle of cloth on his back. Are both parties cough ready? Hey, looked between the two, getting a nod of confirmation. All right then. Begin. The proctor barely had time to get out of the way as a veritable hail of kunai sailed out from Tenton in a wide arc, all of them homing in on Kankuro like heat-seeking missiles. Kankuro cursed, pulling a kunai up to block a few of the projectiles while quickly dodging the others. His eyes widened momentarily as dozens of shuriken attached to wires appeared around him, wrapping him up and forcing him to drop the bundle off his back. I don't know what kind of weapon that is, but I'm not giving you the chance to use it. Tenton pulled another kunai from her pouch before launching it right at Kankuro's forehead. But the wet thunk the blade sank tip first into the sand ninja's skull, drawing a gasp from Eno. Kankuro's mouth hung open, eyes dull and lifeless as he fell to his knees. Tenton raised an eyebrow, holstering the kunai she pulled to protect herself, that almost seemed to eat the girl leapt back, hearing a click come from the sand nin's body, before the space she'd occupied just moments ago bristled with, each glistening with a dark purple liquid. Poison. A finger ran along her arm, unsealing a wooden box staff which was brought up and spun rapidly, knocking another barrage of poison out of the way. A dark shadow loomed over her, as a number of side-like blades tried to pierce her from the sides. Tenton leapt back, lashing out with the bow staff, catching whatever it was trying to attack her in the face. A distinctly wooden and hollow sound echoed out, knocking the thing back long enough for Tenton to gain a bit of breathing room, now that she had a good view of the thing, she couldn't help but shiver a bit. The thing was a wooden puppet, a humanoid with four arms, a pair of legs, three eyes, a jaw of shark teeth, and a mane of scraggly brown hair. The ragged brown cloak around it fluttered open, and a pair of the hands launched forward, blades extending from the hand. Fenton cursed, swatting the first out of the way while blocking the second with a tip, which caught and roughly snapped the blade when she slammed the arm into the ground. As soon as the blade separated, the arm it was attached to floated back up into the air, returning to the puppet and apparently locking in. Behind the construct, the bundle that Tenton had assumed was the Sand Nin's weapon unraveled, revealing Kankuro hidden underneath. The man quickly got to his feet, strings of chakra connecting to the puppet and pulling it around himself like a shield. I'm impressed, not many people can deal with Karasu up close Kankuro sneered. Let's see you dodge this. The wrists of the puppet opened up, revealing a hollow tube. A sharp one preceded a pair of smoke grenades launching forward where it exploded at Tenton's feet, expelling a dark purple gas into the air. Already guessing at what the gas could be, Tenton closed her mouth and held her breath, fishing out a pair of scrolls while she did so. Flying through several seals, she slammed the scrolls on the ground with her palms held atop them twin rising dragons. The scrolls activate, sending her spiraling upward into the air, the scrolls trailing around her in a double helix of dragon-shaped smoke, which ejects herself from the poison cloud. Taking a breath of fresh air the girl noted that Karasu had disappeared into the cloud below her, probably to attack her while she was distracted. A shark-like grin formed on her face as she unsealed the first pair of kunai, unleashing a menagerie of weapons on the surprised Kankuro. Dodging the hail of steel with a curse, Kankuro yanked his puppet out of the smoke, bringing it in front of him as a shield to block the blades, as they stuck point first into Karasu's wooden chest. That proved to be only a temporary measure, as the blades began to weigh down the puppet's mechanisms. Thinking it better than to let his puppet be destroyed, Kankuro separated it into its ten or so parts, working each of them to deflect and block all of the girl's blades. Beads of sweat rolled down Kankuro's face, smudging his face paint as he concentrated, each of his fingers moving independent of each other to stop the hail of weapons from getting through, even grabbing a few of them with the puppet's hands and tossing the blades back that also didn't work as planned as the girl only knocked them aside with yet more weapons. How many of those things does she have? The teen all but screamed in his mind, ducking under a bardage that spun in between the grasping hands of his puppet and would have decapitated him had he not done so. He couldn't move without creating an opening, which made this a matter of quantity versus technical skill, whoever ran out of there first would lose their momentum, most likely ending the match. As the final blade a comma by the looks of it lodged itself into Karasu's forehead, taking a blow that would have struck a similar spot on Kankuro, the puppeteer brought all of the pieces he controlled in around him to block any sneak attacks from the girl. A smirk formed on his lips as he stared up at the girl still suspended in air. That's all you got girly. I could keep this up all day. Fenton smirked. Oh really the area in front of her fingers shimmered as she yanked hard. Behind Kankuro, a number of weapons launched forward, the wires attached to them pulling them toward the sand nin. The swear and a quick lurch of a finger had Karasu's torso in the way of most of those blades, though the sharp whine of wire alerted him to another horde of steel approaching him from behind. 
from there it was a game of puppets, Kankuro blocking with his chakra strings, while Tenten attacked with her metal ones, the former realizing only too late that the latter was using her wires to entangle him. In desperation Kankuro switched out with one of his puppet's arms which was not far away from him, as the death trap of wire and steel closed like a coffin on the rest of his puppet. Swallowing heavily, Kankuro turned back just in time to catch the blunt end of a bow staff to the head, knocking him out cold before he could even defend himself. Winner of the fourth match, Tenten. Oh Tenten. Lee cheered from the stands, grabbing his sensei in what many people would consider inappropriate and hugging him, tears in his eyes and sunset hanging behind the both of them. The room was only spared the horrible display when both Naruto and Kakashi used a simple earth to create a cubicle to suppress the image. Sparkles and rays of light still seemed to eke over the top of the barrier anyway, which brought shivers of disgust from the audience and a few nods of gratitude towards the two-leaf nin. Ankura was drawn away on a stretcher and Tenten took her place next to her team in a box. Hei called attention to the board. The fifth match will be between. The board clicked to a stop. Naruto Uzumaki and Kabuto Yakushi. Naruto's eyes hardened as he glared over at Kabuto, the silver-haired nin matching his stare. A small smirk, barely perceptible, made its way onto Kabuto's lips. It wasn't friendly and did not bode well for anything. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the other's videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys in the next video. Till that. Take care.